Welcome to our comprehensive guide where we dive into the most crucial 120 NCLEX questions you need to know. Stay tuned and watch until the very end without skipping to ensure you grasp all the essential information and strategies. Let's begin the video. A patient experiencing abdominal discomfort and watery stool leakage from their rectum should be aware that these symptoms could be indicative of. So the major signs symptoms are the abdominal discomfort and watery stool leakage. Okay. So the option number first indicate constipation. So constipation is a condition of absent or infrequent stool and in this constipation the stool is hard and dry. If the stool is hard and dry so there will not be the watery stool leakage from the rectum so therefore this option is incorrect one the next is diarrhea so diarrhea is a condition of passage of at least three stools three loose stools over a day so if the patient is having three loose stools over a day so uh, in the diarrhea, the volume of the stool is also increased. So, if the volume is increased and there is three or more than three loose stools per day, so there will not be the watery stool leakage. It means there will be the watery stool, but it will not leak out. It will openly increase in the volume and will excrete out with the increased volume. So, therefore, this option is again incorrect one. The next one is the, the third option says bowel incontinence. So, bowel incontinence is the condition of involuntary passage of stool. So this involuntary passage of stool can be due to any problem with the motor function of the gut or due to any sensory function of the gut like the patient if the patient is having diabetes mellitus or if the patient is having inability to sense the urge to defecate if the patient is having inability to sense the presence of a stool in the rectum so the patient will involuntary pass the stool or if there is involuntary contraction of the sphincters so in that condition bowel incontinence will occur so again it will be involuntary and in the involuntary condition the stool will pass out but it will not leak as per the questions asked so therefore this option is incorrect one the next one is fecal impaction so fecal impaction is a condition when there is a accumulation of the hard stool fecal impaction is is accumulation of the hard stool and this hard stool is usually present at the rectum or at the sigmoid colon what is the client's first step when learning the proper technique to descend stairs with axillary crutches after being placed in a leg cast due to a fractured right tibia so the patient is have to descend the stairs that means the patient has to come down from the stair and patient is using axillary crutches and with why, why patient is using using this axillary crutches because patient is having the, this leg cast on the fractured right tibia that means patient is having leg cast on the right leg so this is the uh, you can say the whole scenario so if we talk about the technique of using axillary crutches during going up to the stairs and during down steering so there is a technique for this and i will write this technique with a new ink color and it is good up before moving to this technique good up and bed down we also always have to know that we have to keep both crutches together we have to keep both crutches together whenever i will say that we will put the crutches so both crutches will be put together with this the second thing is we are using crutches to the patient because the one of the limb of the patient is unable to hold the weight of the body so therefore in in place of this uh, lower extremity that is unable to hold the weight of the body these crutches are used to hold the body weight so these crutches are always moved before just before the just before the affected leg so these crutches are moved or you can say put uh, put ahead just before the movement of the affected leg so when we talk about the down steering so bad down means when the patient is down steering, so the bad leg will be kept in the first step. So in the first step, bad leg and in the second step, the good leg will 
come so this is only for your learning that which leg will come first the bad leg will come first when the patient is going down the bed down and this bad leg is the first and this good leg is the second where this we have seen here that the, the crutches will move just before the affected leg so what will be the first step during descending the first step will be the crutches why because we have already seen here that the crutches are used just before the affected or bad leg so this is the bad leg the here are the crutches and which one crutches we have seen here that both the crutches will move together so what will be the sequence of descending down first step will be both the crutches the second step will be bad leg and the third step will be good leg this will be the pattern of moving and if you talk about the bad leg so which which one is the bad leg the leg which has been casted that is the right leg and which one is the good leg the leg which is healthy that is a good leg and that is a left leg so what will be the pattern of movement of the patient so pattern will be both crutches in the first step right leg in the second step and left leg in the third step okay moving to the options that what the options are saying so option number first says place both crutches on the first step so yes we have seen here that both crutches will be placed in the first step this option is the correct one the next one says place uh, the left foot and right crutch on the first step so this is an incorrect option the next is right foot and left crutch so again this is an incorrect option and the next option says place the right foot on the first step so again this is an incorrect option because we have to put both the crutches to the uh, in the first step so moving to the next question but before moving to the next question i am thrilled to share some exciting news with you before we proceed to the next question we have initiated daily live classes on our youtube channel dedicated comprehensively covering all topics related to the NCLEX series and these sessions will not only delve into each subject in detail but also focus on discussing the most crucial questions for the NCLEX. However, it's important to note that these live classes are exclusively available to our channel members. If you are interested in joining these classes and enriching your learning experience, becoming a member is easy. Simply click the join button on our channel page to get started. We believe that these classes will be a valuable resource for your NCLEX preparation and we look forward to welcoming you as a new member. So this was this is an exciting opportunity for you individuals and now we will move to the question number third. So question number third says which of the following equipment options will assist a patient with total hip replacement in performing activities of daily living. So the patient is having total hip replacement and with total hip replacement uh, we have to identify that equipment which will help the patient in activities of daily living. So in the total hip replacement, there is the insertion of the processes, there is the artificial processes are placed and those processes to work exactly as the hip joints and prevent the patient from that uh, you can say severe pain that occur due to any disease condition or if the patient has undergone the fracture so to replace that uh, fractured or disease joint we have to we do the hip replacement to the patient so when the patient is having this total hip replacement so there are some complications uh, that can arise due to this uh, total hip replacement and the major one is the dislocation of this hip or you can say dislocation of this prosthetic hip this dislocation can be occurred if the patient flex the hip joint more than 90 degree if the patient flex the hip joint more than 90 degree so here we have a picture for the here so this is the uh, zero line and this is the angle of flexion for the hip like it has been written hip flexion angle so if this angle is more than 90 degree so here it will come as the 90 degree if i will draw this one line so this is the 90 degree so if the patient do increase flexion from this 90 degree it means if the patient will move like this this 
so this here the 90 the angle has been increased from the 90 degree to the 120 degree and this uh, flexion of the hip more than 90 degree can cause the dislocation of the prosthetic hip with this if the patient do adduction across the midline if the patient is doing adduction that is coming towards the midline that is rotating his legs to the midline uh, meeting both the legs then this adduction also causes this dislocation of the hip with this if the patient do the crossing of the legs or you can say the crossing of the ankles so crossing the legs or crossing the ankles causes this adduction and due to that adduction this dislocation can occur if the patient is uh, you can say is if the patient is internally rotating his legs and which one leg? The leg or you can say that leg which has been replaced hip joint. So the internal rotation of the prosthetic hip can cause this dislocation. So we have to maintain, we have to add those equipments which prevent the flexion of the 90 degree. We have to add those equipments which to prevent from the adduction across the midline that means crossing an internal rotation so to prevent this flexion uh, of the more than 90 degree we have to maintain a angle that is less than 90 degree so what we can do to maintain the angle that is 90 degree like here we have always if this is the hip and this is the knee if the knee is above the hip this is the level of the hip and this is the level of the knee if knee is above the hip then level of the knee is love is above the level of the hip then there is a chances of the dislocation so we have to maintain the knees should be always below the level of the hip, hip. knees below the level of the hip the first one the second one where this to prevent the crossing and internal rotation we do use a pillow a wedge shaped pillow between both the legs and because that pillow maintains the abduction that means that keeps both the legs away from the midline so we do call that pillow abduction pillow so these are certain uh, measures that we do take when we have to uh, you can say prevent the hip dislocation the prosthetic hip dislocation so our option number first is adduction pillows so when we have seen in the activities of daily living the abduction pillows should be used there is nothing such like adduction pillow the word should be abduction pillow so abduction pillow should be used not the adduction pillows so therefore this option is the incorrect one the next one says high seat commode so high seat commodes are those commodes in which the angle of flexion of hip is less than 90 degree why because the in the high seated commodes the level of hip is greater than than the level of the knees like we will say in this one picture so here is if the if this is the chair only but if we talk about this is a common so if the high seated commons are present so the level of the hip joint will be above the level of the knees so therefore we have to use the high seated commons and because using the commons is under the activities of daily living because the patient and because the individual do pass this tool every day so this is a equipment that should be used in the activities of daily living the next one is recliner so the recliner in the recliner the patient can recline and recliners are you can say used uh, during after the hip replacement but this recliner should not be as much necessary are not necessary as per the activities of daily living they can be based on the patient's choice if they want to use the recliner or so so therefore the recliner can be used but these are not under the activities of daily living 
the next option is uh, option number fourth and that is the spinal traction system so spinal traction system is used when there is uh, you can say we want to you, we want to put a proper placement put the bones the fractured bones into the normal anatomical position at that time the spinal tractions are used when the patients have already undergone the surgery so there is no you need to use this spinal traction so the question number three goes right with the option number second so next option question number four and here it says a patient is admitted to the hospital with the burn injury and isn't allowed to have an oral diet. The healthcare wants to ensure the patient's nutrition supports healing. Considering the patient's condition, which meal option would be the most suitable to promote healing for this individual? So, patient is having a burn injury and is allowed on the oral diet and wants a nutritive diet that will support the healing so if we talk about the diet that will support the healing so there will be the mesonutrients that will uh, high in the protein okay with this we have to provide the high vitamin c rich diet because this vitamin c to help in the synthesis of the collagen and therefore there is the proper healing with this we should provide the diet that should contain vitamins and minerals the micronutrients that will promote the healing okay moving to the option so option number first says chicken breast high in protein oranges high in vitamin c kiwi again high in vitamin c and milk high in calcium and vitamins and magnesium so this option is high in all these things so this can be the correct one the next is pasta marinara so this is high in the potassium garlic bread so garlic bread is uh, do have some traces of vitamins and minerals and peanut butter do have protein but here there is no any specific vitamin c and rich diet so therefore this option will be incorrect one the next one is ginger la uh, ginger LA is a sugar-eated, carbonated drink and during the healing, we should not provide too much sugar to the patient because it will cause the, you can say, uh, bacterial, in, uh, bacterial growth there and will hinder with the proper healing. So, ginger LA is not a good option. The jelly sandwich, the banana also have potassium and fiber and coffee is again, uh, you can say, uh, can work as a sedative to have the nutrients which works as a sedative so therefore this option is not a good one the next one is pork chop again uh, this one is rich in proteins the fried potatoes do have potassium the tea so tea is again having sugar and it, it do again have the these effects like coffee so therefore this will again will not a good option so option number a do contains protein high protein high vitamin c and vitamins and minerals in the appropriate amount so option number a will be the correct type for the patient with this healing burns so question number five and it is which vitamin deficiencies is a child with cystic fibrosis is at the risk for so cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive disorder and what happens in this cystic fibrosis okay so in the cystic fibrosis what actually happens there are the thick copious secretions from the exocrine glands what actually happens there are the thick and copious secretions from the exocrine glands and when the exocrine glands do have this thick secretions to, so due to this thick secretions there are the blockage of the exocrine glands okay so when uh, we talk about the gi system so in the gi system the pancreas if the pancreas do have this pancreas is affected with this cystic fibrosis and the exocrine secretions of the pancreas that is the pancreatic juices so the pancreatic juices are thick and copious due to which the pancreatic juices do not drain down to the duodenum properly and we know that the pancreatic juices helps in the you can say absorption of the fat 
and fat soluble vitamins as this pancreatic chooses to have amylase and the lipase also so it helps in the absorption of the fat and the uh, fat soluble vitamins the breakdown of this fat so you can say fat and digestion and metabolism metabolism is actually done in liver but the absorption and the breakdown of this fat molecules and then makes it easy to absorb so uh, pancreatic juices works here okay so uh, we will move to the option option number first is biotin and folic acid so biotin is vitamin b7 and if we talk about certain vitamins so we are having vitamin a b c d e and k out of which vitamin b and c are water soluble vitamins and rest all are fat soluble vitamins so if there is the absence of the pancreatic juices or if they are blocking the pancreatic juice has been blocked so in that condition the vitamin b and c can be absorbed properly but vitamin a d e and k cannot be absorbed why because they are fat soluble vitamins they all a d e k are fat soluble vitamin i am making it with the uh, different in color the fat soluble ones are the blue one and the those which are the uh, water soluble these are the this green one b and c okay so now uh, biotin and folic acid so biotin is vitamin b so patient will not have any deficiency of water soluble so therefore this option is incorrect one the next one is vitamin c b12 and k so again vitamin c and b12 are water soluble and uh, there is no any deficiencies of this vitamin c and vitamin b12 therefore this option is incorrect one the next one is vitamin a d and e so vitamin a d and e yes these all are fat soluble vitamins and will get the deficiencies if there is cystic fibrosis so this option is correct one the next one is pentothenic acid and vitamin b12 so pentothenic acid is vitamin b5 and the other one is vitamin b2 so both are the types of the vitamin b and both are the water soluble vitamins therefore again this option will be incorrect one moving to next question number six and it says a patient that is 65 year old patient with diagnosis of myasthenia gravis has a ng tube that is a nasogastric tube in place and suddenly experience a cessation of the drainage okay that is stoppage of the drainage describe the appropriate initial action that a nurse should take to address this situation and ensure the proper functioning of the ng tube okay so the patient has stopped the drainage suddenly and what should be the first initial action by the nurse so first one says check tube placement so whenever there is the uh, you can say uh, any changes in the drainage any changes in the position whenever the nurse is providing feeding through the ng tube always and always we have to check the tube placement that is always the first step and then we have to move to the other interventions next one is clamp for the 30 minutes so we should not clamp without the physician's order first we have to check the tube placement then we can proceed with the other interventions so therefore because this should be the first one this is the right answer and the rest all will be the incorrect one but we always have to read all the options when we are crossing them the next one is retract ng tube six centimeters so again we should not retract it it will cause a dislodgement of the ng tube if we are retracting it the next is instill 40 m of water so we have discussed that before administering anything from this ng tube we have to check the proper placement then we will proceed to the another thing so therefore uh, these option number second third and fourth are the incorrect one next is our question number seven and this is a patient undergoing chemotherapy okay so chemotherapy is given on are the uh, you can say chemical therapies or the drug regimen that is used in those patients who do have the cancer and the patient is presented with stomatitis that is the inflammation of the oral mucosa what is the stomatitis the in i guess that means inflammation stomatitis means inflammation of the oral mucosa okay what supportive measures or intervention should the healthcare provider consider offering to the patient so here the interventions have been asked so option number first says offering warm slime rinses four times a day the next says providing instructions for vigorous oral care and commercial mouthwashes. The next is recommending the consumption of lots of ice chips between meals. 
and the option number fourth is suggestion of inclusion of hot soups for each meal okay so uh, comparing the four options the option number first is the right one why because we have to provide the oh, the warm slime rinses to the patient to remove out any food debris that is present in the oral cavity and to remove out any inflammatory debris that is present in the oral cavity why because if the debris is present in the oral cavity so it can lead to the infection because already the patient is having the inflammation it can lead to the oral infection therefore we have to remove it and we have to maintain the oral hygiene of the patient so therefore this option is the correct one and rest all options are incorrect one why these are incorrect one so option number second says providing instructions for vigorous oral care so patient is already having the inflammation of oral mucosa we do have to do gentle oral care to the oral mucosa and we do not have to perform vigorous oral care with this the mouthwash which is used by the patient should be prescribed mouthwash by the healthcare provider or it should be the medicated mouth mouthwash that has been prescribed by the you can say uh, primary healthcare worker it should not be commercial as this commercial mouthwashes will you can say irritate the oral mucosa much more therefore option number second is incorrect one the next is question uh, sorry uh, option number second is incorrect one the next is option number third and it says that consuming lots of ice chips so consuming lots of ice chips can be done to prevent this inflammation from the chemotherapy when we are providing this chemotherapeutic agent to the patient why because this ice chips causes the vasoconstriction and because these are decreased in temperature this causes the vasoconstriction it decreases the blood supply to that you can say oral cavity and if the patient is having chemotherapy at the time we are providing the ice chips so there is certain decrease in the amount of the chemotherapeutic agents that are coming to the oral cavity and will prevent from this stomatitis but in the option it has been mentioned that it should be provided between meals so if the ice chips are provided between the meals between the meals it will decrease down the blood supply and patient will not be able to chew the food properly so therefore this is an incorrect fact that has been written here therefore this option is the incorrect one the next is suggesting the inclusion of hot soups for each meal so whenever the patient is having any inflammation in the oral mucosa we should never introduce any uh, increased temperature or decreased temperature to the meals to the patient why because this hot soups will cause uh, you can say uh, irritation to the oral mucosa and the patient symptoms will worsen up therefore this option is the incorrect one moving to the next that is question number eight and that is a patient's nasogastric tube drained Two liter of fluid in eight hours. What should the nurse monitor for? Okay, so the patient is having nasogastric tube that is insertion of the tube from the nasal uh, to the from the nares to the stomach and has drained two liter of the fluid in the eight hours. Okay, so when there is the NG drainage is present, so the content of the GI tract or of the stomach is you can say is draining. Okay, stomach content is draining. We know that stomach content do is acidic content. First thing we do we do know that the stomach content is highly acidic content. With this highly acidic content, this content is enriched in the lots of potassium, and with this potassium, there is also presence of the sodium. But if we compare the sodium and potassium, the potassium is highly enriched. The you can say the gastric content is highly enriched in the potassium potassium levels so if the patient is draining from the ng that means the level of potassium is decreasing the level of sodium is decreasing okay 
So moving to the options, option first is low calcium level. So because the NG drainage do not cause a significant decrease in the calcium level, therefore the, this option is the incorrect one. The next one says low potassium level. So yes, during the drainage, during the NG drainage, the potassium is lost in the drainage. So there will be the low potassium level. The next is excess magnesium. So when the patient is draining something out, how can something can be increased? how can this magnesium should be increased so therefore this option is again incorrect one as well this magnesium do not you can say this NG drainage do not cause any significant changes in the levels of the magnesium the next one is the high sodium so we have just seen here that sodium do also drain out in the NG tube drainage and this sodium will be decreased also it will not be increased therefore this option is incorrect also so option number A, sorry, option number second goes right with the question number eight. So next question is our question number nine. And it is after two days of severe diarrhea, after two days of severe diarrhea, what should be checked by the nurse? Okay, so the patient is having severe diarrhea and in the severe diarrhea, there is a lot of, uh, you can say, excretion of the stool from the patient's body and the excretion of the stool is increased in the frequency and it can be increased in the volume also. And the two days has also occurred and we are having to find that finding that is after the two days. Okay, so when the patient who have the severe diarrhea and increase in the stool excretion, so there can be the presence of this dehydration and this dehydration if present so it shows that patient is having uh, you can say decrease in the fluid volume and that can be present as a early symptom okay with this there can be the mental disorientation but this mental disorientation is a very late sign and this can be present if this dehydration has not been maintained and the patient has undergone the hypovolemia and patient has undergone hypovolemia and the uh, you can say the vital organs are not receiving the uh, this auto supply then the patient may have this mental disorientation but this is a late complication the next is our uh, muscle spasm issues so muscle spasm issues are do occur due to the decrease in the calcium level and due to diarrhea there is no any significant changes in the level of the calcium so for this reason this option is already incorrect the next one is arrhythmia so arrhythmias are present due to the decrease or you can say changes in the level of the potassium either increase in the potassium level either decrease in the potassium level in the previous question we have seen that when the gi content is uh, you can see excreting out from the body either way either ng drainage or from as the form of diarrhea so there is always the increased loss of the potassium so if the there is increased loss of the potassium the patient may have the symptoms of hypokalemia and if the patient do have the symptoms of hypokalemia then the patient may have this arrhythmias so when we talk about these three options so dry mouth is a early symptom so it is an incorrect option the next one is a mental dis disorientation which is a late symptom late complication actually so therefore this option is again an income uh, you can say correct this is an incorrect option the next is arrhythmia which can be present after the two days of severe diarrhea so therefore this option is your correct one so question number nine goes right with the option number four moving to the next one that is our question number it says what triggers pregnancy related heartburn so when we do uh, see a female who has been pregnant and she do have heartburn so what can be the reason so when we talk about pregnancy though so there is the increase in what increase in the uterus increase in the uterus or you can say the size why due to the presence of the fetus due to the presence of the growing fetus the fetus it is growing okay with this heartburn there are some chain hormonal changes when we talk about these hormonal changes so there is a secretions of the progesterone increases so as we know the progesterone do increases in the pregnancy so the secretion of progesterone increases and as a result of this uh, increase in the progesterone uh, what happens it slow down the it slow downs the you can say gi functions 
The first thing, it decreases the uh, GI functions. With this, it causes the lower esophageal sphincter relax. This ES is the esophageal sphincter relax. Okay. So, it increases in the, you can say lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. Okay. So, uh, moving to the options that are present. The first one says reflux of the stomach materials. So, heartburn is present when, when the gastric content, here we have the picture, when the gastric content regurgitate back to the lower esophagus, then the patient has the symptoms of the heartburn. So, why these, uh, you can say, GI content to get regurgitated. So, when there is the regurgitation, this is the cause. So, what triggers? So, this one is a, that the reflux of the stomach materials, regurgitation of the stomach materials. This can be present due to the lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. It can be present due to the slowdown of the GI function. But ultimately, what is happening? The regurgitation of the stomach materials are happening. The second one is the rise in the peristaltic action. So, we have seen here that the progesterone decreases the GI function. That means it decreases the peristaltic actions. So, therefore, this option is incorrect one. The next is stomach pushed up by the diaphragm. So, stomach is pushed by the uterus, not by the diaphragm. So, therefore, this option is incorrect one. The next is less secretion of the stomach acid. So, in the uh, you can say pregnancy the uh, acid secretion is actually increased and not decreased therefore this option is again incorrect one moving to the next question our question number 11 that is the nurse is helping a client who recognizes the importance of quitting smoking. So here the patient already knows the importance of quitting smoking and now creating a plan to assist the client in reaching this objective. And now we have to reach the objective. That means we have to intervene something. Here we have to intervene something. What should be the initial step in the nursing intervention plan? So first is establish the client's daily smoking pattern. So yes, when the patient is about to quit, patient is quitting. So we have to maintain the daily smoking pattern. That what is the pattern? How, uh, in what frequency he do, you can say smoke. So this option is the right one. The next is discuss the impact of passive smoking on environmental pollution. So patient already knows it. That's why he knows the importance of quitting smoking. The next is is explain how smoking worsens. So here patient knows the importance. The next is review the adverse effect of smoking. So patient already knows the importance. Therefore, we have to intervention and this one, the first option talks about the intervention that should be taken. Therefore, this is the right one. The next is question number 12 and it says, what are the risk factors for hepatitis C? So risk factor of hepatitis C are those factors with what the patient may get the chance of having the hepatitis. So when we talk talk about the hepatitis uh, so hepatitis c can be transferred with the use of needles and with the blood and blood borne transmission is usually occurred in the hepatitis c so first option is tattooed recently so yes if the patient if any individual has tattooed with the same needle with the same equipments that have been used in that uh, you can say that individual who was infected in the with the hepatitis c so that individual which has not been infected may get the chance of having this hepatitis C. So, tattoo recently blood and blood borne transmission is present here. Therefore, this is a correct option. The next is consumed impure water. So, what is just your hepatitis E uh, to uh, transmit with this uses of impure water. Therefore, this is an option uh, incorrect because hepatitis C do not transmit with the impure water. The next one is the uh, consuming shellfish. So your uh, hepatitis A can be transmitted by this and not the hepatitis C. So this is an incorrect option. So next is step to Sri Lanka. So uh, going to any place where there is already the presence of disease. So it can transmit the hepatitis A or E but not the hepatitis C. Therefore, this is again an incorrect option. So question number 12 goes right with the option number first. Moving to the question number 13 and it says which lab value to monitor for acute pancreatitis. So patient is having acute pancreatitis that is inflammation of the pancreas. And now we have to monitor the lab values. So first option is elevated calcium. So when there is an inflammation of the uh, pancreas, there is actually decrease in the calcium. Why? Because this 
pancreas to secret enzymes and these enzymes are pancreatic amylase with this these are lipase and with this trypsin actually it is trypsinogen okay i'm writing it active form the trypsin okay so it too secretes amylase lipase or trypsinogen which is in active form is uh, your trypsin so when this lipase is present so this lipase to break down the fat because lipase is those enzymes it break down the fats so lipase break down fats and that free fatty acids in the blood when there is the pancreatitis so this amylase lipase do increases many folds in the blood so this lipase causes the degradation of the fat in the blood and release the free fatty acids those free fatty acids binds with this calcium in the blood the free floating calcium in the blood and causes decrease in the free calcium level so therefore the calcium level is reduced in the acute pancreatitis so therefore this is an incorrect option the next is raised serum amylase and lipase so yes when there is a pancreatitis there is a secretion of the Measure and measure amount of amylase and lipase, and it transfers to the blood. And there is a raised serum amylase and lipase level. The next is, next is diminished glucose. So, because acute pancreatitis is the inflammation of the acinar cells of the pancreas, and acinar cells are the exocrine cells and not the endocrine cells. While this glucose is secreted through the endocrine endocrine cells, that is beta islets of Langerhans. Therefore, this is an incorrect option. The next is reduced urine amylase. So, when there is increase in the serum amylase, so during excretion, the urine amylase is also increased and it is not decreased. Therefore, this option is again an incorrect one. So, question number 13 goes right with the option number 2. The next is our question number 14. And it says, what should the nurse do when encountering a patient with an uncomfortable bed position? So, patient is having uncomfortable bed position. First is give the patient their medication. Patient is having uncomfortable position. So, obviously, we have to uh, provide a comfortable position to the patient. So, we will find out that option which says about the comfortable position. So, option number four, adjust the patient's pillow patients below behind their back this is a correct option why because this option is providing the pillow behind the back which is providing a comfortable position to the patient when it has been already mentioned that patient is in uncomfortable position so we have to provide them comfort rather than providing the medications rather than checking the name of the band rather than asking the patient's name so question number 14 goes right with the option number 4. Next is our question number 15 and it says, okay, considering the condition of a client who is experiencing chest pain rated 8 on a 10 point visual analog scale along with ST elevation in inferior legs observed in 12 lead ECG and elevated tropi levels the primary focus for nursing management of this patient should be on prioritizing the following okay so here the patient is having a severe pain why severe pain because the pain visual analog scale says it's about 0 0.8 out of, 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 from the 10 st elevation in the inferior leads seen in the ECG with this tropi level. These both says that the patient is having increased cardiac markers with these changes in the ECG. It shows that patient is having myocardial infarction. The next, the primary focus. What should be the primary focus? When we are having this type of patient with severe pain and we know that patient is having myocardial infection, infarction, infarction okay patient is having myocardial infarction from the given you can say symptoms and from the given values and from the given scenarios actually so these patients should be given immediate action the immediate action should be taken there what will be the immediate action moving to the options option first is educate the client on prescribed medication and right tray recommendation patient has been come with the pain are you going to describe about the medications or are you going to take the intervention you have to take the immediate intervention that intervention which will decrease the pain of the patient which will decrease the intensity of the myocardial infarction this educating the 
uh, client runs prescribed medications and dietary recommendation can be done later. This is a long term goal and should be taken in the long term. This is not an immediate action. Therefore, this option is incorrect one. The next is says assess daily weights and urine output. So daily weights will be assessed when the patient is admitted for the daily basis. And that means when the patient is admitted for the time for some days. Immediate action, patient has been come to you. What immediate and priority action you will do? You will not go to check the weight of the patient. You will check weight of the patient daily when he is admitted to the hospital. When he is coming, then this option is not the immediate intervention. Therefore, this is an incorrect one. The next is implement measures to alleviate pain. Yes, because the patient is having severe pain, we have to decrease the pain. Reduce myocardial oxygen demand. So yes, patient is having myocardial Myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction due to decrease in the O2 supply as compared to the O2 demand. And now because there is already the decrease in the O2 supply due to any obstruction due in the coronary arteries due to any you can say thrombi due to any arthrosclerosis mainly there is a reduction in the myocardial oxygen supply. So we have to immediately reduce the demand. Because we cannot reduce the supply immediately. We cannot increase the supply immediately. Therefore, we have to reduce the demand immediately. Therefore, we will implement this immediate action on the patient. The next is permit unrestricted visitation. So, this will be followed. When the patient has been admitted, then we are restricting the visitation. And here already reviewed unrestricted visitation, which is incorrect when already because restricted visitation but again this is not an immediate action therefore this option is again incorrect one okay moving to the next that is our question number 16 and it says what is the most critical assessment for a nurse initiating the nitroglycerin trip in a client with the chest pain okay so the nurse is going to initiate what is going to initiate the nitroglycerin trip and patient was having what well, patient was having chest pain so nitroglycerin tip ntg is a potent vasodilator it means it causes the vasodilation and because it causes the vasodilation it too decreases the patient's bp and causes the hypotension when we, why do we give in this chest pain so because it redistributes the coronary blood flow and it causes the reduction in the preload why? Because uh, the potent vasodilation has occurred. So due to the potent vasodilation, there is the peripheral pooling of the blood. So due to if the presence of, you can say, peripheral pooling of the blood, what will occur? There is decrease in the venous return. Decreased venous return will cause a decreased preload and decreased preload and uh, redistribution of the blood flow will cause the decrease myocardial O2 demand and patient will relieve from this angina pain. Okay, so if we talk about the most critical assessment, so first one is ST elevation is present on the ECG. So this nitroglycerin is given to those patients who do have ST elevated MI, who do have angina. So ST elevation is, these patients should be given nitroglycerin. So no critical assessment is needed here. This Therefore, this is an incorrect option. The next one is blood pressure is 90 by 48. So nitroglycerin is a potent vasodilator and it causes decrease in the BP, that is hypotension. So those patients who do already have systolic BP less than 90, there this nitroglycerin is contraindicated. And here, 90mmHg, uh, okay. And here, the patient is having exactly 90 mm of Hg systolic BP. So, these patients should be critically assessed when they are having this nitroglycerin trip. So, therefore, this option is the correct one. The next is serum calcium level 10 mg per dl. So, this serum calcium level is in the normal limits, normal values, normal ranges. So, therefore, this is an incorrect one. The next one is heart rate is 60. So, this nitroglycerin is contraindicated. If the patient is having heart rate less than 50 beats per minute or 
if the patient is having heart rate more than 100 beats per minute so in those conditions this nitroglycerins are contraindicated but here the patient is having heart rate 60 beats per minute which is within the normal range so therefore these patients do not need any critical assessment moving to the next that is our question number 17 and it says what instruction should the nurse give to an older adult with chest pain and shortness of breath who have been described nitro uh, sorry prescribed nitroglycerin tablets so patient is has prescribed with the nitroglycerin tablets so option number first is chew the tablet until it is dissolved so uh, nitroglycerin tablet should be given with the sublingual root and this should not be given uh, it should not be chew so therefore this option is incorrect one the next is put the tablet under the tongue until it is absorbed so yes the sublingual root the proper sublingual root is putting the tablet under the tongue until it is absorbed so when the patient is having this drug so we have to instruct the patient that he has to put the tablet under the tongue until it is absorbed so this is a right option the next is place the tablet between the cheek and gums until it disappear so this is a you can say buccal root and we do not provide this medication by the buccal root we do provide it by the sublingual root therefore this option is incorrect one the next is swallow the tablet with 100 ml of water so this one is the oral root that is swallowing the tablet with the water so uh, we do not provide it again with the oral root so therefore because when we do provide it with the oral root so the you can say the castic medium of the stomach destroys its efficiency therefore this route is not prescribed so option number two i will mark it with a different in color and that is a word green one. so our option number second is the right okay moving to the next one it says what are the desired effects of intravenous morphine sulfate for a client with acute chest pain select all that apply so wherever we, uh, we have this option sorry we have this mentioned select all that apply so there can be more than one options which are correct okay so here we have been asked about the desired effects of the intravenous morphine sulfate so intravenous morphine sulfate is given to the patient with chest pain as it to have some effects or side effects as h sorry not h uh, s a c r u m it is sacrum okay we all know sacrum but here is a monomic that is a sacrum and this s is for the sedation that means these uh your morphine sulfate to have sedative effect a is for the analgesic that means these uh morphine sulfate to have the analgesic effects decreases the pain of the patient the next one is your c and c is for the constipation this morphine sulfate as a side effect causes the constipation to the patient and r is for the respiratory uh, depression so it causes a respiratory depression which is an undesired effect next one is u and u is for the euphoria that means the elevation in the mood and decreases in the anxiety so the euphoria do occur with this uh, morphine sulfate and next one is your m and n m is for the meiosis that is pinpoint pupil which is the side effect of this and which is again not a desired effect okay constipation is again a side effect which is not a desired effect okay so the desired effects are analgesic because a patient who do have chest pain we have to decrease the chest pain so and work as an analgesic is a good one sedative effect it will reduce the myocardial oxygen demand so sedative effect is a good one euphoria will decrease the anxiety of the patient so this will be a good one okay so we will mark the right one so option one first is alleviates anxiety and fear it means decreases anxiety and fear yes due to the euphoric effect the next is promotes a decrease in the respiratory rate yet it promotes but it is not a desired effect it is an unwanted effect therefore this is a incorrect one 
the next is lowers uh, blood pressure and heart rate so yes it lowers blood pressure and heart rate by causing the sedative effect therefore and we want to lower the heart rate so that the demand of the o2 to the myocardium decreases therefore this one is the right one the next is prevents ventricular remodeling so morphine sulfate do not have any effect on the ventricular remodeling therefore this is an incorrect effect the next is reduce myocardial oxygen consumption so yes due to the Decrease in the heart rate, the myocardial oxygen uh, consumption is decreased, and this will be a right option. So, our option number one, three, and five, these three are the desired effects of IV morphine sulfate. Okay, so our next question is question number 19, and it says, What alternative measures can the nurse suggest to the patient experiencing throbbing headache when taking nitroglycerin for angina? Okay, so patient is taking nitroglycerin for angina and is having throbbing uh, headache as a side effect. So, what should the nurse teach her him? Okay, so when the patient do have this uh pain throbbing pain from the nitroglycerin so this is a common side effect of this one and they should or uh, this can be eliminated with the use of NSAIDs or over-the-counter NSAIDs so we should instruct the patient that he can take the uh, NSAIDs or eliminate this pain by because this is a common side effect and this do not have to you can say uh, this do not will uh, affect the measure something the measure organ of the brain or something this is a common side effect of this drug there is no need to worry such more so we have to teach this to the patient option four says the client should lie in supine position to prevent the headache so supine position will increase the headache of the patient therefore this option is incorrect one the next one says nitroglycerin should be avoided if the patient is having the serious side effect so this side effect is not a serious side effect and nitroglycerin should not be avoided because the headache can be managed with NSAIDs but the main purpose why the patient is taking nitroglycerin for angina so the angina can be prevented with the use of this nitroglycerin and which is much more important for vital organ and the headache is a normal common side effect therefore again this option is the incorrect one the next is taking the nitroglycerin with few glasses of water so in the previous one option we have seen this nitroglycerin Nitroglycerin should be taken sublingually. So, and we should not, you can say, we should not instruct this oral route. Therefore, this option is incorrect one. The next is acetaminophen and ibuprofen can be taken for this common side effect. So, yes, we can take these two drugs that is the NSA ideas for this common side effect. So, this option is the correct one. So, option number four is the correct one for this question. Next is our question number 20. And here is the question number 20. The non-invasive treatment options for coronary artery disease include which of the following procedures? Okay, so non-invasive, that means the invasive procedures are those procedures where there is the uh, in season those procedures in which we do provide a in season on the skin and with this in season on the skin we do provide something therapeutic because treatment has been asked so something therapeutic to the patient but in the invasive we have to do a skin in season with this we have to go towards the you can say body internal organs and that is an invasive procedure if we are not providing any skin in season so that will be a non-invasive uh, procedure okay so for option number first is coronary artery bypass surgery so coronary artery bypass surgery is a this surgery is an open heart surgery in which there is the creation of the bypass oh sorry creation of a bypass of the artery from one way artery to the another and this is an open heart surgery uh, incision is made over the chest and then this uh, surgery is done it is a treatment option but it is an invasive treatment option therefore this option is incorrect one the next one is oral medication therapy so oral medication therapy we are providing oral drugs to the patient so because the drugs are given orally so it is a non-invasive because we are not creating any incision cut or puncture to the skin okay the next is treatment option so yes providing medication to the patient is a treatment option so therefore this option is the correct one the next is cardiac angiography 
so cardiac angiography is inserting a you can say catheter from the way from the arteries and then visualizing that where the blockage is actually so cardiac angiography is an invasive procedure with this this is a diagnostic procedure so therefore this is completely wrong the next is percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty so when after the angiography the blockage has been seen that where the blockage is present then those blockage are removed either by your stunting so that is known as your percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty and it again need an incision from the skin to insert the catheter therefore again this is a invasive treatment method and this is a incorrect one so the non invasive treatment method is your oral medication therapy number 21 says that what should be the nurse prioritize first when caring for a client diagnosed with anterior myocardial infarction 2 days ago and identified with systolic murmur at the apex during assessment so we have a patient who has been diagnosed with the mi 2 days ago and today the patient is having systolic murmur at the apex so what do we, we mean by murmur so murmur is a sound which we, it is an abnormal heart sound and it is usually present with the abnormal heart sound present due to the regurgitation of the blood due to the regurgitation of the blood this murmur sound is present and this murmur is present at the apex of the patient now what should be the nurse prioritize when caring for this client so when the patient is having myocardial infarction and has already been diagnosed with this so myocardial infarction is a condition in which the uh, blood cell in which the cardiac cells are you can say are injured due to the decrease in the o2 supply and due to the increase in the o2 demand and due to which the uh, the coronary arteries are unable to provide the blood supply to those uh, cardiac cells and those cardiac cells have undergone the you can say death so at that condition uh, has got infarcted so we do say that patient is having myocardial infarction okay and due to this myocardial infarction now patient is also having regurgitation so if the patient is having regurgitation so that does uh, that does mean that when there is the myocardial infarction and the uh, you can say when the patient is having interior myocardial infarction, so the larger artery has been blocked or has been undergone the insufficient delivery of the O2 supply to the cardiac cells due to which the regurgitation of the blood from the mitral valve is also present. Why? Because this uh, coronary artery has not been supplied the blood to the mitral valves also and due to this the patient is having mitral valve regurgitation okay so when the patient is having this uh, type of complaints and is having mitral valve regurgitation so in that condition what can be the findings which we can see in the patient so the patient may have a, a decrease in the blood pressure of the patient due to the uh, mitral valve regurgitation with this the heart rate of the patient is also reduced with this, the respiration rate can be increased as in compensatory mechanism to meet the OT demands of the patients. And with this, cardiac output is also decreased. Why? Because the uh, regurgitation is happening. Like if this is the mitral wall, so regurgitation is happening. And due to the regurgitation, the cardiac output is decreased and cardiac output is decreased. With this, BP is also decreased in the patient and increased in the respiration rate of the patient so these are some findings which we do have with a patient who do have this uh, condition of uh, you can say myocardial infarction so what we will say <laughs> about the options we will move to the option which one is correct so first one says evaluate heart sounds with the client leaning forward so when we do auscultate for this regurgitation uh, sorry for this okay regurgitating murmurs so the murmurs can be auscultated when the patient is in the supine position or it can be uh, auscultated in the left lateral position so there is no any appropriate leaning forward position to auscultate this uh, murmurs so for this reason this option will be incorrect the next one says obtain a 12 lead ECG so the obtaining a 12 lead ECG can be done with the orders of the physician so for this reason this option will be incorrect the next one says draw an ABG. So again, ABG uh, sample drawing is by the physician's order. So for this reason, this option is also incorrect. The next one says 
assess for changes in vital signs heart rate bp and respiration so yeah we have said that patient's vital signs will be decreased so for this reason this option will be correct one so question number 21 goes right with the option number 4 moving to the next question <coughs> The next question says, which are the primary effects of nitroglycerin tablet given sublingually in the initial treatment of the client with the angina? So when we do provide the nitroglycerin tablet to the patient, so nitroglycerin is a potent vasodilator. It causes the vasodilation and due to the vasodilation, it decreases the workload to the heart and due to decrease in the workload to the heart, it decreases uh, the O2 demand, decreases, uh, you can say, workload to the heart and by decreasing the workload, Load to the heart, it decreases the O2 demand of the heart. O2 demand. And when we are decreasing the O2 demand of the, uh, you can say, heart, so that means we are maintaining or we are providing the optimum O2 uh, that is uh, going to the uh, heart cells as per the demand. When demand is decreasing, that means we are the oxygen that has been coming to the, you can say, cardiac cells is optimum to meet the demand. So we do decrease the O2 demand by providing this nitroglycerin as these nitroglycerins are potent vasodilators. So option number first is that uh, nitroglycerin works primarily as causing an increased myocardial demand. So we have said that it causes decrease in the myocardial demand. So for this reason, this option is incorrect. The next one says, improved conductivity in the myocardium so the nitroglycerin do not has any relation with this changes in the conductivity of the myocardium it doesn't work on the SA node or on the AV node or on the Purkinje fiber it works on the vessels by providing vasodilation to the vessels so for this reason this conductivity uh, fact is incorrect the next one says vasodilation of peripheral vasculature so yes this nitroglycerin do causes the vasodilation of the peripheral vasculature so this option can be correct but we have to find out each and every option present in the question the next one says antispasmodic effect on the pericardium so again this nitroglycerin do not have any antispasmodic effect so for this reason our question number 22 goes right with the option number c is that the primary effect of nitroglycerin tablet is potent vasodilation of the peripheral vasculature moving to the next question available the next question says, a 65-year-old female patient presents to the emergency department with severe crushing chest pain that radiates to the shoulder and the left arm. The initial diagnosis upon admission is acute myocardial infarction. Okay, so now the diagnosis has been made that is acute myocardial infarction. The prescribed intervention for admission include administering oxygen via nasal cannula. That is the first uh, intervention that has been provided. The next is, okay, nasal cannula at a rate of 3 liter per minute. This is the first one. The next one says obtaining a CBC. This is the second one intervention. The third one says performing a chest radiograph. This is the third one intervention. And fourth one says conducting a four, uh, 12 lead ECG. And the next one says administering a 2 gram of, uh, sorry, 2 mg of morphine sulfate. This is the fifth one intervention that has been noted in the patient's record. And uh, morphine sulfate should be given IV. The nurse should prioritize the following action. So what and out of these, which action should be the first priority for the nurse? So if the first priority has been asked, we do know, we do know that a patient who do have a myocardial infarction, the priority of action goes with the minomic uh, mona and where M stands for morphine, O is for oxygen, N is for nitroglycerin and A is for aspirin. And we do provide this morphine to the patient because this morphine do have the analgesic effect as well as these do have the effect to decreasing the O2 demand to the patient to the patient's heart so uh, we do this we do provide this to decrease the o2 demand the first and primary action of this uh, morphine when is given to the patients with mi with this it also decreases the uh, analgesic uh, it works as the analgesic and decreases the pain of the patient and as a patient in mi to have a very severe pain so it works in both of these concepts so and as it is the first drug that we should provide to the patient so moving to the options given and the uh, options given for this question option number four says 
performing a tour lead ECG. So performing a tour lead ECG can be conducted later. First, we have to decrease the O2 demand. The first action is we have to decrease the O2 demand and with decreasing the O2 demand, we have to provide the analgesic to the patient so that the patient can relieve from the severe pain. So tour lead ECG can be performed later. The next one says administer the prescribed dose of morphine. So yes, we have to provide the prescribed dose the test of the 2 milligram IV. This should be the first action. The next one says collect the necessary blood samples. So this blood samples can be collected after administering this morphine. So for this reason, this option is incorrect. And next one says order a chest radiograph for the patient. So again, this option, this investigation can be done later. So for this reason, our option number first, that is administering the prescribed dose of morphine, that is 2 mg of morphine sulfate IV. It should be prioritized first by the nurse. Moving to the next question. The next question says, when administering thrombolytic drug to a client with myocardial infarction and premature ventricular contraction, the expected outcome of the drug is two. Okay, so we are providing the thrombolytic drug to the patient and what you mean by the thrombolytic drugs? Thrombolytic drugs are those drugs which do causes the lysis of the thrombus. That means it causes the breaking lysis, uh, means breakdown and thrombus is your fibrin clot or your thrombus thrombi. So thrombolytic drugs are those drugs which causes the breakdown of this uh, thrombi and breakdown of this uh, you can say fibrin clot and this is done by to decrease the clot formation and we know to decrease the uh, clot uh, sorry to not decrease to increase the clot lysis. If the clot has been formed so this clot should be breakdown so we do provide this thrombolytic agents to the patient and this thrombolytic agents works as this activate this is a plasminogen activator and it activates the uh, you can say this plasminogen to the active form that is plasmid and this plasmin causes the uh, lysis of the fibrin to the fibrin particles and this fibrin is insoluble while this fibrin fragments are the soluble fragments and thus causes the lysis of the thrombus. So moving to the questions and the options available for this question. Option number first is aid in clot dissolution. So yes, thrombolytic drugs help in the, uh, you can say clot dissolution. This option is correct one. Next one says facilitate adequate hydration. So because this thrombolytic agent do not cause any, you can say changes in the kidney functioning and do not cause any water resorption and also so it do not catch causes any changes in the uh, you can say hydration and next one says mitigate the risk for kidney failure so again for this reason because this is not the mechanism of action for this so this option is incorrect one the next one says uh, manage dysrhythmia so these do not directly causes any changes in the you can say the activity of the SA node or the AV node uh, so that it can manage the dysrhythmia so for this reason this option is uh, incorrect however it do causes the uh, clot dissolution so our question number 24 goes right with the option number first moving to the next question the next question okay here we here we are having a contest question for you and you can answer this contest question in the comment box and you can get a chance of winning the one thousand dollar directly into the your bank account or you can get a chance to get your free enrollment in one of our premier courses only you have to do is to comment down the correct answer in the comment section the next question and the next question says what is the most frequently observed symptom in patients experiencing myocardial infarction? So those patients who do have myocardial infarction, that means who do have a imbalance or decrease O2 supply to the cardiac cells, decrease O2 supply to the cardiac cells. And due to that, what happens there is the, uh, 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 my, or uh, you can say myocardial infarction due to decrease in the O2, uh, you can say supply. So due to decrease in the O2 activity or O2 supply, the cells goes, uh, you can say what, uh, anaerobic, uh, anaerobic, you can say physiology. And due to this anaerobic reactions, there is production of this lactic acid. And this lactic acid causes the pain to the patient. And this pain is present in the chest because the patient do have the, uh, everyone should do have the heart at the, you can say, uh, 
and the left side so the patient uh, would have the chest pain and that is at the left side of the chest and with this this pain radiates to where this pain arises from the chest radiates to the left shoulder radiates to the left neck radiates to the left jaw radiates to the left ear with this radiates to the left shoulder to the left arm and to the middle and the last finger so the most common uh, symptom that is present with the myocardial infarction is the chest pain and usually this chest pain is radiating chest pain so our option number first is edema so edema is not the prior symptom of this so for this reason this option is incorrect this near this near can be present but obviously this is not the most frequently so for this reason this option is incorrect the next one says uh, palpitation so again this is not the most common symptoms so for this reason this option is incorrect and last one says chest pain so yes the radiating chest pain also known as angina pain is present in the angina and same the chest pain is present in the patients who are having myocardial infarction. So for this reason, question number 25 goes right with the option number 4. Moving to the next question. The next question says, what is the primary purpose of administering morphine to a patient with MI? So we have discussed that we do provide the morphine as a first drug to the patients who do have MI. And if you talk about the action of this morphine, so it we just can remember it by a minomic and that is sacrum. And uh, from where as is for the sedatives? A is for the analgesic. C is for the constipation, which is a, a side effect of this drug. R is for the respiratory depression, adverse effect of this drug. Next one says U and U is for euphoria which increases the feeling of happiness and well-being in the patient and decreases the anxiety of the patient. And M is for meiosis, that is the pinpoint pupil that is present in the side effect of this drug and in the overdose effect of this drug. Out of this, uh, you can say actions, the sedative action of this morphine uh, causes the decrease in the O2 demand to the heart decrease in the O2 demand to the heart and with this the A also works as the analgesics and it decreases the pain of the patient and as the patient to have a severe pain so it decreases that pain sees the side effect so this is not we do not have to mention it as a uh, purpose here next one respiratory depression it is also an adverse effect u is for euphoria and euphoria decreases the anxiety of the patient and next one is the meiosis which is present in the overdoses so the action that can be the purpose if should be sedative analgesic euphoria if we compare these three and we talk about the most and the primary purposes asked in the question so this decrease in the oxygen demand should be the primary purpose because we have to decrease the oxygen demand so that the uh, you can say the infarction can be limited so for this reason this decrease in the o2 demand of the patient is the primary purpose of this drug so moving to the options available for for this question the question um, the option number first says to decrease oxygen demand of the patient's heart so yes the primary purpose is this one the next one says to sedate the patient so we do not want to sedate the patient but we only want to do what to decrease the o2 demand we do not want to sedate the patient so for this reason this option is incorrect the next one says to decrease the patient's anxiety so yes the morphine do decreases the patient's anxiety but again this is not the primary purpose this is the secondary one next option is to decrease the patient's pain so again this is the secondary one this is not the primary one the primary one is to decrease the o2 demand to the patient's heart so for this reason question number 26 goes right with the option number first Moving to the next, the next question number 27 says, after coronary artery bypass surgery, what is the most effective measure the nurse can take to prevent wound infection while changing our client's dressing? Okay, so the patient has undergone coronary artery bypass surgery, which is a surgery that can be done after the patients who have undergone MI. And here are some pictures of this CABG. It can be single, double, triple, quadruple uh, bypass. Um, based on the, how many uh, vessels are bypassing in this coronary artery bypass graft. Okay, moving back to the question. The patient has undergone the surgery and now the examiner is asking about most effective measure to prevent the wound infection. Okay, and when we are preventing the wound infection while changing the client's dressing. 
Okay. So option number one says thoroughly clean the incisional area with an antiseptic. So we do clean the incisional area with the antiseptic and uh, decreasing this, uh, uh, oh, sorry, cleaning this incisional area decreases the risk for the infection. The next one says dispose the soil dressing in the waterproof uh, bag again to prevent the cross infection and to prevent the swelling of the linens and uh, prevent the infection to the linens and so we do dispose the soil dressing in the waterproof bag. The next one says apply pre-packaged style dressings to cover the incision. So yes, this can be, this should be done also. The next one says adhere to rigorous hand washing procedure so if we talk about these four options our adherence to the rigorous hand washing procedure sets on the topmost priority because if the uh, you can say if as a nurse the nurse do uh, you can say do what this uh, proper hand washing procedure before changing the dressing so this will limit the or you can say exposure of the microorganism to the patients, uh, you can say what to patients, uh, this surgical site. So for this reason, the hand washing is always on the topmost priority when we talk about to decrease the infection and to prevent the cross infection, to prevent the wound infection or so. So for this reason, option number four will be correct when all other options should be followed during the surgical dressing. But the option number four is, the, uh, is on the topmost priority. So for question number 27, goes right with the option number four. Moving to the next question available. The next question says, what is the primary action? Primary action, it should be given the first priority of care for a patient showing signs and symptoms suggestive of coronary artery disease. Okay, so the patient is having the symptoms of coronary artery disease and what should be the primary action for this? Okay, so the option first says educate the patient about their symptoms. So when the, there is a patient who is having the symptoms of coronary artery disease, these patients do have severe pain. And with this severe pain, these patients do have severe anxiety. And if the patient is having severe pain and severe anxiety, and at that time, at that time, actually the examiner is asking about the primary action, about the immediate action about the immediate action and if the patient is already having the symptoms so we are not here we have to maintain or we have to manage the symptoms rather than telling the patient about the symptoms and increasing his anxiety and pain we have to manage the symptoms so for this reason this option will be incorrect the next option says administer sublingual medication so sublingual medication uh, usually to provide in the patient so to have angina and do do okay can be provided but first we can watch all the options this can be provided to the patient sublingual medication can be provided okay the next one says enhance myocardial oxygenation so yes when a patient is showing the symptoms of this mi or coronary artery disease so coronary artery disease do occur when there is the decrease in the auto supply versus increase in the O2 demand increase in the O2 demand if the patient is having this cag so we have to do what we have to enhance the myocardial oxygen and how can we provide this myocardial oxygen we can decrease the demand we can increase the supply so we do have to do we have to increase the myocardial oxygenation we can either increase the supply we can either decrease the demand and ultimately we have to provide um optimum level of the uh, oxygenation demand versus supply only then we can we can uh, you can say uh, treat the patient next one says decrease anxiety so anxiety should be decreased but to limit the course of the disease first we have to enhance myocardial oxygenation so decreasing anxiety can be done to the patient but again it is not at the topmost priority uh, administering sublingual medication providing any sublingual medication to the patient or without any prescription is not uh, preferred the our ultimate goal is to enhance the myocardial oxygenation rather than providing any sublingual medication this sublingual medication can be anyone and it has not been specified which one so for this reason this option is in Correct. So our question number 28 goes right with the option number third. Moving to the next option, uh, next question. Okay, before moving to the next question, we have a contest question for you again. And to 
participate in this, in this contest question you have to uh, comment down the answer of this question in the comment box and the one who will answer most of the questions correctly in the comment box will get a chance to win an exclusive one thousand dollar into his bank account or he can get a free enrollment in one of our premier courses so go down and comment in the comment section moving to the next option next question the next question says a 60 year old male client who is on the second day after hip surgery and has no cardiac history reports experiencing chest heaviness what should be the initial nursing action in response to this question so patient is already has undergone hip surgery two days ago and is having no cardiac history and is having what no cardiac history and now after two days the patient is having chest heaviness so first action will be so obviously first action will be assessment why assessment because patient was not having any so the patient was uh, not having any history of the cardiac disease or so so and now the patient is having the chest pain or the chest heaviness this chest heaviness may be due to the effect of any other medication this may be due to the effect of any underlying disease condition and if the patient is only telling about chest heaviness first we have to do a proper uh, assessment of the patient then we have to you can say inform the physician about the condition and about the patient finding inform physician about the condition as well as the findings which we have uh, gotten into the uh, this assessment condition and findings okay moving to the options available the option number first is notify the physician about the chest heaviness so we have told that we should notify the physician but this notification should be after the assessment so for this reason this option will be incorrect one the next one says assess the onset duration, severity, and any precipitating factors associated with the chest heaviness. So yes, we have to, if the patient is telling us any sign or symptom, we have to do a proper assessment regarding how the this uh, chest heaviness has been in, in started and how long it has been going on, what is the severity of this chest heaviness or any other factors, maybe the uses of the drug, maybe any other you can say anxious condition that the patient is facing so we have to do this proper assessment of the patient this option can be right but first we have to look out for all the options available the next one says provide oxygen via nasal cannula if needed so providing oxygen can be done after having the assessment and if the patients after in the patient patient's SpO2 is falling so in that condition this uh, nasal cannula oxygen can be provided so for this reason this option is incorrect because we cannot provide it only for the chest heaviness without any uh, you can say uh, changes or without any findings in the SPO2. The next option says offer pain medication. So offering pain medication is the uh, is the you can say responsibility of the doctor and as a nurse you should not provide any pain medication just for the chest heaviness. First you have to do a proper assessment then you can provide that pain medication that has been prescribed by the doctor. So for this reason, this option is again incorrect. So for question number 29 goes with the proper assessment and that is option number second for this question. Moving to the next question of this series and that is question number 30. Question number 30 says, before administering tissue plus minogen activator, the nurse should assess the client for which of the following contraindication to receiving the medication. So when we talk about this tissue plus minogen activator, so this tissue plus minogen activator are the thrombolytics and which causes the, uh, you can say inactive plus minogen, inactive plus minogen to the active plasmin. These tissue plasminogen uh, in activators are your uh, what thrombolytics. Okay, these tissue plasminogen activator converts inactivated plasminogen to the plasmin, and these plasmin causes the degradation of this fibrin, which is insoluble, to the fibrin fragments. And these fibrin fragments are in the soluble form, and because they are soluble, they do degrade the formation of this thrombus. So these are the you can say mechanism of this TPA, and if the nurse is providing any TPA to the patient. 
inflammation because this TPA causes the you can say lysis of the thrombus. So the nurse should take care if the patient is having any uh, history of any uh, cerebral hemorrhage. The patient is having history of any hemorrhage in the body. So those patients do not get this tissue plasminogen activator because this will cause further, uh, you can say what, further uh, risk for bleeding. So those patients who are to have the further risk for bleeding are contraindicated for this TPA and this TPA do do are contraindicated in uh, cases of cerebral hemorrhage. With this, they are contraindicated in any active bleeding. They are contraindicated in uh, if the patient is having any bleeding disorder. With this, if the patient do have esophageal varices, like the esophageal varices are present with the patients who do have liver cirrhosis, and because these esophageal varices are at the increased risk for bleeding, so the TPA are contraindicated in this. With this, if the patient is having any major surgery, so in that cases, the patient is contraindicated with this so these are some you can say contraindications moving to the options available which talk about the contraindication for this patient option number four says history of cerebral hemorrhage so yes those patients who do have the history of cerebral hemorrhage should be contraindicated for this tpa so option number first can be the correct one the next one says history of heart failure so TPAs are not contraindicated in heart failure. So for this reason, this option is incorrect. The next one says age over 65 years. So again, TPAs are not contraindicated for any age. So for that is over the 65 years. So for this reason, this option is incorrect. And next one says cigarette smoking. So again, it is not indica uh, contraindicated with this contra uh, cigarette smoking. So for question number 30 goes right with the option number first that these TPAs are contraindicated in those patients who do have the history of cerebral hemorrhage. Moving to the next question, that is our question number 31st. Question number 31st says, the nurse observes a client's heart rate decreasing from 68 to 48 beats per minute on the monitor. To determine the appropriate course of action, the nurse should first. Okay, so the patient's heart rate is decreasing. Patient's heart rate is decreasing. That means there is any changes in the cardiac activity. Why? Because patients first having a normal heart rate that was 68 beats pm uh, that is beats per minute and now the patient is having a decrease in heart rate so that means there is any changes in what changes in the cardiac activity of the patient so what should the nurse do first the option number first says measure the client's blood pressure to assess their cardiovascular status so the first option says the nurse has to check the blood pressure of the patient to assess if there is any change in the cardiac activity or not and if there is so, so what it would be. So option number first can be the correct one because if we are having any finding as such, we have to do a proper assessment of the patient, then we have to move with the interventions. And if we are only finding this on the monitor, we cannot move directly to the intervention. Then option number first is about the assessment and that assessment is about the blood pressure. So this option can be correct one. Moving to the next option, the next option says auscultate for any abnormal heart sound. So auscultating an abnormal heart sound can be done after this but first we have to do what a cardiovascular status so for this reason this option is incorrect the next one says prepare the possibility for transcutaneous pacing so transcutaneous pacing uh, is an intervention which should be done after the proper assessment of the patient so for this reason this option is incorrect the next one says administer atropine to the patient that is 0.5 mg IV push. So atropine is again an intervention to increase the heart rate of the patient. But this atropine should be provided after the proper assessment. So for this reason, this option is also incorrect. So our question number 31st goes right with the option number first. Moving to the next question, that is question number 32. It says... A client 50 years old arrives at emergency department after driving himself. He has a history of hypertension and shares that his father passed away from heart attack at age 60. The client presents with indigestion and the nurse promptly connects him to the ECG monitor while administering oxygen 2 liter via nasal cannula. What should be the nurse's immediate next step? So 
when the patient has been came with these findings and is at the risk of myocardial infarction why because the patient's father has already undergone the heart attack at the age so the patient to have a family history of the same so considering the patient's family history and the signs and symptoms of the patient the initial action of maintaining the o2 supply has been done now according to the emergency management the next step should be uh, you can say initiating the iv line to the patient so that it would be more easier and it would be more uh, in power to provide this uh, medications that would be prescribed by the physician to the to, uh, to the patient so option number first is collect blood samples to the laboratory study so obtaining blood samples would be done after the uh, you can say physician's order and now it has not been mentioned that uh, this has been ordered so for this reason option number first is incorrect one the next option says request assistance from the physician so the physician requesting assistance can be done after inserting the two patients iv line as an emergency management so for this reason this option can be incorrect uh, the next one says insert one or two iv line so as an emergency management of the patient initiating the iv access to the patient is at the topmost priority so for this reason option number third goes right the next one says obtain a portable chest x ray so again to obtain a portable chest x ray the nurse has the uh, prescription of the doctor so for this reason this option is incorrect so for question number 32 goes right with the option number third that is inserting one or two iv lines to the patient moving to the next uh, question so the next question that is question number 33 it says what is the expected outcome what is the expected outcome of client taking warfarin with chronic heart failure atrial fibrillation and left ventricular ejection fraction of 15% so those patients who do have this a uh, chronic heart failure with atrial fibrillation and those patients who do have a uh, decrease in the left ventricular ejection fraction those patients are at increased risk for clot formation why they are at increased risk for the clot formation because the patient is having chronic artery, uh, heart failure and is having what and is having a uh, atrial fibrillation due to which there can be the stresses of the blood and there is the pooling of the blood in the atrials and patient is also having the chronic heart failure so the heart is unable to pump the uh, blood properly so due to which the patients are having uh, at the increased risk of this clot formation so if we talk about this warfarin so warfarin can be provided to the patient as a prophylactic action as it is in um, you can say uh, it decreases the risk for clot formation anticoagulant it decreases risk for clot formation warfarin is an anticoagulant drug this war warfarin uh, uh, interferes with the clotting factor 2 7 9 10 of this uh, clotting cascade and by interfering the synthesis of these clotting factors it decreases the risk for clot formation it decreases the risk for the clot formation so for those patients who are having this condition and are at high risk for the clot formation those patients do have this warfarin as the prophylactic doses to decrease the risk for clotting formation by uh, hindering the clotting cascade moving to the options available the first one says prevent a thrombus formation so yes this warfarin is given to prevent the uh, thrombus formation to the patient this option is correct one next is decrease circulatory overload so this uh, warfarin do not have to do anything with the circulatory overload so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says regulate cardiac rhythm so this warfarin do not have any function with the sr ev node directly and it do not control the cardiac rhythm of the patient so it cannot control the cardiac rhythm so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says improve the myocardial workload so again this warfarin do not have any uh, you can say a mechanism with this myocardium directly so it do not work anything with improving the cardiac workload so for this reason this option is incorrect as this warfarin is a anticoagulant so this warfarin is given to prevent the thrombus formation so So option number first goes right with the question number thirty-three. Moving to the next question, uh, next option, uh, next question of this series. So the next question is question number thirty-four. Question number thirty-four says the nurse observes a client heart rate decreasing from sixty-eight to forty-eight beats per minute. 
on the monitor to determine the appropriate course of action that knows okay we have discussed this one moving to the next one so question number 35 we will do this question number 34 in the next uh, series okay so question number 35 says what does the presence of crackers during lung auscultation typically signifies so uh, the question says what does the presence of crackles during lung auscultation there is presence of crackles so crackles is the condition of accumulation of the fluid in the alveoli and these crackles are present with the inspiration and what are the crackles crackles are the pooping sounds this pooping sound comes when when there are the small you can say uh, uh, a small uh, bron bronchi and the alveoli and these alveoli are having filled with this water or you can say fluid so in that condition when the patient do inspire so when this air comes in the contact with this uh, water so there is presence of a pooping sound and this pooping sound is known as crackles here the uh, here the uh, examiner says about the presence of crackles so presence of crackles is due to accumulation of fluid in the alveoli so option number a is the correct one the next one says airway narrowing so airway narrowing if the patient to have airway narrowing so it do present with the sound that is wheezing and this wheezing is present next one says bronchospasm so bronchospasm is the spasm or the constriction of the bronchioles and with this bronchospasm again the wheezing is present so for this reason these two options are incorrect the next one says sinusis so sinusis is the blue discoloration of the of any area due to the decrease in the o2 supply so if there is any blue discoloration so that is sinusis and that indicates the decrease o2 supply that is not the crackles decrease o2 supply and these are not the crackles so for this reason this option is incorrect one moving to the next question the next question says a nurse is evaluating an elderly individual with a pacemaker who leads a sedentary lifestyle the client complains of inability to engage in physically demanding activities in light of this the nurse should conduct additional assessment to identify which of the following condition so nurse is evaluating elderly individual first one the patient is having pacemaker and is complaining about inability to engage in the physically demanding activities okay so what should be the nurse's assessment for this condition so those patients who are having a pacemaker and this pacemaker if the patient is having a sedentary lifestyle or if the patient or any individual is if having any sedentary lifestyle so due to which what happens there is usually the presence of left ventricular high uh, left ventricular atrophy and this left ventricular atrophy uh, is due to decrease in the body demand of heart functioning because the patient is having a sedentary lifestyle so due to this this uh, findings can be present to the patient moving to the options available the option number first is placement of the pacemaker so placing a pacemaker to the patient do not make the patient unable to engage with the uh, activity so for this reason this option is incorrect the next one says irregular heart rhythm so if the patient is having a pacemaker patient is having a pacemaker and if it is working properly so there is no any uh, irregular heart rhythm a pacemaker to provide a regular heart rhythm to the patient so for this reason this option is incorrect the next one says peripheral vascular occlusion so peripheral vascular occlusion can be present if the patient is having a sedentary lifestyle but this peripheral vascular uh, occlusion will not uh, you can say challenge the patient in physically demanding activities the challenge uh, that should be uh, present with this physically activity uh, that is due to the decrease in the o2 uh, you can say supply during this activity as when we do pro when we do any physical work the o2 demand of the body increases and if the heart is not if the heart is not working properly to meet this O2 demands, then there is decrease in the O2 supply and patient is unable to perform these activities. And these decrease in the O2 supply do present in the patient who are having a sedentary lifestyle because their left ventricular atrophy can be present. So option number third is also incorrect because vascular occlusion will not cause physically demanding activities as a challenge. Next one, the left ventricular atrophy. This can be, this is the right option for this question because a sedentary lifestyle can cause it.
Moving to the next question. The next question says, the nurse has conducted a comprehensive assessment on client who presents with a reduced cardiac output. Considering the client's condition, certain findings should be prioritized due to their critical nature. What criteria should be used uh, to determine the findings deserving of the highest priority? So the nurse is having a client with reduced cardiac output and what should be the uh, findings that is at the topmost priority so option number first is weight gain uh, 1000 gram in four days bp 120 by 80 mild dyspnea with exercise so here bp is a normal and uh, mild dyspnea is present that is patient is having only mild discomfort or you can say dyspnea here and that mild dyspnea is present with the exercise not in the normal routine okay weight gain is present the next one says urine output 10 ml over the last two hours. That means the patient is having oligouria. That means the patient's kidney are not getting enough O2 supply. The next one says orthopnea. That means patient is having uh, difficulty in breathing. And with this, the patient is having confusion. That means patients, you can say, brain is also not getting the enough O2 supply. It means that patient's vital organs are not getting the enough O2 supply. Okay. The next option says SPO2 93 or 2 liter nasal cannula. Okay. Uh, which is, uh, you can say, a mild uh, finding. And respiration 18. This is a normal finding. And edema 1 plus on the lower extremities, which is again a mild finding here. The next one says PP 130 by 72, which is a mild finding. Atrial fibrillation is present. Okay. Heart rate is 78, which is a normal finding. And by basilar crackles, that means patient is having crackles on both sides of the lungs at the basis. So, this is also a, you can say, this is also an abnormal finding present here. So, if we talk about all these four options and compare these, so, the option number second will have the those findings which are providing decreased oxygen supply to the vital organs and which is at the topmost priority. So, for this reason, question number 37 uh, goes right with the option number B. The nurse should uh, place this patient as the highest priority. The next question says, Upon admission, which of the following should the nurse prioritize in their assessment for an older adult with a history of heart failure and pulmonary edema? So, uh, we are having an older adult with a history of heart failure and pulmonary edema. So, pulmonary edema or heart failure, those patients who do have heart failure, these patients may can get pulmonary edema because in those patients, if there is the heart failure, due to the heart failure, the ventricles, if we talk about the systolic heart failure, the ventricles are unable to pump the, uh, you can say this, uh, blood to the iota. And due to inability to pump the blood to the iota, there is the regurgitation of the blood to where? To the atrium. Regurgitation to the atria. And if we talk about the left ventricle here and left atria here, and from the left atria, this blood regurgitate or push back to the pulmonary veins. And when there is the regurgitation to the pulmonary veins, the patient may get the pulmonary edema. And due to this condition, the patient may have a finding of very, you can say, uh, decrease in the O2 uh, supply to the vital organs. Why? Because the heart is, or you can say left ventricle heart is filled and the left ventricle is not providing enough cardiac output to the body. So, decrease in the O2 supply to the body due to which what happens, the RAS system gets activated. The RAS system gets activated and causes the vasoconstriction. This RAS system also causes the secretion of the aldosterone and again this aldosterone also causes vasoconstriction and due to which there is massive vasoconstriction in the patient and as the you can say compensatory mechanism the sympathetic nervous system also get activates and causes vasoconstriction and due to this vasoconstriction 
massive vasoconstriction the patient will have a increase in the blood pressure due to the increase in the vasoconstriction the so the findings that can be present with this condition can be increased in the blood pressure so moving to the options available for this question so option number first is serum potassium level so serum potassium level changes can cause arrhythmias to the patient and <laughs> sorry and with the heart failure and pulmonary edema a serum potassium level can be changed but this is not the priority changes the next one says urine output so urine output can be decreased due to the activation of the ras system the next one says blood pressure so blood pressure should be increased due to the massive vasoconstriction the next one says skin integrity so there is you can say disturbed skin integrity due to this uh, you can say massive overload or uh, blood pressure to the patient so if you compare these four options so changes in the blood pressure would be at the topmost priority of the patient and then all other symptoms can be present with the patient urine output changes serum potassium and skin integrity changes can be present but out of the four the changes in the blood pressure would be at the topmost priority so question number 38 goes right with the option number c and rest all options are incorrect one moving to the next question that is question number 39 question number 39 says for a client with angina taking nifedipine, what should the nurse teach the client to do? So, when we talk about the nifedipine, so nifedipine is a calcium channel blocker. It works on the L-type receptors of the calcium channel. L okay, uh, calcium channel blockers. It works on the L-type channels and it blocks the calcium entering to the smooth muscle cells. When it blocks the calcium entry to the smooth muscle cells, what it causes, there is a decrease in the contraction of those muscles and due to decrease in the contraction, there is increase in the vasodilation. And due to increase in the vasodilation, these drugs are usually uh, used in those patients who do have angina or who do are having blood pressure. Uh, you can say hypertension increases the blood pressure. So those patients do take this nifedipine. So increase in the vasodilation causes the, uh, you can say, uh, relief from the angina. And when the this uh, contraction of the vessels is decreased, there is proper O2 uh, supply to the, you can say, heart and it will decrease the symptoms of the angina. Okay. If we talk about the side effects, Regarding this nephedipine, so the side effects are related to this uh, vasodilatory effect and if we talk about the vasodilatory effect, the, so the patient may have uh, hypotension as a side effect, with this patient may have edema as a side effect, patient may have palpitations as a side effect, with this patient may have nausea as a side effect. So these may be the side effects of this uh, nifedipine. With this, if we talk about some rare side effects, so in rare side effects, the patient may have the gums hyperplasia. The gums hyperplasia can be seen. This gums hyperplasia can be seen due to the accumulation of the collagen and in the, uh, you can say in the gums and with this decrease in the apoptosis, which causes an increase in the epithelial mitosis. Okay, decrease in the apoptosis, which causes increase in the epithelial uh, overgrowth and the patient will have gums hyperplasia. So, this is a rare side effect of this nephrotipine. Moving to the options available for this question. So, the first one says inspect gums daily. So, yes, this patient's gum should be inspected daily to check for this gums hyperplasia. And if gums hyperplasia is present, then this drug should be stopped and can be replaced with any other calcium channel blocker. So this option can be correct one. Moving to the next one, be cautious with the intake of green leafy vegetables. So there is no any, you can say, uh, special causes with this uh, uses of green leafy vegetables with this nephedipine. So for this reason, this option is incorrect. The next one says monitor blood pressure regularly. So mo monitoring uh, blood pressure regularly with the nephedipine is a good option and should be done 
okay should be done but this should be done uh, by the nurse and uh, about teaching the client we have to teach about inspecting the gums daily so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says perform daily weight check so there is no need to perform daily weight checks to the patients so for this reason this option is incorrect one so our question number 39 goes right with the option number a moving to the question number 40 so the question number 40 says lizix is given intravenously to the patient with heart failure when can the nurse expect to observe the intended outcome of the drug uh, administration so if we talk about this lasix so lasix is the high ceiling diuretics and it works in the increase in the urine output this is a high ceiling diuretics with this it works uh, at the loops of the Hanley. So, it is a loop diuretics. Okay. So, it works uh, as a loop diuretics. When uh, working at the loop diuretic, it causes the, you can say, uh, you, it increases the urine output. It increases the sodium, potassium and chloride and calcium and magnesium excretion. So, it increases urine excretion. If we talk about the, uh, you, uh, you can say what has been given. Uh, expected to observe intended outcome. So, if we talk about the onset of action of this LASIK, so the onset of action is quite short for this drug. So, if the drug is provided by the oral route, so the onset of action is 20 to 40 minutes. If the drug is provided by the IM route, so the onset of action is 10 to 20 minutes. And if the drug is provided by the IV route, so the onset of action is within 2 to 5 minutes. Okay. And here the uh, question has said that Lasix has been given intravenously that is by the IV route. So, the onset of action is uh, 2 to 5 minutes. Okay. So, our option number first is around 2 to 4 hours. So, this option is incorrect. Well, the next one says within 5 to 10 minutes. Okay. Next one says approximately 30 to 60 minutes. And next one says after 6 to 8 hours. So, this is incorrect well, because the onset of action is not in the hours. So, the correct one is from the 2 to 5 minutes. So, the option which will be more close to the 2 to 5 minutes is within 5 to 10 minutes rather than 30 to 60 minutes. So, for this reason, option number B is correct one and C is is incorrect one. Number 41 says the healthcare professional imparts knowledge to a patient who has heart failure and the suitable schedule for taking oral furosemide in the morning. The main objective of this guidance is to okay. So we are having a patient with the diagnosis of heart failure and the patient is taking oral furosemide. So when the patient is taking oral furosemide, the dose has been given during the morning time and the main objective for providing this dose at the morning will be. So if you talk about this oral furosemide, this furosemide is a you can say loop diuretic and it causes the diuresis and due to the diuresis it increases the excretion of water and electrolytes increases excretion of water and electrolytes and if we talk about its mechanism so its mechanism to start the onset of action to start within one to two hour within an hour of providing the oral medication and with this the half-life of the drug is approximate two hours and if we talk the, about the therapeutic uh, effect of this drug so the therapeutic effect to remain for the six to eight hours so if the patient is taking this drug orally so the onset of action will be started early and with this the patient the half-life of the drug that means the drug will uh, the half-life will be two hours and therapeutic effect can be seen during the night time that is from the six to eight hours if the patient do take this medication at the night time so what will happen the patient will have to go for voiding again and again so we do provide this medication to the patient at the morning so that patient may have this sound sleep during the night time and the sleep patient will not face any uh, disturbance in his or her sleep. This is the purpose of providing this lasix to the patient at the night. Uh, sorry, not at the night time, but to the morning time. So, moving to the options available for this question. Option number first is assist in elimination of any excess fluid accumulated during the night. So, the elimination of 
excess fluid the at the night time there if the patient do not intake any excess fluid so how there will be the elimination of any excess fluid and we do want to decrease the disturbance of the patient rather than uh, removing any excess fluid uh, from the patient's body at the night time so for this reason this option is incorrect the next one says reduce the likelihood of sleep disturbance during the night time hours allowing better rest and recovery so yes we do provide this at the morning and not at the night time so that the patient can have a sound sleep and will uh, you can say will be have a better rest and recovery so for this reason this option is in is this option is correct one the next option says maintain proper electrolyte balance so if we are providing the lasix to the patient so there is um, risk for having electrolyte imbalance and this electrolyte imbalance is present also at the daytime and also at the night time it doesn't matter that at what time we are providing this drug to the patient the drug do causes the electrolyte imbalance and have a risk for causing the electrolyte imbalance so providing the morning route doesn't reduce the risk for having this electrolyte imbalance so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says ensure a gradual and controlled absorption of medication so controlled absorption of medication can be done at any time when we are providing this medication to the patient so for this reason question number 41 goes right with the option number b Moving to the next question, the next question says, after a client undergoes mitral valve replacement surgery, it is essential for the nurse to assess client's comprehension of post-surgery activity restrictions before discharge. Which of the following activities should the nurse avoid until they are 30 days after the discharge? So, if there is a patient who has undergone the valve replacement surgery, so after the valve replacement surgery, we have to teach the patient that the patient has to provide, has to take appropriate rest for the next uh, next days and there is presence of fatigue. So the patient has to avoid heavy works. Patient has to avoid heavy works in which he has to avoid heavy weight lifting and the patient has to avoid any dental procedure within the six months no dental procedure within the six months why because this will decrease the risk of having the infection in the replaced site of the surgery so no dental procedure so that means that dental procedures should be avoided and heavy weight lifting will be avoided with this rest should be given to the patients of after this uh, you can say ball replacement surgery so moving to the options available option number first is lifting anything heavier than 10 lb and that is 4.5 kg so yes patients uh, are avoided to weight lift and that is heavier than 4.5 kg so for this reason this option is correct one the next one says light housework so the patient can perform light housework there is no restriction on that so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says showering so the patient can take shower this is not a uh, you can say uh, restricted activity so for this reason this option is incorrect the next one says a program of gradually progressive walking so patient can gradually progress the walking when this is not restricted so for this reason this option is incorrect one so the correct option is lift anything heavier than 4.5 kg should be restricted until the 30 days after the discharge question number 42 goes right with the option number first moving to the next one the next question says which of the following blood test is most commonly used to assess the cardiac damage so there are certain uh, blood tests that are used uh, after the or you can say to identify the blood to identify the heart damage to the patient and these uh, tests are related to the uh, cardiac cardiac proteins that are released after the injury to the cardiac cells after injury to the cardiac cells these cardiac proteins are released and the presence of these cardiac proteins in increases the you can say confirmation for having the cardiac damage or having the myocardial infarction so if we talk about the cardiac enzyme so the most 
specific one is stop i because stop i is present in the cardiac cell so for this reason stop i is a most specific test and because it is the most specific this is the most common test to assess during the cardiac damage if we talk about the complete blood count so complete blood count is a uh, blood test and do use in the general investigation schedule it do not assess the cardiac damage so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says lactate dehydrogen so lactate dehydrogenase activity or you can say level can be increased with other conditions so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says creatinine kinase so again creatinine kinase is again to have released with other conditions so for this reason this option is incorrect one the option number first goes right with the question number 43 Moving to the next question. The next question says, what are the signs indicating potential digoxin toxicity that the nurse should educate about the client? So if the patient to take the digoxin, so digoxin is a positive inotrop agent and these digoxin may cause certain, uh, you can say, uh, certain side effects to the patient. It do causes certain side effects and with these certain side effects, if the uh, level of digoxin increases in the blood, concentration increases in the blood, so this digoxin do causes certain signs that indicates the signs of toxicity. So the signs of toxicity of these are usually nausea and vomiting, which are the common and general side effects or sorry toxicity signs and with this patient may have mental confusion with this mental confusion this is present with the disorientation disorientation with this there is present the visual disturbance in the visual disturbance the patient may have yellow spots the patient may see the yellow spots and patient may see the yellow green spots so these are some signs of the digoxin toxicity so if the patient is having digoxin toxicity or is indicating digoxin toxicity so the findings will be first one says development of rash over chest and back so digoxin toxicity do not cause the uh, rash over chest and back so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says increased appetite so appetite is decreased due to presence of the nausea and vomiting so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says experience of visual disturbance such as a perceiving yellow spot so yes this is a potential sign of having digoxin toxicity the next one says increased blood pressure level so the uh, digoxin causes increase in the force of contraction and is a positive inotropic agent so for this reason this option is incorrect one the correct option will be uh, the correct option will be option number third that the signs that indicate potential digoxin toxicity are experience of visual disturbances such as perceiving yellow spots or perceiving yellow to green spots moving to the next question the next question says, if the client's serum level indicates the following, the nurse should carefully assess the client for potential digoxin toxicity. So that means that out of these signs, which do or which lab investigation shows, there is a risk for potential uh, digoxin toxicity so if we talk about the digoxin so digoxin do work on the sodium potassium atipase pump and these digoxin do block the sodium potassium atipase pump and due to blocking of this sodium potassium atipase pump it causes the decrease in the decrease in the you can say uh, it causes increase in the force of contraction and decrease in the heart rate so this is the functioning of the digoxin because it inhibits the sodium potassium atipase pump that are present in the myocardial for, uh, at the myocardial fibers there is accumulation of the sodium intracellularly and accumulation of the potassium extracellularly it causes it and it blocks the you can say this pump and due to the blockage it decreases the contraction 
due to decrease in the number of contraction frequency of contraction the heart rate decreases but the force of contraction is increased by giving this drug to the patient and because it works on the sodium potassium atp sperm so if in the it binds to the site where the potassium do where there is a presence there is a receptor of the potassium at that site the potassium binds if there is the presence of potassium and if there is the decreased potassium at site so what will happen more and more digoxin will bind to the site and more digoxin will cause the digoxin toxicity that means that if the potassium level is normal so the normal amount of the digoxin will bind to the site and will cause the therapeutic effect but if already the potassium level is decreased so the digoxin will have more sites to bind and if it will bind to the more sites then it will cause the more effect and will cause the digoxin toxicity effect so the patient who will have the decreased potassium level that is who will have hypokalemia are at the risk of having digoxin toxicity so moving to the option the first one says high glucose level this option is incorrect one next one says low sodium level this option is incorrect one next is low potassium level so this option is correct one and next is high calcium level so this option is incorrect one so low potassium level can cause the risk for having potential digoxin toxicity moving to the next question the next question says okay this is the fact that you have to learn that hypokalemia causes digoxin toxicity this is a fact number first that hypokalemia causes digoxin toxicity and fact number 2 is digoxin toxicity if has happened then it will cause the hyperkalemia to the patient okay moving to the next question The next question says a client with history of heart failure is taking furosemide, digoxin, and potassium chloride. The present they present with nausea, blurred vision, headache, weakness, and confusion. The ECG strip indicates first degree atrioventricular block. The nurse should assess the client for signs of which of the following. So, if a patient is having the furosemide, so furosemide is a low diuretic, and with the functioning of the low diuretics. it causes the increase in the excretion of water it causes increase electrolyte loss and in the electrolyte loss it causes the loss of sodium it causes loss of potassium loss of chloride loss of calcium and loss of magnesium these are the electrolytes that are lost during the intake of the uh, you this uh, loop diuretics if we talk about the digoxin so digoxin is given to the patient because it is a cardiac glycoside and with the cardiac glycoside it do works as the positive inotropic and as this is the positive inotropic agent it can cause potassium it can cause that means when we are giving loop diuretics to the patient it will cause a loss of potassium that means patient may have the risk for hypokalemia and if we are giving digoxin to the patient with this hypokalemia the patient will have digoxin toxicity so to prevent this digoxin toxicity if we are providing loop diuretics to the patient then we do provide the potassium chloride to the patient so that the patient will not have this digoxin toxicity so for this reason potassium chloride is also given to the patient and the symptoms that are and the complaints that are present here that is nausea blurred vision headache weakness and confusion these are the symptoms of digoxin toxicity and with this first degree av block is also a symptom of digoxin toxicity which is present if the digoxin has been leased to the um, you can say to the toxic level so it can cause the pr interval to increase than more than 200 milliseconds and that condition is known as first degree atrioventricular block so moving to the options option number first is pulmonary edema so pulmonary edema is not present when they are we are giving furosemide to the patient so for this reason this option is incorrect one next one says digoxin toxicity which is the potential answer of our this question the next one says hyperkalemia so the, uh, this potassium if patient is having furosemide so patient will have the hypokalemia and will not have the hyperkalemia 
with this these signs do not indicate the signs of hyperkalemia so for this reason this option is incorrect the next one says fluid deficit so giving prosomite to the patient will cause fluid deficit but fluid deficit do not uh, causes the side effects like nausea, blood vision, headache, weakness, and confusion. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. So our right answer will be uh, option number B, that is digoxin toxicity. Moving to the next question. Next question says, after an open heart surgery, a client is, ex is experiencing excessive calcium excretion. Okay, the client is experiencing what experiencing excessive calcium excretion and now during the post-operative period to help prevent complication associated with excessive calcium excretion which measure should the nurse prioritize so because the patient has been undergone open heart surgery so after this open heart surgery usually the patient do uh, have the bed rest and at the bed rest condition the patient is having calcium excretion it is increased calcium excretion increased calcium excretion is due to the increased activity of the bone deforming cells increased activity of the osteoclast and these osteoclasts do arise do increase its activity because patients are in bed rest condition okay so now we have to prevent the complication to the patient and the uh, complication that can arise due to increased calcium excretion is formation of calcium stone because the calcium is getting excreted out from the kidney. So it can precipitate into the form of the stone and can cause this uh, complication of calcium stone to the patient. Now we have to prevent this complication. So to prevent this complication, what we have to do to prevent this complication, we have to minimize the calcium intake because if the, we increase the calcium intake, so it will cause more and more calcium excretion and if there is already increase in the activities of osteoclast already calcium is increasing and more calcium is increasing so it will lead to the formation of the calcium stone other than this what we can do we can provide the acidic ash diet to the patient acidic ash diet do help in the dissolving of the calcium stones so we do provide this uh, acidic ash diet to the patient so that these calcium stone will dissolve and will be excreted out in the urine with this we can provide uh, active and passive exercises to the patient in the bedridden status we can provide active and passive exercises to the patient so that there is decrease in the over activity of the osteoclast and due to which there will be okay due to which there will be decrease in the activity of the osteoclast and there will be decrease in the loss of calcium decrease loss of calcium okay so we have uh, i will again write that we will provide the acidic ash diet first thing we will provide the uh, active and passive exercises active and passive that exercises which the patient can perform in the bedridden status okay with this we should provide the moderate calcium so that there is the no further excretion of calcium from the kidneys and the workload on the kidneys will be decreased regarding the exc excretion of the calcium. The next thing that we should provide, we should provide the high fluid intake. Why high fluid intake? Actually, it should be adequate fluid intake because the adequate fluid intake will cause the calcium excretion from the body. So we will provide the adequate fluid intake to the patient so that the calcium can be excreted okay so moving to the options available that which option should we should use for this patient option number first is encourage alkaline ash diet so we should encourage the calcium stones to dissolve in the acidic ash diet and not in the alkaline ash diet so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says Increase the intake of calcium-rich dairy products. So, increasing 
the intake will increase the excretion. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. The next one says promote regular bowel movements to prevent constipation. So we can promote bowel movements to prevent constipation, but that will not reduce the risk for having kidney stones and calcium kidney stones. So for this reason, this option is incorrect. The next one says ensure an adequate fluid intake. So yes, providing an adequate fluid intake will decrease the risk for having the calcium stones to the patient. So option number D goes right with the question number 47. Moving to the next question. Next question says, okay, this is about the chart uh, which describes the alkali diet and neutral diet and the acid ash diets. So this red one are the acid ash diets. Moving to the next question. The next question says, Pharmacologic therapy for diabetic female diagnosed with stage 2 hypertension initially treated with furosemide and ramipril. Okay, so we are having a patient who is having the hypertension and it is stage 2 hypertension. Now the patient has been treated with the furosemide. So, and ramipril and now includes metiprolol. What is the expected therapeutic effect of this uh, addition? So, furosemide is a loop diuretic which increases the excretion of water and electrolytes. Ramipril is the ACE inhibitor which inhibits the ACE enzymes which decreases the uh, conversion of angiotensin first into the angiotensin 2 and thus in decreases the RAS system and now includes metiprolol. So, now, now the patient is is having metoprolol. Metoprolol is a beta blocker agent and because it is a beta blocker agent, it causes what? It decreases the effect of catecholamines on the beta cells of the heart and as the result, it decreases the cardiac workload and when it decreases the cardiac workload, the patient will decrease the autoconsumption to the the to the heart the o2 consumption to the heart will be also decreased due to which there is decrease in the heart rate also and the mean bp is decreased and so that means it will decrease the blood pressure of the patient with this it do not have any effect no effect on blood vessels it do not have any effect on the blood vessels so this is how this beta blocker do work Moving to the options available for this question. So, option number first says increased urinary output. Second says elevated fatigue. Third one says improved blood glucose level. And fourth one says reduced heart rate. So, we are providing this metoprolol to the patient to decrease the heart rate of the patient so that the patient blood pressure should be reduced. So, this is the therapeutic effect of this drug and rest all are not the desired therapeutic effect for this drug. So, question number 48 goes right with the option number D. Next question. It says the nurse is educating a client with hypertension on a proper administration of the atenolol. What instruction should the nurse provide to the client? So we should uh, specify that option that indicates about the special nursing management with this atenolol. So atenolol uh, is given to the patient and this uh, the option number first is atenolol is a beta blocker. So the option number first is follow a sodium restricted diet of 2 grams per day. So a patient who is in the control of the hypertension or who is controlling his hypertension should decrease the uh, this uh, sodium rich diet in his diet but this is not directly related to the atenolol so for this reason this option is incorrect one next one says avoid abruptly discontinuing the medication Okay, so those patients who do take this atenolol these patients should should get information that if these atenolol or bitter blockers are uh, you can say discontinued immediately so this discontinuation may cause rebound hypertension to the patient and this rebound hypertension will increase the bp of the patient and increase blood pressure is now more difficult to control so we should never never discontinue the medication without the tapering of the medication so for this reason this option 
is correct one because we have to provide this information to the patient. The next one says monitor blood pressure annually. So when we are providing this medication to the patient, so the blood pressure should be checked regularly and not annually. Annually. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. The next one says sees the medication is experiencing severe headaches. So atenolol uh, do not cause severe headaches. However, if the patient to have any complaints, he has to uh, he has to confirm and check it with his uh, primary healthcare worker and do not seize the medication without any prescription. So for this reason, this option is incorrect. One question number forty nine goes right with the option number B. Next question, it says, what intervention would be the most effective in assisting a client with hypertension in maintaining a exercise program? So already the <laughs> Sorry, already the patient is maintaining, uh, okay, taking exercise program and we have to maintain the exercise program. So, which one should be correct? Option number first is customizing the exercise program according to the client individual needs and abilities. So, whenever we are providing any exercise program to the patient, we should customize it according to the patient's need and patient's ability to perform the exercise and those exercises that will be beneficial to the patient. So option number first is correct one. Next one says providing the client with a written exercise program for easy reference. So written exercise program is not much good, but uh, you can say direct observation of the exercise in the exercise program is furthermore easy for the patient. So written exercise program is not a good idea. The next one says offering reassurance and encouragement to the client. So the patient has been already taking the exercise program and we do have to maintain it. So we do not have to reassure and encourage patient here and patient is already confident. We do not have to instill the confidence to the patient. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. The next one says explaining the exercise program to the client's spouse involving them in the process so because the patient can perform these exercises we do not need to include the spouse in the program so the most effective in the maintaining this exercise program will be customizing it according to the patient so question number 50 goes right with the option number first moving to the next question the next question says after mitral valve replacement surgery the clients reports a clicking noise originating from the chest incision and there is concern about incision appearing to enlarge the nurse's response should be based on understanding that the client might be encountering which of the following issues so if a patient is complaining about the clicking noise from the uh, chest incision and concerning about incision appearing to enlarge. What should be the nurse's response? So first option says perceived change in the body image causing anxiety. Next is impaired blood flow around the uh, incision site. Insufficient understanding of the post-operative recovery process. Next one says anxiety due to changes in the overall health status. So if the patient has undergone this surgery, uh, wall replacement surgery, so the overall health status has not been changed. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. The next one says insufficient understanding of the post-operative recovery process. So if there is a presence of the clicking noise. So this clicking noise is a normal finding after the wall replacement surgery. And this does not, uh, you can say, uh, identify the uh, recovery process because it is present overall. It is present. It can be present anytime and every time. So insufficient understanding is the incorrect option for this question. The next one says impaired blood flow around the incision site. So the incision site do have the proper blood flow. That's why the patient's valves are uh, closing properly and producing the clicking sound. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. The option number first is perceived change in body image causing anxiety. So yes, because the patient's body image has been changed and now the artificial valves has been uh, replaced to the patient's body. So this is causing anxiety to the patient and and patient is asking for this type of uh, information. So for this reason, option number first will be the correct one. Moving to the next question. The next question says, which pharmacological effect is associated with propanolol hydrochloride administration? So we know that propanolol hydrochloride, sorry, propanolol hydrochloride is a beta blocker. 
So propanolol hydrochloride is a beta blocker agent and it blocks the beta receptors on the heart and by blocking the beta receptors on the heart it causes the uh, blocking of the catecholamine activity to the heart catecholamine activity to the heart and due to decrease in the catecholamine activity to the heart it causes the decrease in the heart rate and it causes the uh, decrease in the blood pressure to the patient okay so option number first says option number first says sorry option number is happening option number first says blocks beta adrenergic stimulation and thus causes decreased heart rate myocardial contractility and conduction so yes because it blocks the beta adrenergic stimulation it causes decrease in the heart rate myocardial contractility and conduction this option is correct one the next option says increases norepinephrine secretion and decreases blood pressure and heart rate so it will not cause increase in the norepinephrine secretion so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next is it is a potent arterial and venous vasodilator that reduces peripheral vascular resistance. So, this beta blocker do not have any uh, major effect on the blood vessel. So, for this reason, this option is incorrect one. The next one says is an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. So, this is not an ACE inhibitor. So, for this reason, this option is incorrect one. So, option number first is the correct one for this question. Moving to the next question. The next one says, how is the best way to feed a 10-month-old with a hip cast? So, if a baby with a 10-month uh, of the age is having hip cast, what would be the appropriate uh, method to feed? So, first one says, get a unique feeding table. Second one says, put the baby flat. Next one says, have a one person hold and another feed. And next one says, elevate the baby's head and rest on the lower body on a cushion. Elevate the baby's head. And rest the lower body on a cushion. Okay. So, if a baby is having a hip cast. So, we can make the baby sit. And we can make the baby sit with this. We can provide a proper table to the patient. On which he can put his foot. And can enjoy it by himself. Or by someone other. The, um, the one assistance can be provided so because uh, this at the uh, because the baby of this age do like to have the meal by himself so we can provide the patient a table and can provide and can uh, provide a space to enjoy the meal moving to the option so first says get a unique feeding table so yes this option is right we can provide a unique feeding table to the baby of 10 month age next is put a baby flat so putting a baby flat will causes the increased risk for the aspiration so for this reason this uh, option should be avoided this option is incorrect one the next one says have a one person hold and another feed so we do not need to we do not need two person here to hold uh, the feed and provide this so this is an incorrect option next one says elevate the baby's head and rest the lower body on a cushion so this option is also incorrect we can provide a feeding table to the baby so can he can uh, so that he can take his meal properly. So moving to the next question. The next one says after a vasectomy, why is it safe? When is it safe for a man to engage in a unprotected sex? So if we talk about vasectomy, so vasectomy is the uh, you can say permanent sterilization method. And in permanent sterilization method, there is the ligation of the vas deferens, permanent sterilization method and the vas deferens are still uh, are uh, ligated so permanent sterilization method if we talk about the unprotected cells so just after having this procedure the person cannot go with the unprotected cells just after no why because there can be presence of the sperm in the already present uh, you can say secretions or, or the semen in the uh, reproductive tract so when can patient have uh, unprotected sex so after the 10 to 20 ejaculations the person may have the unprotected sex, sex and can decrease the presence of the sperm with this uh, what other the patient the patient uh, can perform usual activities and with this if we talk about when the patient can take this permanent sterilization so after uh, after 
verification of the sperm sterilization so the sperm sterilization uh, is if the semen is absent in the sperm or you can say if there is no sperm in the semen this should be verified first then the patient can have this unprotected sex and without this this cannot be done okay so semen should be checked once a month and if it is having no sperm so the patient can go with the unprotected sex and two consecutive semens uh, if shows no sperm that means the patient is sterile now okay so moving to the options available first one says upon verification of sperm sterilization so yes upon verification we can uh, the patient can move with this uh, you can say unprotected sex the next one says after 5 to 10 ejaculation so no 10 after 10 to 20 ejaculation so for this reason this option is incorrect one next one says right away due to instant sterilization no never right away after the sterilization and next one says when there is no more scrotal pain and swelling so there is no scrotal pain and swelling after this procedure if it is present it shows the infection so for this reason this option is incorrect one so option number first is the correct one for this question the next one says client with persistent vomiting risk metabolic at alkalosis so the patient is having vomiting persistent vomiting and is having the risk for metabolic alkalosis what should the nurse assist for so what should be the findings that the nurse should assist for this client so option number first says now irritability so yes with the metabolic array, uh, alkalosis there is presence of the irritability option second says hyperventilation so hyperventilation is present if there is the present of the acidosis and more superiorly the respiratory acidosis so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says diarrhea so diarrhea uh, if the patient is having diarrhea so the patient may have metabolic acidosis and if the patient is having metabolic alkalosis that doesn't mean the patient will have the diarrhea also the next one says cosmal breathing so cosmal breathing is present in the condition of acidosis and not in the condition of alkalosis so for this reason this option is incorrect so the patient will have the symptoms of irritability moving to the question number 56 number 56 says is which symptom shows a client moving to an advanced shock stage so uh, advanced shock stage if we talk about the shock so shock is the condition in which there is a decrease in the o2 delivery to the body's tissues and cells decrease o2 delivery and increase in the and because the demand is not fulfilling so the patient so there is the o2 deprivation and due to this o2 deprivation in the body cells and tissues the patient will have the condition of this shock with the condition of this shock the patient shows various uh, you can say sign and symptoms that shows that patient is having different organs with o2 deprivation okay so these are some conditions if we talk about the stages so there are four stages of the shock four stages are the first one is the initial stage the second one is the uh, compensatory stage the third one is the compensatory third one is the progressive and fourth one is the refractory or you can say critical so because the first one is the initial stage so in this condition the body moves from the aerobic respiration to the anaerobic respiration and there is the generation of the lactic acid which causes the uh, elevation in the lactic acid levels Second one is the compensatory stage in which there is the SNS system is stimulated and due to stimulation is the SNS symptom. There are symptoms of SNS stimulation like increase in the heart rate with this decrease in the urine output. output. Okay then comes the progressive stage if still the cause and the and the uh, shock has not been managed then the patient moves to the progressive stage in which there is the uh, you can say condition of the respiratory acidosis is present with this acidosis the patient may have metabolic acidosis so respiratory or metabolic acidosis with this there is presence of electrolyte imbalances with this there is presence of decrease O2 to vital organs. 
and due to the decrease O2 to the vital organs, patient shows symptoms and patient may show pallor, patient may show hypotension. With this, there is, okay. So the patient may show hypotension, patient may show hypotension. This was, we were talking about the progressive stage. First one was initial and then was compensatory. Then this progressive and then comes the refractory. So in the refractive stage, there is irreversible damage, irreversible cell damage. And with this irreversible cell damage, the patient may lose his consciousness. And if we talk about the advanced shock stage, so this one, the progressive stage that shows the shock has been advancing. This progressive stage is that uh, stage that shows that patient is advancing to the refractory stage. So we have to find out that symptom that shows the progressive stage and tells that patient is moving to the advanced stage. So progression is from the compensation, it is progressing to the advanced stage or the refractory stage or you can say critical stage. Okay, moving to the option. So first one says speaking unclearly. So speaking unclearly can be present with the compensatory stage or the initial stage. So for this option is incorrect one. Next one says being confused. So if the patient is being confused that means there is decrease o2 uh, supply to the brain so this tells that patient is having this progressive stage and that is moving to the advanced stage the next one says losing consciousness so if the patient has already loosened his consciousness that shows that patient has been reached to the advanced stage so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next is feeling restless. So restlessness can be seen in the initial phase of the shock. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. So the correct option will be option number B for the question number 56. Moving to the next question. The next question says, what symptom shows head lies or pediculosis capitis in the student? So head lies or pediculosis capitis can be present in the uh, students and is usually present with the students. And these head lies do feed on the blood of the scalp blood from scalp and with this blood from the scalp there is the presence of the itching which is the most common symptoms with this itching the patient may shows the visible lies on the scalp with this there are the nits on the hair shaft and there can be presence of sores on the scalp due to consistent itching Okay, so these are some symptoms. Moving to the option available. If you check about the most common symptoms, so itching is the most common symptom for this pediculosis capitis. So option first is itchy scalp. So yes, itchy scalp is present. The next one says flaky skin area. So flakes are not formed with the pediculosis capitis. The next one says blisters on scalp. So blisters are not present, but sores can be present due to consistent itching. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. The next one says bald patches. So baldness do not uh, arrive with this uh, pediculosis capitis. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. But Itchy scalp is the most common symptom that is present with the pediculosis capitis and just all symptoms do not present with the pediculosis capitis. Moving to the question number 58. Question number 58 says a client with radiation therapy has mucositis. What should be the include in the care plan? So patient is having inflammation of the oral mucosa. If the patient is having oral mucosa, what should be the care provided? So option first is providing hot tea. So providing a hot tea will cause the irritation to the inflamed mucosa, which will increase the discomfort of the patient. So we should provide the normal temperature of the food to the patient and not the hot tea. The next one says using diluted Hydrogen peroxide on ulcers. So hydroxin, uh, sorry, hydrogen peroxide should not be used on the ulcers. It can cause 
that the fish it can cause the uh, you can say irritation to the blisters and only medicated mouthwashes should be used it has been prescribed by the doctor so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says promoting teeth flossing so because the patient do have the presence of inflammation so if there is the presence of any food debris in the oral cavity so it will cause and it will lead to the infection process and will cause the infection in the oral mucosa so we have to make it clear that patient has to clean his oral cavity properly and in the cleanliness of the oral cavity it is also be with the uh, cleaning of the teeth also so hygiene is the first most and most important measure hygiene of oral cavity is the most important measure that should be taken care of so for this reason this option is correct one the next one says increasing mouth care frequency so increasing mouth care frequency and if the patient is increasing the frequency in doing the vigorous oral care will cause the more irritation so the frequency should not be increased but should be very uh, you can say efficient and should be very gentle so for this reason this option is incorrect one and question, option number uh, c is the correct one moving to the next question that is question number 59 so question number 59 says during an assessment a nurse is evaluating a patient with fractured right leg to ensure the correct technique of crutch use so patient is having fractured right leg and he is using the crutches which of the polemic remarks from the patient suggest proper crutch uses? So, which uh, which option says that patient is using the proper crutches? Okay. Option number first is I have added padding to my crutches tops to make leaning on them more comfortable. So, the crutches of the tops should and do already have the padding. And if the patient has you day uses more padding so that he can make a uh, lean on it. So leaning on the crutches can cause the axillary nerve palsy. So and we always do teach the patient that never lean over the crutches or pads of the crutches. Never lean over the crutches pad. So for this reason, this option is incorrect. And this is an improper technique. The next one says, when I move forward, I always step my left leg before swinging forward on my crutches. So here the patient says that he keeps left leg before during swinging forward. So if the patient has to follow the swinging gait, so always the both crutches should be capped first. And then, already, then only the patient has to swing with his feet and not the uh, left leg should be uh, placed before. So for this reason, this swinging technique is incorrect one. Option number C says, when walking, I notice that most of the pressure is on the palms of my hand. So, this is a correct option. This is a correct technique that during walking, the pressure should be on the palms of the hand. So, this option is the right one. The next is, after using my crutches, my arms tend to tingle. So, if patient is using crutches and his arm is tingling, that means there is improper uses of these crutches. And there is presence of the nerve palsy. I guess I need to work on my arm strength. The patient should not have to need to on the arm strength, but has to work on the proper crutch uses. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. The correct one is that the correct technique is when, when walking, the patient is feeling pressure on the palms of the hand. Moving to the next question, that is question number 16. It says, the nurse is providing education to a client who is receiving warfarin sodium. Which of the following statement is accurate? So, we are having a patient who is having this warfarin sodium. So, warfarin sodium is an anticoagulant agent and it works with the uh, uh, blocking or you can say antagonizing the vitamin K function and it blocks the synthesis of uh, clotting factor 2, 7, 9, 10 which works and do synthesize uh, with the vitamin K as a cofactor. 
so it blocks it okay so which of the following statement is truth okay so first one says protamine sulfate is used to reverse the effect of warfarin sodium so no vitamin k is used to reverse the effect of warfarin sodium protamine sulfate is used with the as a uh, you can say antagonist or as the um, antidote of the heparin so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says international normalized ratio is used to assess effectiveness so international normalized ratio is the normalized ratio used with the prothrombin time and because this uh, prothrombin time to do changes with the use of this uh, you can say this uh, warfarin sodium so pt uh, that is prothrombin time and this inr is used to check the effectiveness of this warfarin sodium so this option is correct one the next one says warfarin sodium will facilitate clotting of the blood so it will decrease the clotting of the blood and not facilitate it so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next is option number d partial thromboplastin time values determine the doses of warfarin sodium so partial thromboplastin time is uses with the clotting sequence of the heparin therapy and not in the warfarin therapy so for this reason this option is incorrect of a question number 60 goes right with the option number b what's crucial to show a five-year-old while experiencing cardiac catheterization so if a patient who is having a uh, cardiac catheterization and who is about to have cardiac catheterization and we have to explain it to the patient and the age is five year old that what should we do so the, uh, if we talk about the milestones of a uh, patient of five years old so these patients or these age group do have the interest in new things but these interests do not sustain for a very long time and they do have a uh, utmost trust in their parents rather than the similar age group okay so uh, if we talk about that if we are explaining this cardiac catheterization to the patient what should be uh, crucial to show to these patients so first one says guardians so if the patient is uh, with the guardians so guardian should be the best thing that should be present during explaining cardiac catheterization because the baby should have the patient should have the utmost trust to the parents rather than other any individual so this option can be correct one so second one says similar aged peers in the procedure so the uh, uh, child of five years old will not be able to understand each and everything by mere seeing the similar age groups a for this procedure so for this reason this option is incorrect the next one says module of a heart so module of a heart can uh, create the interest to the patient but the module of the heart will not be for the long time and the patient will lose its interest in the model of the heart so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says inserted tube so inserted tube may frighten the patient or may can create the interest but again that is not for a long time so for this reason this option is incorrect one and our question number 61 goes right with the Option number A, that is guardians. Moving to the next question. The next one says, the nurse is teaching the spouse of a client who underwent an incision and drainage procedure for an abscess. Okay. So, there is presence of an abscess about wound care at home and he has to perform the wound care at home. The nurse should advise the spouse too. So, what should be the advice? So, when we talk about the abscess care and when we talk about the uh, care of the wound, so always we have to uh, clear the less contaminated area to the more contaminated area less contaminated to the more contaminated area and if the patient is having uh, this wound and we are talking about uh, cleaning of incision and drainage these two things okay incision and drainage has undergone and now the patient has to perform the uh, abscess care okay moving to the uh, okay moving to the options available so first one says do cleaning from drainage side to the incision side so if the patient has undergone incision and drainage so because there are two sides if we talk about this less contaminated and more contaminated area this is for the 
same site if we are cleaning at the same site so always we have to clean the less contamination and then we can go to the more contaminate of the same site that means of the same site we do not move from two other sites okay if we are having two sites to clean so we will clean two sites differently and we will not impose the same mechanism to the two different sites and we will not uh, you can say clean two uh, different sites uh, with one or you can say uh, within one procedure so option one says do cleaning from drainage sites towards the incision site so this one is incorrect one this is for only the abscess one side uh, next one says consider cleaning both sides separately so yes we should consider cleaning both sides separately because there are two sides the incision side and the drainage side the next one says cleaning is starting from the incision side and moving towards the uh, drainage side again this is an incorrect option and the next one says to cleaning the incision and drainage side at the same time so we do not have to clean both the sites at the same time it will increase the risk for the infection so for this reason we will uh, work as it will decrease the risk for infection and considering both sides uh, separately will decrease the risk for the infection to the patient moving to the question number 63 Question number 63 says, the surgical unit's nursing team notes that in pharmacy, midazolam and vancomycin vials looks like uh, similar. Risking confusion to ensure safety, what action should they take? So, uh, the nursing team has noticed that midazolam and vancomycin are same, uh, are looking like same drug. That is vancomycin and this one is midazolam. Both are looking like a same drug. These drugs are known as look alike drug. That means they both look like same. Okay. So, what should be the action that should the, the nurse take? So, first one says rearrange medications during peak of hours. So, uh, during off peak hours, the nurse's responsibility is to provide the nursing care and, to the patient. And with the nursing care, the nurse has to uh, pro provide the ward management and should have the ward management skills and should take the uh, you can say control and should take the management of the ward inventory if we are talking about the pharmacy so rearranging medication at the pharmacy is not the nurse's responsibility so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says work with the pharmacy to find a mutual storage solution so if the nurse has find out the you can say find out the odd findings so nurse has to communicate it and with the communication only what will happen with the communication only what will happen the nurse will be able to educate and will able to tell individuals or the pharmacy staff and the nursing staff that there is any odd finding is present and we have to work on the solution so for this reason this option is correct one the next one says let pharmacy staff handle the drug repositioning so uh, before without telling to the pharmacy staff that uh, nurse should the this drug should be handled properly so this the pharmacy staff will not be able to do that so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says ask the pharmacy to separate the drugs so yes the nurse has to ask the pharmacy to separate the drugs the next one says inform all staff of concerns and solutions so yes the nurse again has to communicate this finding to all staff uh, and so that he can get the solution and so that every staff would be aware of that finding and will reduce the risk for the medication error reduce risk for the medication error so this option is also correct one so our question number 63 goes right with the option number b d and e moving to the question number 64 Okay, here are some examples for the look alike and uh, sound alike drugs. These are sound alike drugs like dizapam, diltizam, nifedipine, nicardipine, fen pentobarbital, and phenobarbital, dopamine, dobutamine, and propanolol and propafol. These are some uh, sound alike drugs that has been mentioned here. Moving to the question number, okay, before moving to the next question, I am very glad to announce that we are conducting a contest question for you and you have to answer this question in the comment section and the one who will answer most of the questions correctively in the comment section will get a chance to win the exclusive $1,000 directly into his bank account or he may get a chance to enroll in one of our Premier courses and free. So all you have to do is to comment down in the comment box. Moving to the question number 64, 
So here question number 64 says, three days post pyloromyotomy, a six month old is placed in an infant seat. What's the nurse's best action? Okay. So a patient has gone, a baby has gone pyloromyotomy. So what is pyloromyotomy? So if we talk about the, uh, there is a condition, this is about the pyloric stenosis. So if there is a presence of the pyloric stenosis, so pyloric stenosis is the circular muscle hypertrophy in the pyloric sphincter. And if this is present, the patient has to undergo the pyloric myotomy, that is removal of that muscle, that has been hypertrophic and the removal of this muscle will decrease the patient's symptoms. And these symptoms uh, are usually the uh, projectile vomiting. With this, there is decrease or you can say delay in the gastric amputing, increase in the nausea and vomiting. So, there is muscular circular muscle hypertrophy and for this, the procedure that has undergone is the pyloromyotomy. Moving to the uh, question, the question says, that the baby has been placed in the infant seat. So if the patient has gone pyloromyotomy, so it is okay to, to have a seat on a infant seat because it will increase the gastric amputing. And if there is decrease in the gastric amputing because the patient has undergone the, uh, you can say myotomy or uh, pyloric myotomy. So there are risk for having the regurgitation of the food, regurgitation from the stomach and from the pyloromyotomy pyloric sphincter. So at that condition, we have to uh, increase the gastric amping and to increase the gastric amping, we have to provide the upright position to the patient and upright position can be provided by providing the seat to the baby. Okay, moving to the options. Option number first is discuss pacifier restriction. So after having this pylori myotomy, there is no any restrictions on the pacifier. So for this reason, this option is incorrect. Well, the next one says shift the baby to the left side. So shifting the baby to the left side is not a very good option. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. The next one says affirm the proper infant positioning. So if the patient is or the baby is in infant seat, so this is a, a proper infant positioning. So now should affirm it to the parents the next next one says advise returning the baby to the crib so returning the baby to the crib will decrease the gastric amping and will cause the regurgitation of the uh, gastric content so for this reason this option is also incorrect so our question number 64 goes right with the option number c Moving to the question number 65. Question number 65 says, while assessing a preemie gravid client with eight weeks gestation, the nurse notes a purplish color to the vagina and cervix. The nurse documents this finding as which of the following. So there are certain signs that are present with the patient or with the female who is being pregnant and is undergoing the pregnancy. So some of these signs are, this Hagar sign, which is the softening and compressibility of the lower uterine segment, usually found in the six weeks. Chadwick sign, volume discoloration of the cervical, vagina, and vulvar mucosa due to increase in the blood supply to that area and increase in the venous supply also due to increase in the blood demand at that area. So, this one is the Chadwick sign. So, moving to the option here, it has been as a purplish discoloration of vagina and cervix. And after these eight weeks, that is at the eight weeks, so this one is the Chadwick sign. So, all other options are incorrect and our option that is Chadwick sign is the correct. Moving to the question number 66. Question number 66 is, a 40-year-old woman admitted for mastectomy seems anxious and has many questions. The best response by the nurse is to. So, the patient has uh, admitted for mastectomy, that is removal of the breast uh, tissues. So, the breast tissues are removal in the condition of the, ca if the patient is having cancerous condition. So, Patient is anxious and has many questions. So, what should the nurse do? So, option number first is inform the client based on her capacity to understand. So, yes, the nurse has to inform the queries that has been asked by the client based on the capacity uh, that at which the patient can understand. So, this one is a correct option. The next one says address her questions during the recovery phase. So, when the patient has already in the recovery phase has already undergone the surgery. So, uh, after that, we should not uh, educate 
about that means we should educate the patient about the questions before the surgery that is in the pre surgery or you can say pre operative phases not in the recovery phases because at that phase patient has undergone the procedure and is not in the proper you can say concentration to concentrate on the questions as well as these questions may be or these anxiety may be related to the uh, to those questions or to those issues that may be present during the surgical period or pre-surgical period so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says answer her queries when her anxiety reduces so patient is anxious because he is having some queries so we should answer the queries then only the anxiety will reduce the anxiety will not reduce without telling anything to the patient it will increase the anxiety to the patient so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says advice to consult her doctor for her concerns so we should advise her to consult her doctor but first we have to uh, inform the client about his queries and if she is not satisfied with those uh, answer of the queries then we can advise her to consult the doctor so this can be done but in the second priority but in the first priority we have to inform the client's queries uh, on the ability of his or her understanding so for this reason this option is again incorrect so over question number 66 goes right with the option number a goes with the question number 67 so question number 67 says while assessing a multigravida client with eight weeks of gestation, the nurse notes a softening of the vaginal portion of the cervix. The nurse notes this finding as which of the following. So, uh, this question again talks about the signs of the pregnancy. So, uh, talking about the signs of the pregnancy, he guards it. We have discussed the softening and compressibility of lower uterine segment. Chadwick sign, polar discoloration, which we have seen in the previous question. Ladin signs is softening at the center of uterus where it connects to the cervix. Next one is OC under sign, that is pulsation at the vaginal fornices. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, next one is Goodell sign is the softening of the cervix. So the question has been asking about the Goodell sign uh, that is the softening of the cervix that is the softening of the vaginal portion of the cervix. So the correct answer will be Goodell sign. Talking about the melasma. So melasma is the uh, you can say pigmentation uh, that can be seen due to increased activity of the melanin and production. So this is not the Goodell sign. This is not the softening of the vaginal portion. Next one is also under sign, which is again not the we have seen. This is the pulsation at the vaginal fornices, not the softening of the vagina. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. And Chadwick sign is a polar discoloration. So again, this option is incorrect one. So our question number sixty-seven goes right with the option number A. Moving to the next question. This is a picture for the melasma. The next one says, a mother is upset and wants to take her dying child home uh, from hospital. What's the nurse's best response? Okay, so mother is upset because his child is dying. And what should be the nurse's best response? So option number first says, it's tough, but not the right choice for the kid. So here the nurse is using the non-therapeutic technique and non-therapeutic technique is being judgmental. A nurse should never be judgmental and the mother do know what is the right choice for his ch child, for his kid, oh, sorry, her kid. So the nurse should not be judgmental and this statement shows that nurse is going judgmental that she is judging the right choice of the kid. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. Next one says, understanding your feelings, the medicine can end. So, in this option, the uh, nurse is uh, providing false reassurance to the patient because it has already been mentioned that the child is dying. So, false assurance that the medicine can aid the patient with this understanding your feelings. So, when the nurse has not undergone the same situation the nurse can never understand the situation of and the feelings of the mother so for this reason providing false assurance to the uh, patient and the family is a, a non-therapeutic technique so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says i must inform your doctor before that so yes the nurse has to inform the doctor <coughs> sorry 
the nurse has to inform the doctor uh, before leaving of the uh, patient and his mother uh, okay this can be the right option but moving to the next one the next one says what's the reason to leave now so in this option the nurse is asking an open ended question and in this open ended question the nurse is asking the reason for leaving of the mother with his with her child so this open ended question can aid in describing the feelings and emotions of the mother and then uh, the emotions and the you know, uh, patient's mother can feel relaxed so providing or asking an open ended question is a good therapeutic technique that is it is a therapeutic technique and if we compare these two so the first in the first one the nurse can use this therapeutic technique of communication and this can be asked as an open ended question and in the second priority the nurse should inform the doctor before that but if we have to choose about the correct one so our option number d will be the first priority will be the correct one so for this reason our option number a b and c are incorrect one moving to the question number 69 so question number 69 says a mother doubts her infant's auditory ability what guidance should the nurse provide okay so here the nurse uh, okay so here the patient oh, sorry uh, the mother the mother is doubting about the infant's auditory ability and the nurse has to provide the guidance okay so a uh, infant to a fetus can uh, initiate uh, starting at the 18 weeks of gestation and with the starting of the auditory ability at the 18 uh, weeks of gestation the Uh, the uh, you can say the neonate can hear uh, fully as an adult at the time of delivery can hear fully as an adult at the time of delivery okay with this when there is the uh, then when the baby has been delivered at that condition the baby to react to the loud sounds and uh, shows the startle effect which shows that the baby has proper hearing and with this he turns his head uh, towards the sound which also shows that the baby do have the proper hearing ability and with this uh, the baby do smiles with the voice smiles with voice okay so these are some uh, you can say it, uh, these are some normal uh, developmental milestones that can be seen with the baby and that shows that the baby do have a proper auditory ability but the the but the mother is doubting the ability so what should the nurses intervention so first one says clapping 40 cm away can help cause the baby's hearing so clapping test is not a uh, it is a sophisticated test and it is not a you can so appropriate test for measuring or for uh, you can say testing the baby's hearing and if it is if still it is performed so the clapping should not be more than 30 cm away it should be less than 30 cm away for the baby so for this reason this option is incorrect one next one says many areas require hearing exams for baby so yes many areas to require hearing exams for baby this option can be correct one the next one says it's rare for newborn to have hearing problem so it's rare yes it's rare for newborn to have hearing problem but if the mother is doubting the condition so So the nurse has to take the intervention and to do the assessment without uh, uh, without neglecting the mother's queries. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. Next one says infant's hearing improves after six weeks. So infant's hearing do improve when the ear canal is uh, clean from the amniotic fluid and hearing gets better. As well as the infant do or uh, the fetus do start hearing from the eighteen weeks of gestation and. starts fully as an adult at the time of delivery so for this reason this option is incorrect one so our question number 69 goes right with the option number b moving to the next question the next says the nurse advised a parent on handling sibling arguments how should the parent act to show they understood okay so the nurse has been advised the parents on handling sibling arguments to siblings are fighting and what should be the nurse says uh, okay what should be the parents um, 
act to show that they have understood how to maintain the sibling argument. So first one says cancels lunch due to the argument. The second one says tells them to stop and shake hands. The third one says threatens punishment at home. And fourth one says ignores the argument. So when the two siblings do argument so these two start this is a normal phase of development a normal activity of development with the normal activity of development the siblings argument do do provide a guide to the siblings that their thinking can be specific and their thinking can be different. So this is a normal process. The, uh, the parents should not have to hinder this process and should not have to involve this process until it is only uh, increasing or you can say developing the child's uh, mental activity and child's behavior. So if two siblings are arguing, so this is a normal act and we should not, as a parent, the parents should not uh, hinder this activity. They should provide a chance to their uh, babies so that they can understand the different uh, perspective for the same situation from each other's sides, which is a normal part of uh, this development. Option number first is cancel son. So cancelling lunch is not a good option. Next one says tells them to stop and shake hands. So because this is a normal procedure, so there is no need to stop and shake hands. The next one says threatens punishment. So punishing child for uh, giving his views and understanding other views is not a good option. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. The next one says says ignores the argument so yes the nurse has to ignore the argument of the siblings so that uh, it can be considered as a normal activity so question number 70 goes right with the option number d moving to the question number 71 Question number 71 says, how can a nurse support parents facing their leukemia child's impending death? So here is a child who is who is uh, about to uh, die and he is having the leukemia that is the cancer of the blood forming cells which includes uh, bone marrow and lymphatic system. So the patient is having leukemia that is blood cancer and is about to die. So nurse should support parents how? So first one says losing the 10 year old old is tougher than a younger child loss so losing a child is always always a tougher task it it doesn't depend on the age of the child if it will be a younger if it will be a 10 year if it will be a 50 year old child losing a child is always the tougher for the parents so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says being aware of grim outlook its pre preparation so if the nurse to provide the grim outlook every time it will not uh, it's a preparation it will uh, create a negative environment around the patient as well as around the parents and attendants so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says families feel profound sorrow when a client initially shows improvement but then deteriorates quickly so yes the nurse should support the parents when the families feel profound sorrow when a child initially shows improvement but then deteriorates quickly so at that condition the nurse should support the parents so for this reason this option is correct one the next one says early death often erodes trust in the medical term so if the patient is having a condition which is uh, unable to get cure so they, it will not erode the trust in the medical teams and if the medical team is working efficiently so it will not erode the trust on the medical team so for this reason this option is incorrect one so our question number 71 goes right with the option number c Moving to the question number 72. Question number 72 says, a mother says her four-year-old is pushy during meals. What should the nurse advise? Okay. So, uh, this is a normal part of the uh, development that at the stage of the uh, toddler, that is at the toddler stage, the um, child do feel pushy during the meals and he do not, because he is introducing to the uh, new foods and due to which he, if he do not like the food he is uh, he is uh, fussy during the taking of the meals and 
if the if the child is uh, fussy so the parents can take some actions and these actions can be the okay these action can be that there should be uh, you can say uh, proper meal time there can be proper meal time for the baby and meal can be provided at a specific time according to the timetable so proper meal time with this the, the uh, meal should be like a happy occasion and happy and family occasion so that the uh, baby will not feel fussy during the meals with this always start new feed with the small uh, small bites with this the child let the child serve themselves that the child can serve by himself with this child can have some choices and out of this choices the child can choose the one choice according to choose the one choice accord uh, for the meal okay so these are some uh, mannerism or these are some methods so that we can prevent the fussiness or agitation of the child during the meal time so first one says provide a structured meal routine so you are providing a structured meal routines will uh, cause a, stru a structured meal timing to the baby and it will decrease the agitation so this one is the correct option the next one says allow the child to decide meal time so if the meal time should be allowed by the child so the child can uh, skip the meal time so for this reason this option is incorrect one so next one says give the child finger foods to eat anytime so finger food should not be given to the child at any time why because if the uh, child is taking the finger foods so obviously he will not eat to the table uh, for eating and because his uh, belly is almost full already so he will be fussy during meals so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says don't feed the child if he cries so not feeding the child if he cries is not a good option uh, this will uh, hinder the nutritional balance to the uh, child's body so for this reason this option is incorrect one and our question number 72 goes right with the option number a moving to the question number 73 it says which side uh, effect should a client taking dexamethasone and frisamide report okay so if a client is taking dexamethasone as a frisamide so frisamide is a loop diuretic with this loop diuretic it too causes the h2 excretion and it too causes the excretion of sodium potassium chloride calcium and magnesium and causes a uh, and may risk for the electrolyte imbalances to the body if we talk about the dexamethasone so dexamethasone is a long acting corticosteroid so dexamethasone is a corticosteroid and with its corticosteroidal activity it is potent in selective glucocorticosteroid and it can cause decrease in the potassium levels with this it can cause uh, adrenal insufficiency it can cause hyperglycemia and it is given as a corticosteroid to decrease the inflammation so when both the drugs are giving are given to the patient so the measures as the common side effect that is occurring due to the both drug that is decrease in the potassium level and decrease in the potassium level so due to decrease in the potassium level the patient may have the hypokalemic stage or hypokalemic condition in which the level of potassium decreases less than 3.5 milli equivalent per liter and due to decrease in the potassium level the patient may show symptoms of malaise the patient may show symptoms of muscle weakness with this there may be presence of vomiting paralytic ileus and arrhythmias so these are some symptoms of having hypokalemic stage to the patient so if those two drugs are given to the patient uh, okay so the patient may show uh, sign and symptoms related to this hypokalemic stage so option number first is increase thirst so thirst is not increased during the dexamethasone or frisamide intake so this option is incorrect one the next one says diarrhea so again these drugs do not cause diarrhea to the patient this is the incorrect one the next one says muscle weakness so yes the hypokalemic state causes the muscle weakness to the patient this option is the correct one the next one says excitability so excitability is not caused due to the hypokalemia for this reason 
दिस ऑप्शन इज इन करेक्ट वन सो अब क्वेश्चन नंबर सेवेंटी थ्री गोज राइट विद द ऑप्शन नंबर सी मूविंग टू द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन द नेक्स्ट वन से इज अट ईयर विद रोमैटिक फीवर डिस्प्लेस पॉली आर्थराइटिस कोरिया एंड हार्ट टिश्यू स्वेलिंग वर्स द बेस्ट नर्सिंग एक्शन टू इन्फॉर्म टू पेरेंट्स फॉर द केयर ऑफ दिस चाइल्ड सो द पेशेंट इज हैविंग रोमैटिक फीवर सो रोमैटिक फीवर सो रोमैटिक फीवर इज प्रेजेंट टू द चाइल्ड विच इज शोइंग द सिम्टम्स ऑफ दिस ज्वाइंट inflammation and with this there is presence of chorea so chorea is your uh, sidhem's uh, chorea which do present and this chorea is a lead manifestation of rheumatoid arthr uh, rheumatoid fever this is a lead manifestation of this rheumatoid fever where this uh, the in the chorea the uh, child will have involuntary purposeless movements because this is the chorea so that means the baby, the child will have involuntary and purposeful movements and with this involuntary purposeful movements uh, these uh, chorea do you can say uh is usually present as the temporary stage temporary chorea it means if the patient is having chorea so this chorea will not long last to the patient and will go away gradually okay so the patient is having polyarthritis that is uh, inflammation of the joint so uh, with this polyarthritis this polyarthritis is the inflammation of joint and with this there is no permanent joint deformity is present with this polyarthritis okay with this what's next okay this is only the your inflammatory uh, condition and will not cause any joint deformity and the patient is having heart tissues swelling so heart tissue swelling is also present to the patient and at that condition we have to teach the patient about resting and providing heat applications and with this we have to provide the strict bed rest and joint comfort to the patient so if the patient is having these conditions so we have to inform the uh, parents about option number first is maintain a slightly cool environment so a slight warm environment can be provided to the patient rather than a cool environment so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says inform that chorea is temporary and it will subside after some time so yes chorea is temporary and will subside after some time this is a correct one option the next one says giving aspirin and encourage movement every six daily so uh, aspirin can be given as per the prescription should not be given every six daily and encouraging movements because the patient is in the resting uh, it has been prescribed rest so movement should be uh, encouraged but should be lim limited and should be uh, resting so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says neurological assessments every eight hourly so uh, this chorea and this rheumatic fever do not need any neurological assessment every eight hourly by the parents but the nurse can perform this neurological assessment to the Uh, patient with rheumatic fever so for this reason this option is incorrect one so our question number 74 goes right with the option number b moving to the next question the next one says an unmarried college student at 8 weeks of pregnancy okay is considering an abortion what's the typical procedure for this okay so the pregnancy is of the eight weeks of gestation and the abortion is to be considered okay so moving to the we will move from the last option to the first one in the, this question so moving to the last option is it says cycle based extraction of menstrual ex or menstrual extraction so cycle based extraction or menstrual extraction is the aspiration of the endometrial cavity is the aspiration from the endometrial cavity and it can be done within the 14 days of missed period 14 days of missed periods after the 14 days uh, uh, if the uh, female to miss the period and with this one more condition that the menstrual cycle should be regular the menstrual cycle should be regular and if the females do miss a period so at that condition menstrual extraction can be done within the 14 days of the missed periods but here the gestational age is 8 weeks so the uh, student has passed that uh, 
age so that the menstrual extraction can be done so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says saline induction so saline induction is again a procedure in which the saline is inducted uh, to produce the you can say this uh, to produce the a liver pain and to produce the delivery to the patient but again it cannot be done after the uh, it uh, at the eight weeks of pregnancy so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says dilatation and curettage so dilatation and curettage is usually done to remove the uh, tissues that has been left during any uh, abortion or during any procedure and this is usually done as a procedure of diagnosis and uh, treatment and if the patient if the female has to undergo the termination of pregnancy so this is usually this dilatation and curettage is usually done for the diagnosis and treatment purpose and to check the fibroids or if the patient is having heavy bleeding or if the patient is having a uterine uh, uterine lining any deformity so that can be diagnosed with this dilatation and curettage so for this reason this option is also an incorrect one the next one says dilatation and vacuum extraction so yes dilatation and vacuum extraction can be done up to 12 weeks of pregnancy and up because it can be done up to 12 weeks of pregnancy the nurse can or the nurse can suggest or the patient can undergo or the pregnant female can undergo this dilatation and vacuum extraction in which there is dilatation and manual or electric vacuum extraction can be done from the uterus so for this reason question number 75 goes right with the option number a moving to the next question the next question says Okay, before moving to the next question, we are having a contest question for you and you have to answer this contest question in the comment section. I am the one who will answer the most of the uh, questions of these sessions will get a chance to win an exclusive prize of $1,000 directly into his bank account or he may get a free enrollment in one of our Premier courses. So you have to go down and comment on the comment box about this answer. Okay, moving to the next question. The next question says, during labor at 39 weeks with the fetal heart sound above the umbilicus at midline, what is the fetal position likely to be? So, because the fetal heart sound is heard above the umbilicus and at the midline, so what will be the fetal position? It has been us moving to the fetal positions that can be present. So, if the cephalic presentation is present, so in the cephalic presentation, the head of the baby is uh, downwards from this, uh, downwards from this umbilicus, due to which what can be seen if the patient is having, uh, sorry, if the fetus is having this cephalic presentation, so the fetal heart sound can be assessed beneath the umbilicus. Why? Because the heart is lied beneath the umbilicus and with this, the uh, beneath the umbilicus with this this heart sound can be heard at the left side or can be heard at the right side of the uterus okay so next one is our face presentation so in the face presentation again the heart of the fetus is below the umbilicus of the mother so again the fetal heart sound will be heard below the umbilicus and with below the umbilicus it can be heard at the right side and it can be heard at the left side of the uterus okay next one says uh Bro position, so bro position goes with the same. Next one says breech position. So in the breech position, because the head and face of the uh, baby or the fetus is above the umbilicus and the heart is also above the umbilicus, so due to which the fetal heart sound can be heard above the umbilicus. With this, because it is at the midline, because the heart is heart is at the midline, so heart of the fetus is at the midline, so above the umbilicus, it can be heard at the midline. Okay, so talking about the next one, that is shoulder transverse presentation. So in this condition, again, the heart sound of the fetus can be heard below the umbilicus, and because heart is simply placed to the uh, umbilicus uh, in this. Uh, uh, presentation so below the umbilicus fetal heart sound can be heard with this the uh, fetal heart sound will be at the center 
of the umbilicus okay so we have discussed with all presentations and all uh, fetal heart sounds where can be heard moving to the question it is asking about above the umbilicus and at the midline so over this uh, position that is this presentation which is having the breech presentation this fetus heart sound can be heard above the umbilicus and at the midline so our frank breech position is the correct one the transverse one the face one and the cephalic one rest all three are incorrect one okay moving to the question number 77 so the question number 77 says which patient does the nurse need to discuss immediately with the doctor okay so we have to find out the first most priority care that should be given to the patient and the symptoms of the patient has been enlisted in the options so first one says an individual after knee surgery feeling constipation and stomach pain so the patient has already undergone uh, knee surgery that is patient is post operative okay and is having constipation and stomach pain so because the patient is post operative and patient is in the bedridden status because the patient has undergone the knee surgery so patient can feel constipation due to decrease uh, peristaltic movement so patient may feel constipation and due to this constipation the stomach pain can be present to the patient these patients vital organs are working properly the patient's uh, metabolic needs are working properly the body metabolism is working properly and only what is happening the patient is having constipation and these constipation can be uh, eliminated by providing proper intervention either any uh, you can say any stool softener to the patient or by increasing the peristaltis to the patient by promoting some active and passive exercises to the patient so this can be done but it do not need any immediate requirement okay moving to the next one the next one says a person with recent head injury okay the patient has undergone recent head injury now showing confusion and vomiting symptoms and now the patient is showing confusion and vomiting symptoms so if the patient with head injury is showing confusion and vomiting symptoms it means the patient's intracranial pressure has been increased and intracranial pressure has been increased because there is an intracranial hemorrhage has been occurred so in the during the head injury the intracranial hemorrhage has been occurred which has increased the intracranial pressure and due to increase in the intracranial pressure there is the presence of confusion and vomiting which is a alarming sign the nurse has to take care of this patient and has to intervene very immediately for this patient so this can be the right option but we have to discuss all four options and then we have to compare the best one okay the next one says someone with leg vascular it is asking for extra painkiller before the bandage changes so this patient has undergone the surgery and uh, is now going to change the bandage and is asking for the extra painkiller okay so because this bandaging changing can cause the uh, pain to the patient so providing an extra painkiller is usually done before this uh, changing of the dressing to the patient so again the patient is only having pain but the vital organs are working properly the next one says a person who had surgery and has red marks on their bandage so the person uh, has red marks on their uh, bandage so that means there is hemorrhage there is presence of hemorrhage but after the surgery the presence of a minimal hemorrhage is a, a normal finding and if there is a leakage or soaking of the bandage with this red uh, colored blood so that is an alarming sign but still this should be get checked but still this is not at the first priority the only option which shows that there is something inappropriate with the vital organs is the option number b so the first priority should be this option number b with this the second priority can be this patient who has the red marks on their bandages so for this reason our option number b goes right for the question number 77 moving to the next question the next question says a term multigravida cervix has 5 cm dilated 100 percent effaced and uh, at minus one station 30 minutes ago okay now she is expressing discomfort and a need for bowel movement what's the most appropriate nursing action okay so already the mother is a multigravida mother and the cervix has been dilated to the uh, five centimeters that means the mother is in the first stage of the labor 
okay with this first stage of the liver the cervix has been 100 percent if is now the nurse sorry now the uh, patient has to move from the latent stage of uh, labor to the active stage of labor and already these were the findings 30 minutes ago so there may be the chances that there is the uh, the, uh, the patient has undergone or the mother has undergone to the active stage of labor and because she is showing the bubble movements perhaps this is the pressure of the fetal head Perhaps it is the pressure of the fetal head and the mother is uh, getting it as a, uh, you can say, bowel pressure. Okay, so for this, first the nurse has to do a proper assessment of the uh, patient that how much the cervix has been dilated till now. If the cervix has been dilated and as the uh, multigravida mother, the cervix dilatation is 1.5 cm per hour and already 5 cm of cervix has been dilated. So, there are the chances that the, patient, uh, that the uh, mother has undergone to the active stage. So, nurse has to do a proper assessment for this and then she can move with the for the intervention okay so option first is conduct a new style vaginal examination so yes a new vaginal uh, examination that should be examined uh, examine, uh, with maintaining sterility should be done to the patient the next one says help her go to the bathroom so helping her go to the bathroom without the vaginal examination is an incorrect option the next one says alert the primary healthcare uh, provider about her discomfort so yes the nurse has to alert the primary healthcare provider about discomfort but this should be done after conducting the style examination so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says explain that her sensation is because of fetal heart's pressure so this is an assumption that there is a sensation of fetal heart's pressure and we have to uh, check this assumption either right or wrong then we can tell this to the patient and not without assessing it so for this reason this option is incorrect and we have to assess it very uh, st uh, very clearly with maintaining sterility uh, of the patient so our question number 78 goes right with the option number a Moving to the next question, the next question says, what should a father do first after her uh, child's, after his child's arm gets born? So if the, okay, if the child's of a, if the arm of a child has been go, got born, so at what condition, what should be the first priority action? Okay, moving to the options available to the question, our option number so first says, that notify the healthcare provider and cover with the cloth. So yes, notifying healthcare provider and covering with the cloth is can be a correct option. And this is a, a must needed intervention that we are covering with the a clean cloth and uh, informing the healthcare provider about the burn okay moving to the next one it says use cool water on burn and cover with the cloth. So cool water cannot be okay. So cool water uh can be used by the uh, father or okay, by anybody during a burn condition because if we are using cool water, it will decrease the burn exacerbation due to which we have to do what? We have to clean the water. We have to clean, uh, sorry, not clean. We have to use the cool water on the one. We have to, uh, okay, you can say that we have to cool water with this what other thing we have to do we have to remove the child from the source where the he or she is getting burned with this we have to maintain the abc of the patient airway breathing and circulation and if it is intact then we have to conserve the body heat so to conserve the body heat we have to cover it with the uh, this clean cloth and we have to prevent the infection again to prevent the infection we have to cover it with the uh, clean cloth and we have to remove the clothing so removing the clothing and covering it with a clean cloth with this when the patient comes to the emergency at that condition we have to prov provide the iv access to the patient and provide the fluid and all management to the patient and here using cool water can be the first intervention uh, before telling to the healthcare provider this can be the second one and this can be the first one moving to the 
other options the next one says apply ice to the arm then rush to the emergency so applying uh, ice to the arm will exacerbate the burn and can cause cool burn to the patient so due to which this is an incorrect option the next one says apply antibacterial ointment and contact the doctor so applying antibacterial ointment without doctor prescription is an incorrect option they should not be done first we have to cool the uh, first we have to remove the patient or remove the child from the uh, this from the site of burning and it has not been given in the question so next what will we will do we will use the cool water on the burn to decrease the burn so for this reason our option number b is correct one and then we have to notify the patient so it will be the second priority and if we have to choose the one option so our first priority that is option number b is the correct one and this rest all are the incorrect options moving to the question number 80 so question number 80 says a two year old with recent flu and persistent three days fever is admitted to the emergency room following a seizure. Okay, so the patient was having a recent flu and was having three days fever and is now having seizure. Seeking clarity, the father questions the potential reasons. The nurse provides the following uh, explanations. Okay, so in those, in those conditions, when there is the viral or when there is the... Uh, viral fever with this viral fever the children up to the 18 months to the three years up to the three years may show the uh you can say febrile seizures due to the increase in the temperature of the body the seizures can occur and these are known as febrile seizures these do occur when there is increase in the temperature of the body 200.4 degree fahrenheit and is usually present in the age group of 18 months to the three years this is a part of the if the this viral fever this is usually present with the viral fevers okay so if a child do have this these doesn't show that the child is having any abnormal development so that means the child is having a normal development and with this these uh, febrile seizures are usually harmless these do not cause any harm and these do not recognize any serious problem with this uh, these do not have to be considered as a neurostructural problem to the child so this is uh, not a serious problem with this these do not uh, prescribe any neurostructural problem to the child no neurostructural problem okay it doesn't show any brain damage to the patient usually common with the viral fever as well as in the vaccination after post vaccination this is this febrile seizures can be present okay so Moving to the uh, options available. Option number first is it's possible the seizure was a result of your child's yet to mature immune defenses. So these seizures do not come with decreased immune defenses. It is a normal process of having this fever. This is a normal uh, febrile seizures that can arise with increase in the temperature. It does not do not have to do with the immune defenses. So for this reason, this option is incorrect. The next one says, okay, consecutive okay consecutive days of fever might have culminated in the seizures so these seizures do not have to take with the uh, number of days of the fever but these have to take with the uh, temperature of the body that has been raised up to a level so for this reason this option is incorrect the next one says a swift rise in body's temperature could be the catalyst for your child seizure so yes this child seizure has been occurred due to a swift rise in the body temperature so this option is correct one the next one says your child seizures might might have been activated when their fever reached a critical level so this febrile seizures do not uh, show that there is any critical level of this fever it usually comes with the uh, fever that is above or that is at this uh, range of 100 degree 100.4 degree uh, fahrenheit but it usually do not indicates a critical level so for this reason this option is again incorrect so our question number 80 goes right with the option number third should an asthma patient use a salmitrol inhaler for exercise induced wheezing okay so if we talk about the exercise induced wheezing so exercise induced wheezing is present in those patients who do have exercise 
induced asthma and this exercise after having the exercise the uh, person may feel dizziness due to the uh, narrowing of the due to the narrowing of the bronchioles so in those patients we do use the drugs which drugs are bronchodilators so bronchodilators are those drugs which helps in the dilatation of this bronchioles so that the air flow can be increased from this bronchial bronchial so air flow will be increased if we talk about this salmitrol so salmitrol is a beta to agonist beta to agonist bronchodilators so if we talk about this salmitrol so salmitrol is a beta 2 agonist bronchodilator so it means it dilates the uh, bronchioles by enhancing the functioning of the epinephrine and norepinephrine on the bronchioles and by dilating them if we talk about this bronchodilators uh, about the classification of beta 2 agonist bronchodilators so it consists of two classes that is first one is your laba that is long acting beta 2 agonist and second one is your saba and saba is for the short acting beta 2 agonist so these two are the for the classifications of this bronchodilators are uh, these sabas are having the uh, you can say minimum time for the onset of action these sabas are short acting so the onset of action is uh, increased in the minimum time and with this laba the laba are the long acting drugs so the action starts in the long time interval so if we talk about the uh, here it has been asked about the uh, should an asthma patient uh, take salmitrol for exercise induced wheezing so when we talk about this saba so sabas are used in the those conditions when we have to use it as a rescue inhaler and when we have to use it in the emergent condition while labas are given in the uh, proper time that is it is given usually at the frequency of bd that is twice a day that is uh, twice a day and with this labas are not the rescue inhalers and should not be used in the emergent condition because if we do use the laba in the emergent conditions it may worsen of the condition of the patient so worse in the condition of the patient so for this reason the drugs that should be given in the exercise induced wheezing should be the saba drugs and not the laba drugs if we talk about the saba and laba so this salmitrol is a laba drug this salmitrol is a laba drug and if we talk about some saba drugs so your albutrol is a saba drug okay moving back to the question the question is asking it's uh, the question is giving option it says it's for allergic rhinitis and not for asthma so the bronchodilators are the drugs used for the asthma so for this reason this op option is uh, wrong next option says use 5 minutes before exercising to prevent wheezing so if we are using any long acting bronchodilators or you can say long acting beta 2 agonist so we have to use it according to the time duration or frequency that has been set as a bd and if we are using it before the exercising so we should use is is uh, at least 30 minutes before exercising because the uh, Uh, action the time of action will take time so for this reason taking the drug or the inhaler 5 minutes before will not prevent the wheezing so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says no it's a maintenance drug and not a rescue inhaler so yes the salmitrol is a maintenance drug and it is not a rescue inhaler so for this reason this option is the right one the next one says yes use imitate for these symptoms so no these long acting beta 2 agonist are not used immediately for the acute or rescue condition so for this reason this option is incorrect one question number 81 goes right with the option number c moving to the next question the next one says a 28 year old female is prescribed danazol for endometriosis what side effect should she report so if we talk about the danazol so danazol is a synthetic steroid what this uh, synthetic steroids it suppresses the pre ovulatory fsh and lh it suppresses pre ovulatory fsh and lh and it is given in those patients who do have endometriosis so if we talk about the side effects of this uh, uh, endanazol so this danazol do have the musculine uh, like side effects to the patients and this musculine like side effects are like uh, deepening of the voice in the females 
with this uh, there can be presence of breast atrophy with this there is decreased libido with this there can be presence of acne and there is presence of weight gain okay with this hirsutism may be present to the patient as a side effect that is uh, excessive hair growth can be present okay with this if we talk about some other side effects so some other side effects are like the patient may have weakness and the patient may have headache these are some side effects of these drugs so if we talk about to the uh, options so option number first is hair loss so danazol do causes the increase or excessive hair growth and not the hair loss so for this reason this option is incorrect one next one says increased libido so this denazol causes decrease in libido so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says weight loss while the denazol do causes a weight gain so for this reason this option is incorrect one and next is headache so yes the patient may have headache with this drug so this can be the side effect for the patient who is taking denazol for the endometriosis Moving to the question number 83. Question number 83 says, a patient with type 1 diabetes is set for surgery and has been fasting since midnight. Okay. The nurse observes that the morning insulin has not been prescribed. What should the nurse prioritize? Okay. So, the patient is having type 1 diabetes and has been fasting since midnight and uh, the physician has not ordered or has not prescribed the morning doses of the insulin so there if the patient is going to the surgery there may be the risk that the patient may have the hypoglycemia and there may be the risk that the patient may have the hyperglycemia because the patient is already uh, having type 1 diabetes so first we have to do what we have to assess the level we have to assess or you can say we have to check the the level of glucose then we can intervene to the next step so first step will be checking the level of the blood glucose level or you can say level of the blood glucose so moving to the options available option number first says alert the post-op care team about missing insulin prescription so if we are uh, having a patient and we are uh, not giving any dose because it has not been prescribing so before alerting the post-op care team we should have to check the blood glucose level of the patient in the pre-operative phase so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says administer the standard morning insulin so if we do the administration of the standard morning insulin without checking the blood glucose level of the patient then it may cause the hypoglycemia to the patient so for this reason this is an incorrect option the next one says measure the patient's bedside blood glucose level so yes we have to measure the patient's blood glucose level and then we have to inform it to the physician and we have to make sure if the patient should have the administration of the insulin or the patient should not have the administration of the insulin on the basis of the blood sugar level at that time. So for this reason, this option is the correct one. The next option says speak with primary care doctor about the insulin instructions. So we should speak with the primary care doctor about the insulin instructions, but they should be done after following the uh, option number third or this step so for this reason this option is incorrect one moving to the question number 84 it says for a patient with anger outburst which statement suggests that they are prepared for discharge okay so the patient is having the problem of the anger outbursting and we have to uh, choose that option which suggests that patient has is prepared for discharge option number first says it would help if my mom would stop getting on case all the time okay so in that condition in this option if the patient says this line so it means that the patient is uh, blaming her mother for his condition because he is saying that the mother should stop uh, you can say getting in the cases of the patient so this option says about patients that he is blaming on the con blaming on others 
so if the patient is blaming on others that means he has not understood his disease condition he has not understood his diagnosis and that's why he is still blaming on others so for this reason the patient is unable to get discharged in that condition so this option is the incorrect one the next one says i will be on medication like valproic acid and propanolol to help to me maintain the control so if we talk about this valproic acid and propanolol so valproic acid is a, a mood stabilizer drug while this propanolol blocks beta 2 blocker and relieves the anxiety of the patient through which the patient can maintain the control over his anger outburst so if the patient says that he will follow the medical regimen so this indicates that patient is able to get discharged and will able to control his anger outburst at the home this one is able uh, anger outburst uh, management at the home so this option is the correct one this patient is able to get discharged the next option says i won't let anger take over me so if the patient is saying that she will not take over the anger so the, um, if we talk about a normal daily routine of an individual so there may be presence of any stimuli that may cause anger to the patient and if the patient is having the condition of anger outburst so the patient may not be able to control his anger outburst without medications and this is not patient's control because the patient is already having the uh, anger outburst diagnosis so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next option says alcohol is not the solution but i enjoy my time at the bar so and uh, if the patient says that that alcohol is not the solution that can signify or that can uh, you can say uh, tell that patient used to take or intake the alcohol and that's why he is saying this option so that means there can be some other root of the problem for the patient and this patient is not able to get discharged at the time so for this reason this option is also incorrect one so our question number 84 goes right with the option number b moving to the next question Okay, before moving to the next question, we have a contest question for you and you can participate in this contest question only by answering the correct answer of this question into the comment box. And by winning the contest, you can have a chance to get $1,000 directly into your bank account or you may get the enrollment of any of our free Premier courses in the free. So, Comment on the correct answer and get the exciting chances of winning the prizes. Moving to the question number 85, it says, For a client with substance abuse, what aids them best with feelings related to the drugs? Okay, so here the patient is, the client is of the substance abuse and which uh, therapy or which will aid the best with feelings related to the drugs. So for those patients who are uh, substance abuse, abusers, so we can provide a group therapy to those patients. Why? Because of while having this group therapy with the similar, uh, you can say groups or with the similar individuals who also do intake or who also abuses the drugs. So the patient can get the inspiration and the motivation how he can uh, leave his habit of the substance abusing and there is reduction in the stigma of the patient when he joins the group and when he sees that how other individuals have uh, you can say have uh, subsided this uh, substance abuse with this if the patient do uh, you can say uh, take those sessions or those therapy which do 
include the individual therapies so taking the individual therapies will not help the patient as much as the group therapy because in this individual therapy there is not the release of the social stigma there will be no one to provide the motivation to the patient with this there is no one to tell the patient about the uh, healthy lifestyle that the patient should pursue so by having the group therapy these all uh, motives can be achieved so moving to the options so option first is recreation so recreating therapy will not help it is again an individual therapy and it will not help the patient so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says solitary activities so again solitary activities are individual activities it will not help the patient the next one says group sessions so yes the group sessions and group therapy helps in maintaining the healthy lifestyle helps in motivating the patient helps in reducing the social stigma of the patient helps in the patient how to overcome the addiction so these group sessions are best for the patients the next one says individual therapy so yes this individual therapy is not a right and not a good choice for the patient so for this reason this option is incorrect one moving to the question number 86 so it says what should a nurse do for a creatinine clearance test so if we talk about this creatinine clearance test so creatinine clearance test is a test that helps to identify that how well someone's kidney do filter the creatinine kidneys filter the creatinine this creatinine clearance test this creatinine clearance test is, uh, you can say, measure in the amount of creatinine that has been excreted in the urine per minute per body surface area. With this, this creatinine uh, clearance test is a 24-hour uh, urine collection test in which the patient has to collect the 24-hour urine of himself in a container and then this creatinine clearance test can be done with this the patient has to maintain the normal uh, normal water intake during the during the uh, this creatinine clearance test it means the patient should have normal that is eight glasses of water over 24 hours the patient should not have to increase the uh, highly increase the water intake okay with this this creatinine clearance test the samples of this uh, the urine samples should be contained in the container at the room temperature okay moving to the options the option number first is hand over a clean urine container so clean urine container we need a urinal or we need a bedpan or a urine can to collect the 24 hours urine so we will not need a urine container so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says advice 24 hour urine collection so yes we have to teach the patient that the 24 hour urine collection is to be done so for this reason this option is correct one the next one says recommend intake of 3000 ml per day so no we should not increase the water intake as such so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says please a urethral catheter so uh, if a patient can void by himself so uh, by self voiding the patient can uh, follow this creatinine clearance test <laughs> and there is no need to place this urethral catheter to this patient so for this reason this option is incorrect one question number 86 goes right with the option number b moving to the question number 87 so question says after transurethral resection of prostate that is TURP transurethral resection of prostate a client has incontinence and drinks less what should the nurse advise to the patient okay so the patient has undergone TURP so TURP is a procedure that has been done after the patient who have the BPS that is benign prostate hyperplasia and this TURP to remove the uh, hyperplasic uh, cells from this uh, you can say prostate gland due to which there is a proper urine excretion from the body or from the excretory system where this uh, when we do the TURP to the patient so there are the risk for the having hemorrhage 
to reduce the risk for having hemorrhage what should be done if the patient is having hemorrhage so there are chances of forming the clots and if these clots can block the urinary passage so we have to provide a optimum water intake to the patient and by providing optimum fluid intake what is done these clots will remove out and will excrete out in the urine and therefore decreases the risk for this blockage of the urinary pathway so Moving to the options, our option number first is drinking less can lead to kidney stones. So drinking less, drinking less is a problem and it will lead to the blood clots after TURP and blood clots and obstruction and not to the kidney stones. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. The next one says consume eight glasses daily and urinate every couple of hours. So this option says that we have to teach the patient about proper uh, drinking of this uh, water, that is eight glasses per day and urinate so that these clots can be excreted out. So yes, this option is the correct one. The next option says should the incontinence persist, we may need to use the catheter again so if the incontinence is persisting first we have to check the uh, increase the intake of the fluid and we have to do the assessment then only we can move to the uses of the catheter so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next option says Reducing the fluid intake might lessen the incontinence. So reducing the fluid intake will increase the blood clots and the blood clots will increase the blockage and will lead to the urinary incontinence. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. So question number 87 goes right with the option number B. Moving to the question number 88. It says, in advanced osteoarthritis, pain is typically described as, so osteoarthritis is the inflammation of the joints and this inflammation is usually present as a degenerative condition and this inflammation is usually present in the bigger joint and if we talk about the bigger joint, it is usually present at the knee joint with this, the osteoarthritis too occurs in the uh, asymmetric pattern that is the one side of the joint uh, can be involved and the other joint, uh, other side of the joint cannot be involved or may be involvement of the both but the normal pattern is the asymmetric pattern of the osteoarthritis. If we talk about the advanced osteoarthritis, so here we have stages of osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis is divided into the four stages. The first one uh, is when there is minor loss of the articular cartilage which is present at the joint. Like here, the articular cartilage is present and minor bones perform. So, when this articular cartilage is destroyed, so there is the growth of the bone spur. With, uh, first stage is having mild occasional discomfort when joint heavily stressed when the joint is heavily overused. Okay. Still second occurs when some bone hardening uh, occurs and with this occasional bone cyst formation, greater osteophytes. Osteophytes are this overgrowth of the bone for, uh, after the after the rupture of the articular cartilage uh, with a change in the bone density. The next says mild and moderate pain. Okay, pain is also present with intense activity again. Next is occasional joint stiffness is present. The next is option, uh, sorry, stage number third. And stage number third, joint stiffness is present with the prolonged resting when the patient do awake and after the uh, sleep, then there is the present of joint stiffness and with this cartilage thinning and some joint narrowing is present. So marked osteophyte formation can be seen in the x-rays. The advanced stage is the fourth stage and in the advanced stage, what can be seen is dramatically reduced joint spaces will, which will lead to intense pain to the patient, sorry, which will lead to intense pain to the patient, right? okay, which will lead to intense pain to the, okay, which will lead to intense pain, uh, lead to intense pain to the patient.
okay the next is bone and deformity with severe cartilage loss and formation of osteophytes frequent mild to moderate pain occasional severe pain okay and occasional severe pain occurs uh, you can say this mild to moderate pain is all, always present with the activities with the minimal activities also the next one says joint stiffening and movement loss due to the presence of this osteophytes okay moving to the options the op the question has been asked about the advanced stage osteoarthritis so option number first says okay option number first says tiredness pairs with the pain so tiredness can be present from the first stage and not in the not only in the advanced stage so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says pain arises from the slight movement so yes in the advanced stage a slight movement will increase will cause will arise a pain to the patient so this option is the correct one the next one says capitation emerges amplifying pain so capitation is the sound of the bone friction over each other and can be sound of the osteophytes so this can be present with the stage third and is not specific with the stage fourth or the advanced stage so for this reason this option is the incorrect one the next one says both joints feel pain evenly so we have talked that the pattern of involvement of joint is asymmetric in the osteoarthritis so for this reason this option is incorrect one so question number 88 goes right with the option number b moving to the option question number 89 it says patient with osteomyelitis shows pain unstable walk and fatigue the nurse should institute which of the following okay so we are having a patient with two osteomyelitis that is inflammation of the bone and uh, that is of the two and uh, that is phalanges shows pain the patient is having pain unstable walk and fatigue what should the nurse institute so first option says use airborne safety so when the patient to have osteomyelitis we do not have to maintain the uh, specific measures for the airborne safety so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says rest in bed so we have to promote the mobility of the patient when the patient is having osteomyelitis we have to promote mobility so for this reason we do not want the patient to rest in the bed the next is treat anti-fall measure. So because the patient is having unstable walk and do feel fatigue, so there is the chances of having a fall. So for this reason, we have to take the anti-fall measures to the patient, like uh, providing the walkers to the patient so that the patient can use those, those assistive devices during walking and providing the support to the patient, providing the companion to the patient while walking. The next option says recommend physiotherapy. So physiotherapy is not recommended for the two osteomyelitis or it, if it should be recommended, it should be recommended by the primary healthcare provider and not by the nurse. So for this reason, this option is the incorrect one. Moving to the question number 90. Question number 90 says a new Asian mother in North America with limited English proficiency. Okay. The okay occasionally bottle fits her baby the majority of care is given by her mother-in-law what is the nurse's best course of action okay so here there is a new asian mother in north america the mother is asian for this there is limited english proficiency so there is a presence of the communication barrier due to the language okay and uh the mother occasionally bottle fits her baby that that means that most of the time he she does the breastfeeding to the baby okay see breastfeeds the baby the majority of care is given by mother-in-law so what should be the nurse's best action so if we talk about some asian mothers so if we talk about some asian mothers so due to the presence of their uh, traditional culture there can be there can be the, uh, you can say, culture that the mother-in-law is taking care of the baby and the uh, mother of the baby is taking optimum rest. Due to providing of optimum resting phase to the mother, the mother-in-law can take the care of the baby 
with this it has also been mentioned that bottle feeds occasionally that most of the time the uh, mother will breast feeds her baby so that means the mother do provide the essential need for the baby and with this the rest of the needs are taken care by the mother in law okay moving to the options available option number first is secure approval for a post discharge home visit so securing and approval for post discharge visit is necessary if there is the uh, hindrance in the information or understanding of the information by the uh, mother as well as by the mother in law so in that condition the nurse should schedule a home visit otherwise there is no need no need to schedule a home visit to the uh, mother's home so for this reason this option is the incorrect one because here there is no any hindrance in the information until now okay the next one says find out if it's a tradition within their culture so yes it is very important for the nurse to find out if it is a normal culture in the asian mothers that the mother in law do uh, take the care of the baby so this is the right option the next is inform the social worker regarding potential bonding concerns so if the mother is providing proper breastfeed to the patient to the baby and to provide the occasional bottle feed so it doesn't shows any bonding concerns with the uh, mother and the baby so there is no need to inform the social worker regarding this next one says note the distinct maternal actions in her file so if the nurse observes these distinct maternal actions so so she has to make it clear she has to uh, make it undoubtful only then she should mention anything in her file without the uh, clearance of the doubts and without clearing the situation the nurse cannot file anything uh, by her judgment to the file so for this reason this option is incorrect one question number 90 goes right with the option number b moving to the question number 91 so it says for a patient who has been administered tissue plasminogen activator or alteplase recombinant treatment, what should the nurse prioritize? So alteplase recombinant or tissue plasminogen activator is a fibrinolytic drug which uh, helps in the lysis of the fibrins and therefore decreases the clots and you can say uh, dissolves the clots. It dissolves the clot. Okay. So, because it dissolves the clot, so these patients who do take this drug are an increased risk for the hemorrhage. These have increased risk for the hemorrhage and we have to, as a nurse, we have to take those measures which will decrease the risk for having this hemorrhage to the patient. So, option number first is KIM injection. So, this tissue plasminogen activator is given by IV infusions to the patient and not by the IM injection. So, for this reason, this option is incorrect one. The next option says extract blood gas samples from the radial artery. So, when we talk about the extracting of the blood uh, gas samples from the radial artery or any other artery, so providing a firm pressure after the uh, you can say blood withdrawal is very convenient in the radial artery rather than in the femoral or any other artery. So for this reason, this option is the correct one because is uh, we can provide a firm pressure and it is a convenient, uh, you can say, uh, convenient site for taking the blood gas samples of the patient so this option is the right one the next is promote moderate exercises so increasing the ability or you can say increasing the mobility of the patient will increase the risk for for the fall of the patient and may cause bruises to the patient so for this reason we should not increase much activity or exercise of the patient for this reason, this option is incorrect one. The next one says apply arterial pressure for 15 seconds. So those patients who are uh, in the tissue plasminogen activated therapy should apply the arterial pressure for more than 30 seconds and not only for the 15 seconds. So for this reason, this option is the incorrect one and question number 91 goes with the option number B. 
Moving to the question number 92, it says the nurse spots a closed IV. A nurse spots a closed IV, 50% dextrose in a unit vein. What's the nurse's next step? Okay, so the nurse has noticed a closed IV, 50% uh, IV in the unit vein. So because this 50% dextrose can be misused because it has a potential harmful effects so these drugs should not be kept outside of the pharmacy and if the nurse notices this drug and the drug is closed so the nurse should take those measures so that she can put the uh, drug to the pharmacy bag okay moving to the options option number may first says make an incident note so there is no need to make an incident note the second one says dispose in the sharp screen so the drugs do you can say uh, discarded in the yellow bin and not in the sharp bin and again this is a closed iv drug so we should not dispose it anywhere so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says alert risk control the nurse should not alert risk control but have to decrease the uh, you can say risk and has to uh, inhibit or avoid the risk so for this reason this option is incorrect and how she will avoid the risk by forwarding this closed i visit to the pharmacy so this option is correct one so question number 92 goes right with the option number d moving to the next question number 93 it says the nurse is instructing a support staff about the care of the patients with self-mutilation which response by the support staff about self-mutilation indicates a proper understanding okay so uh, if there is the condition or the patient has been undergone the self-mutilation or self-harm it means there are the intense emotions present to the patient and due to presence of this intense emotion he has taken this step sorry okay so due to presence of these intense emotions the patient may have taken this step of self-harm and what happens when the patient do have intense and deep emotions anger and sometimes patient do have mood disorders bpat or the patient may have uh, anger depression in that conditions the patient do uh, harm the body so that she they can uh, you can say connect to the real feelings by the, through their body and through the sensation they are feeling in the body so moving to the options available for this question option number four says it's a tactic to control others so no the patient is undergoing with the intense emotions of anger of depression and she, he is not using any tactic to control others so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says it's an expression of deep-seated emotions and frustration so yes the deep-seated emotions and frustration causes this self-harm uh, condition or this self-harm uh, activity to the patient so for this reason this option is the correct one the next one says it's a minor issue so no it's not a minor issue and it do need attention and here it has been written that it doesn't really need inf uh, attention so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says it's a matter for individual to seek attention so no the patient do not want to seek the attention but do want to wash up the emotions and frustration so for this reason this option is incorrect one Question number 93 goes right with the option number 2. Moving to the question number 94, it says, while conducting standard tracheostomy care, which actions should a nurse incorporate? So, when a patient is undergoing tracheostomy care, the nurse should incorporate first. So, option first says, place a sliced gauze pad beneath the neck brace for skin protection. So, providing a sliced gauze pad may cause the threads of the gauze to, uh, you can say, uh, to pass to the respiratory tract and will increase the 
ओके एंड विल हिंडर द पेशेंट्स रेस्पिरेटरी सॉरी नॉर्मैलिटी सो फॉर दिस रीजन दिस प्लेसिंग अ स्लाइस कॉज पैड बिनीथ द नेकलेस इज नॉट अ गुड मैथड टू प्रोवाइड स्किन प्रोटेक्शन ऑल दो वी डू हैव द ऑलरेडी प्री पैक्ड गॉज पीसेस दे डू नॉट हैव द ओपन थ्रेड्स एंड दैट इज अ बेटर ऑप्शन देन दिस सो फॉर दिस रीजन दिस ऑप्शन इज इन करेक्ट वन नेक्स्ट वन सेज टू सक्शन टू द इनर ट्यूब वन द process is finished so the suction of the inner tube is done before the process of the trichotomy but not the after or but not after finishing the process so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says clean the inner tube at the interval of 3 hours so the inner tube should be cleaned with the interval of italy and with this uh, if the patient do have this uh, conditions of uh, having excessive mucus so it can be done secondarily as well as uh, as per the need of the patient so uh, cleaning the tube three hourly is not a good option so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says fasten the trichotomy straps using a square knot so yes the trichotomy straps are binded with a square knot so this option is the correct one after educating a parent about infants evident babinski reflex the nurse can confirm the parent's comprehension when she mentions that a clear babinski reflex means okay so babinski reflex is a reflex in which so in the babinski reflex what happen when we stimulate the lateral plantar aspect of the foot okay stimulating the what stimulating lateral plantar aspect of the foot it causes what it causes the uh extension of the hallux that is the great toe so extension of the hallux and fanning of the fingers you can say digits okay so these are the findings of this babinski reflex and of this uh, positive babinski reflex this babinski reflex is usually present in the infants and may be and may be present till the age of up to the age of 2 years this babinski reflex shows that there is uh, you can say underdeveloped uh, spinal cord or you can say central nervous system and when the central nervous system to develop properly at the age of 2 years this babinski reflex is negative and is not present in the normal conditions after the 2 years so moving to the options available the question asks if she mentions a clear babinski reflex confirm that patient has understood what is a babinski reflex okay so which option says that uh, which option is the right one option number first is under developed central nervous system so yes because the infant to have under developed central nervous system this is the right one the next is potential harm to nerves linked to the leg so it doesn't show any potential harm to the nerves linked to the leg so this option is incorrect one the next one says potential defect in the lower extremity so it does not uh, signifies a defect in the lower extremities this option is incorrect one the next option says possible partial paralysis so again this option is a incorrect one it is present in the infants because there is a underdeveloped central nervous system because a patient is infant mm -hmm. moving to the question number 96 it says when getting a patient ready for surgical procedure the nurse evaluates potential psychological issues that might lead to pre surgery stress which of the following fears is considered to be the most unsettling for the patient about to undergo surgery okay so patient is in the pre surgical phase and which of the fear is the most unsettling fear for the patient option first is worry regarding the impact of anesthesia okay uh, if the patient is having the worry regarding impact of anesthesia so this can be reduced by having the by providing the knowledge to the patient and by um, telling the patient about the effects of the anesthesia and how it will work and which type of anesthesia which will be used to the patient and how it will affect the uh, you can say uh, body and body system of the patient okay So next one says dread of experiencing pain. So if a patient is uh going undergoing surgery, so the patient will have pain, and we can teach patients that we can control the pain by using the proper uh analgesics. The next one says apprehension about the unfamiliar. 
so if the patient is having the apprehension that uh, of the surgery that is the unfamiliar so this is about the most concern why because patient is uh, not aware of the procedure and is not aware what is going to uh, happen with the patient and this is a very uh, you can say concerning condition so, okay the next one says concern over alteration in physical appearance so again if the patient is going to have the surgery and knows that he is going to have surgery and he concerns about a physical appearance so this can be reduced by providing the information to the patient but out of these four options if the patient do not know what is going to happen with the patient that is of the most unsettled condition so for this reason our option number c goes right and rest all the options are incorrect one moving to the question number 97 it says a young individual diagnosed with hodgkin's disease is back in the hospital due to aggressive nature of the ailment okay which is not reacting well to various treatments that means that means patient has already undergone various treatments and is not getting the effect or therapeutic effect of the treatments due to the progressive increase in the disease conditions of the Hodgkin's disease or Hodgkin's lymphoma okay that seems likely that patient is uh, having terminal illness now the primary focus for the patient should be so what should be the primary focus what should be the uh, first demand of the patient in this condition so option number first is lessen apprehensions concerning intense intensive treatments okay so lessening the apprehensions concerning the intensive treatment will not reduce if the patient is already going to uh, you can say having terminal illness and his patient is going to die so in that condition patients fear regarding the intensive treatments will not be that much as compared to the patient's fear and anxiety related to the death okay next one says demands the sense of loneliness okay option third says overcome sentiments of social insufficiency and next one says alleviate anxiety about potential pain okay so uh, decreasing the anxiety about potential pain the patient is going to die so the patient will have the more and more anxiety related to his self and related to his life and related to his uh you can say loving ones and related to his uh, related to his self his life and his loving ones and about the you can say uh, his end time or the palliative terminal time that the patient is undergoing so in that condition we has to provide the psychological support to the patient and in the psychological support which we, what we have to provide we have to strengthen the patient we have to motivate the patient with this we have to uh, provide the happiness to the patient we should not uh, let the patient be feel lonely with this we should maintain a uh, maintain a happy and a positive environment uh, to the patient so by these condition we can uh, manage the patient in the terminal illness so that the time that has been left to the patient can be a good time for the patient okay so alleviating anxiety about potential pain the patient will not have the most of the anxiety related to pain but will about the life so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next is overcome sentiments of social insufficiency so social insufficiency uh, will be taken care after the self insufficiency of the patient so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says diminish the sense of uh, loneliness so yes we have to uh, provide the nursing care in which the sense of loneliness will decrease so this option is a correct one and rest of other options are the incorrect one moving to the question number 98 it says a 32 year old female presents with fatigue and painful urination she has a fever of 38 degrees centigrade and sore vesicles <coughs> sorry about her vaginal reason she mentions to the nurse that she had intercourse with a new partner about a week ago what should the nurse's response be so if the patient is having these symptoms these symptoms do signify the genital herpes to the patient and these genital herpes can be present after the unprotected sex of the uh, after the 2 to 20 days of the unprotected sex and with this if the partner of the uh, of the female 
that she has been uh, introducing that she has uh, undergone uh, intercourse with a new partner so this new partner may have this genital herpes and the patient oh, sorry and the patient has now uh, this con these symptoms of genital herpes so if the patient who have these symptoms of genital herpes <laughs> What should be the nurse's response? So, first option says advise the client to apply soothing gel to the vesicles. So, applying the gel uh, without the prescription is not recommended as well as soothing gel will not cure the condition of the patient. It, it will only provide some amount of comfort to the patient but will not, it will provide comfort but will not cure the condition. So, for this reason, this option is the incorrect one. The next option says, suggest the client request her partner wear a protective barrier during intimacy. So again, if the patient has already undergone, has already uh, infected with this genital herpes and providing this protective barrier will not cure the condition of the patient now. So for this reason, this option is the incorrect one. The next option says, guide the client to consult the medical professional. So yes, the, we have to guide the client so that she can uh, get the diagnosis of her disease and with getting the diagnosis, she can get the proper treatment of the disease condition. So this can be the right option. The next one says recommend the client consume up to four liters of water per day. So again, this will not cure the condition of the patient. However, can provide some amount of comfort to the patient. So for this reason, this option is the incorrect one. The proper treatment will be uh, will be possible after having the proper diagnosis and proper diagnosis will be possible after consulting to the medical professional. So question number 98 goes right with the option number C. Moving to the question number 99, it says a couple with Down syndrome, newborn, informs the nurse they were not expecting the diagnosis, which statement suggests they know something about Down syndrome. Okay, so here the patient, they hear a couple has a newborn in for a newborn with the Down syndrome, and which statement suggests they know something about the Down syndrome. So if we talk about the Down syndrome, that is the trisomy of the chromosome twenty one. So the patients or the individuals with the Down syndrome do have different uh, disabilities and these disabilities can be of their, uh, these disabilities can be mental disabilities and these can be physical disabilities. If we talk about the mental disabilities, so there is delayed in the development of the uh, individual delayed development with this uh, again what again happened that the children that is having down syndrome that is usually two to three years beyond the age of the healthy individual of the same age with this the individual with the down syndrome do have the intellectual uh, delay intellectual delay Okay, if we talk about the physical disabilities, so in the physical disabilities, the patient may have the flat nose. With this, there can be short stature of the patient. With this, there can be a presence of brachycephaly. Okay, uh, brachycephaly. Okay, there can be presence of brachycephaly. Single palm, palm line can be present to the patient. Small mouth can be present. With this low lying, uh, low lying ears is present to the patient, and the patient may have the almond shaped eye. These are the physical, uh, you can say, characteristics of a patient with the Down syndrome of an individual with the Down syndrome. If we talk about the uh, behavioral uh, behavioral pattern, so usually these individuals uh, do have a calm behavior. They are not hyperactive. They do have a calm behavior. Okay, moving to the options available. So option number first says, uh, Down syndrome children have a wide range of mental and physical attributes. So yes, those children who do have Down syndrome do have the wide range of mental and physical attributes, which we have discussed here. So for this reason, this option is correct one. The next says, kids with Down syndrome may vary of unfamiliar people and struggle with friendship. So they do have the calm behavior and they do not have to struggle with friendship. So for this reason, this option is the incorrect one. The next one says, 
they might show aggression so we have talked that they have a calm behavior so for this reason this option is incorrect again it says during puberty due to hormonal shift so there is not as such any uh, complication or not as such any findings in the patient individuals with the down syndrome so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says down syndrome ki kids might need institutional care at some stage in life so the kids with down syndrome may or may not need the institutional care but it is not specific that they will they will need an institutional care or someone is somewhere in life so for this reason this option is incorrect one and question number 99 goes right with the option number a question number 100 it says when giving an educational session for a patient on lithium therapy the nurse should inform the patient about okay so patient is having this lithium therapy this lithium therapy this lithium is a mood stabilizer and this lithium is given to the patient usually in the uh, conditions of the mania with this this lithium two parts this lithium partly replaces the sites of the sodium okay it replaces the sodium from the body and when it replaces the sodium it actually binds him itself to the sites of the sodium and if it increases the binding to the sites of the uh, sodium it will lead to the what it will lead to the lithium toxicity okay so with this uh what are the thing that when the patient is having this lithium therapy we have to teach the patient to intake the optimum amount of the sodium so that the patient will not uh, lead with to the lithium toxicity and if we will increase the amount of sodium intake so well it will decrease the you can say uh, lithium effect or lithium binding so it will decrease the lithium therapeutic effect so uh, we do not have to increase or decrease the sodium level we have to maintain a optimum level of this sodium to the patient so that the therapeutic effect can be achieved so that the lithium toxicity can be prevented moving to the options so option number first is opting food marked as low sodium so low sodium foods are not given to the patients optimum sodium should be given the next one says enhancing salt intake so salt intake should not be increased so for this reason this option is incorrect one next is maintaining an adequate sodium intake so yes providing an adequate sodium intake will maintain uh, both of the condition so for this reason this option is correct one next one says eliminating sodium so if we will eliminate the sodium from the meals it will cause the lithium toxicity to the patient so for this reason this option is incorrect one in a critical unit four patients have nosocomial infection of pseudomonas organiza choose the best nursing intervention so here the patient is having in the same unit four patients are having nosocomial infection so nosocomial infection is that infection which occurs to the patient after the 48 hours of the hospital uh, admission with this the causative organism is the pseudomonas organiza and this pseudomonas organiza to causes the pneumonia to the patient in the news when we talk about the hips that is hospital acquired pneumonia then it is caused by it may be caused by the pseudomonas organiza and if the patients are having this infection what should be the nurse's best intervention so when we read about this uh, pseudomonas organiza so we have to maintain the hand wash hand wash very properly so that we can eliminate this uh, bacteria and we will not pass it to the other individuals to the other patients that are present in the unit with this when we uh, when we talk about the contact precautions so there are no need of taking any specific contact precautions for this uh, pseudomonas organism and with this uh, we should not and it is not specific or compulsory to take the HEPA mask or N95 mask for this patients who do have this infection so moving to the option option number first is ensure staff don't have artificial nails so if the uh, we if the uh, staff will have artificial nails then there will be the increased risk of passing this pseudomonas organism 
so we have to ensure as a best nursing intervention we have to ensure that the staff do not have artificial nails and are not uh, causing as a that this pseudomonas is not getting as a cross infection to the other uh, patient so this one uh, can be the right option the next is use an n95 mask for this patients so this n95 masks do not uh, needed in these patients so for this reason this option is incorrect the next is uh, start contact precautions so contact precautions are are not needed in this a uh, patient so for this reason this option is incorrect one and next one says begin transmission based uh, precautions so again for the pseudomonas organism we have to uh, take care of the hand washing and have to do the proper hand washing and there is no need to begin the transmission based uh, precautions so for question number 101 goes right with the option number a Next is question number 102. It says, a patient is prescribed isosorbide dinitrate for angina relief, which statement signifies that the patient is aware of the medication's potential side effects. So the option are, uh, it's important that I notify my doctor if I notice my ankle swelling. The next is, when changing postures, I must do so gradually to prevent dizziness. The next is, before administering the medication, I should check my pulse. And the next is, I should consume isosorbide dinitrate alongside a meal. So, when we talk about this uh, isosorbide dinitrate, so this isosorbide dinitrate is a potent vasodilator. It is a potent vasodilator. It means it causes the dilatation of the uh, vessels. When it causes the dilatation of the vessels, so uh, with this because the vasodilation there is decreased in the blood pressure with this decrease in the blood pressure why it is given in the angina so due to decrease uh, you, or you can say due to uh, dilatation of the vessels the workload to the heart decreases and due to this there is decrease in the myocardial oxygen demand myocardial o2 demand So for this reason, this uh, uh, isosorbide dinitrate is given to the patient. So when it is given to the patient because it causes BP, it may cause the orthostatic hypotension to the patient. Orthostatic hypotension. It may cause orthostatic hypotension to the patient as it is causing the vasodilation. So our option number second, which says when changing posture, I must do gradually to prevent the dizziness. It is the correct one. Why? Because uh, because this uh, isosorbide dinitrate do causes the orthostatic hypotension. So due to this uh, hypotension, when the patient frequently or you can say when the patient suddenly changes the uh, position, so in sudden change of the position, there is sudden fall in the systolic BP and the diastolic BP and this is known as your uh, this orthostatic hypotension. So we have to make sure that the patient will not suddenly move the or change the posture but to have do it very gradually so there will not be orthostatic hypotension and patient will not feel the dizziness. So option number b will be the correct one the option number a is it's important to notify my doctor uh, if i notice my ankle swelling so this isosorbide dinitrate do not causes ankle swelling so for this reason this option is incorrect the next call says before administering the medication i should check my pulse so it is not compulsory to check the pulse before administering this uh, isosorbide dinitrate so for this reason this option is incorrect the next is i should consume isosorbide dinitrate alongside a meal so isosorbide dinitrate is uh, taken with this sublingual root and uh, in the sublingual root it should be placed below the tongue and uh, when it is placed below the tongue that is at what time when it is taken there should not be any meal and because it can hinder the effect of absorption of this isosorbide dinitrate and before and after uh, 30 minutes of the meal uh, you can take the isosorbide dinitrate and not with the meal so therefore this option is incorrect one the next is our question number 203 and it says during the second stage of labor 
a patient has not received any anesthesia or analgesia so here we are having a patient who has not received any analgesia and has not received any uh, what the patient is saying analgesia or anesthesia which position should the nurse help the patient assume to facilitate pushing so we are here to find out the position which will facilitate the pushing in the patient in the you can say this pregnant female so when we talk about this uh, you can say pushing or so so what happens that we have to make maintain a, a position that will cause that will increase the flow to the fetus with this with this we have to maintain a position that will follow the gravity or you can say that will go with the that will uh, cause the pushing with the gravity so we have to provide a position that will uh, you can say provide the or follow the gravity so when we talk about this position this, so there can be standing position there can be kneeling position or there can be squatting position okay moving to the options so option number first is that in knee chest position while keeping the head down so the knee chest position causes the uh, posterior movement of the fetus and therefore this position delays the process of the labor so we have to facilitate the pu uh, pushing and we do not have to delay this uh, labor process so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says squatting with the back arc so when the patient is having the squatting position so with this squatting position the body should be shaped in a c like curve because when there is a c like curve then there will be the proper pushing of the fetus from the uh, uterus to the outer environment through the vagina so if the patient is in the squatting position so this is a c like and this is if this is the height this is a c like position and these are the uh, hands if you talk about and these are the legs so this is the c shape uh, your squatting position and it has uh, option number b has said that back is arched so if the back is arched like this and then the patient is having a, a squatting position so in that condition it will not facilitate the pushing so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one says side lying while keeping the head elevated so side lying position do not promote with this uh, squatting position uh, sorry with this uh, force of gravity so for this reason this option is incorrect one this side lying can be given if the patient has given anesthesia or analgesia and next is squatting with body curved in a c shape so yes squatting uh, the body with a c shape to promote or to facilitate the pushing so option number d is the right one the next question allopurinol is given to the patient with a long term gout so when we talk about the gout so gout is a condition when there is a increase in the uric acid and due to increase in the uric acid these uric acid crystals do convert to the monosodium urate when they uh, comes in the contact with the synovial fluid so here they form the monosodium urate crystals and these monosodium urate crystals are needle like crystals they do have a needle like shape and therefore they causes the inflammation of the uh, joints they do causes the inflammation of the uh, the synovial membrane and of the joints and therefore it causes the gouty arthritis to the patient so when we are giving this to the patient which statement shows that the patient knows how to consume the allopurinol so allopurinol is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor which class of drug this is this is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor what this drug do so when we talk about this uh, so this is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor so when there is a purine and in the end product of the purine this uric acid is the formed so this uh, purine is converted to the xanthine and from then xanthine to the uric acid in the presence of this xanthine oxidase so if we inhibit this xanthine oxidase so there will be not the conversion there will be inhibition in the conversion of purine to the uric acid and when there is decrease in the production of the uric acid due to presence of the xanthine oxidase inhibitor so there will be increase in the purine and hypoxanthine so when there is an increase in the purine and hypoxanthine so this purine and hypoxanthine will excrete out from the urine 
and without increasing the level of the uric acid to the patient's blood. So uh, we do provide this allopurinol to this long-term gout in those patients where there is the constant increase in the uric acid. So, so that there will be the increase and excretion of the purine and hypoxanthine, we do provide this allopurinol to the patient and this comes under the class of anti-gout medications and with this under the xanthine oxidase inhibitor. So option number first is I should consume aspirin while I am taking allopurinol. So uh, this aspirin and allopurinol both causes the GI symptoms and it causes the GI upset. So we do not give, uh, we should not give these two medications to the patient, uh, you can say together while because both do have the side effects of GI upset and if we will give this together to the patient, so risk for the GI upset will be increased. So therefore, these two medications are not usually gained to together. The next one says, I will use the medication whenever I feel pain in my joints. So this allopurinol is not an analgesic. It is an anti-gout medication. It is a xanthine oxidase and this is not an analgesic and we do provide the analgesic to relieve the pain. And this allopurinol will decrease the uric acid but it will not directly work on the pain of the patient. So for this reason, this option is incorrect one. The next is, uh, it's best for me to take this medication without food. So if the patient is taking this allopurinol without food, so it causes the GI upset as it do have the side effect of GI upset. So it causes the GI upset to the patient. So therefore, this medication should be taken uh, followed the food. It is after the food and it should not be taken without food. So for this reason, if the patient says it, that means he is not having the proper knowledge. The next option is drinking a lot of water is essential when I am on allopurinol. So yes, when the patient is on allopurinol, so drinking a lot of water is much more essential. Why? So that this purine and hypoxanthine will excrete out from the kidney very easily and there is no stone formation. So therefore, this uh, you can say that to increase the excretion of this uh, unwanted wastes, we have to increase the uh, water intake. So for this reason, question number 104 goes right with the option number 4. The next 105 is a patient is using oral birth control pills. The nurse informs her that which of the following medications might reduce the effectiveness of her contraceptive. So when a patient is taking oral con birth control pills, so which of these medications will reduce the effectiveness of the contraceptives. So the options are diuretics, antihypertensive, antihistamines and antibiotics. So out of these four, these antibiotics do increases the effectiveness of the uh, OCPs and rest all that is diuretics, antihypertensive and antihistamines. These do not have any effect on this oral birth control pills. And when the patient is taking antibiotics with this uh, OCPs, we have to teach the patient that he should use uh, uh, other alternative, you can say alternative contraceptive methods so that he can be prevented from the undesired pregnancy. So these health teaching should be given to the patient while using OCPs with the antibiotics. Next is question number 106 and it says which among the following is associated with an increased risk for toxic shock syndrome. So toxic shock syndrome is a very life threatening condition and in this life threatening condition there is the presence of the bacterial infection. This is a life threatening condition with the presence of bacterial infection. So if we talk about that, what type of bacteria, what which bacteria? So it is usually due to the Staphylococcus aureus, usually due to this one, or it can be due to the Streptococcus. Uh, and if we talk about the risk factor, so this is usually as a risk in those females who are in the menstruating age. Okay, so uh, here has been asked about the risk of toxic shock syndrome. The first option says alternating tampons with sanitary pads. So those females who do use tampons and they do use tampons for a very long uh, period, that 
is a risk for the toxic shock syndrome so therefore a female who do use tampons should decrease or you can say should alternate her tampons with the sanitary pads should uh, decrease the time in which she is inserting say is placing the tampon to the uh, you can say vaginal canal so therefore changing to the sanit sanitary pad decreases the risk of the toxic shock syndrome the next one is using only tampons at night so when the patient or when an individual is using tampons so he or she has to change it every two to three hourly and if he is not changing this tampons every two to three hourly so there is an increased risk in the toxic shock syndrome and if the patient is only using tampons at night so that means there is a placement of the tampons uh, for approximate six to seven hours for how long the patient is sleeping there is a presence of the tampons so this will increase the risk of the toxic shock syndrome so this option is increasing the risk of having this toxic shock syndrome the next one is changing tampons every second hourly so this is a healthy practice and it decreases the risk of this tss so this option is incorrect one the next is avoid avoiding use of deodorized tampon so yes if the patient is using deodorized tampon so this it in uh, it using deodorized tampons increases the risk for tss and if the patient is avoiding this deodorized tampon so that means uh, the she is decreasing the risk for this tss so for this reason because in this option there is decrease in the risk of the tss so for this reason this option is again incorrect one the next option question is question number 107 here a computer operator is diagnosed with carpal tunnel syndrome which of the following is a primary cause so because a patient is having carpal tunnel syndrome when we talk about the carpal tunnel syndrome so carpal tunnel syndrome is caused by the uh, it is caused by the compression of the median nerve there can be various risk factors due to which this uh, median nerve is compressed this median nerve or this you can say carpal tunnel is present at the this carpal tunnel uh, compartment is present at the wrist and if there is the you can say increase in the bending of the wrist so there can be the or you can say increase in the forces at the wrist uh, wrist so there can be the uh, you can say risk factors for having this carpal tunnel syndrome with this if the patient is having comorbidities like if the patient is having diabetes mellitus so if this if the patient is having obesity so these also increases the risk for having uh, this compression of median nerve and therefore the patient will have this uh, you can say carpal tunnel syndrome so compression of median nerve this is the primary cause and these are the risk factors okay so moving to the options so first one says muscle wasting from the inactivity so carpal tunnel syndrome is not caused by the inactivity but it can be a risk in those patients who do over activity of the wrist so this option is the incorrect one the next is continuous wrist bending so because the patient is bending his wrist again and again and continuously so there is an increased risk the next one is compression of the median nerve so compression of the median nerve is the primary cause that is why the patient is having carpal tunnel syndrome so this option is correct one and reduce blood flow to the brachial nerve so there this carpal tunnel syndrome is caused by this median nerve due to the compression of the median nerve and now due to the uh, brachial nerve so for this reason this option is the incorrect one and continuous wrist bending is a risk factor and it is not a uh, you can say causative factor so for this reason this option is incorrect again so the question number 107 goes right with the option number c that is compression of the median nerve is a primary cause of having carpal tunnel syndrome next is question number 108 Okay, these are the you can say uh, the pain that arise due to the carpal tunnel syndrome. This is a picture depicting this. So question number 108 says a person is diagnosed with cystitis. So cystitis is the inflammation of the bladder. Which of the following should the nurse evaluate the patient for? So when the patient is having cystitis, so cystitis is the inflammation of the bladder. When inflammation is present, there are certain signs and symptoms. That means there can be presence of micturition 
with this there can be presence of okay with the maturation there can be presence of increased frequency of the urine there can be presence of increased urgency to urinate okay so these are some you can say symptoms of this cystitis or bladder infection and the nurse should evaluate for so option number first is nausea and vomiting so nausea and vomiting can be seen in those patients who do have pyelonephritis so as a result as a sign and symptom of this pyelonephritis this nausea and vomiting can be seen in the patient but not in the cystitis so for this reason this option is incorrect the next is fall smelling urine so uh, there can and the presence of this fall smelling urine to the patients who do have this bladder uh, infection or bladder inflammation basically so for this reason this option is correct one the next one says oligouria so we have seen there is increase in the frequency so oligouria will be a incorrect option the next one says flank pain so flank pain is usually seen when there is any infection in the kidneys because the bilateral kidneys are present at the uh, flank region and this uh, infection can and with the pyelonephritis so flank pain is when there is a uh, infection in the kidneys and not in the bladder so therefore this option will be incorrect patient is having inflammation of bladder so there can be the presence of fall smelling urine question number 109 it says once a child has been transferred from a post anesthetic care unit after surgery which assessment should the nurse prioritize so here the child has been transferred from the paku and from the paku that is post anesthetic care unit after the surgery to a general ward and what the nurse should prioritize here so when we talk about the options so option number first says the functioning of the ng tube this b is the iv fluid access site the c is the child's level of pain and the d is the surgical site rest so when we talk about when we compare these four options so our option number d that is a surgical side dressing should be given the prioritized assessment why because there can be the risk of the hemorrhage from this surgical site and if there is a presence of the profusal hemorrhage from this surgical site it will lead to the hypovolemia it will uh, lead to the <laughs> Sorry, decrease in the blood volume due to the hemorrhage and due to decrease in the blood volume, it will lead to the hypovolemia. It will lead to the hypovolemia. And there can be, uh, you can say, other complications to, uh, related to this hypovolemia to the patient. So the ultimate, uh, you can say, assessment that should be the most important assessment should be the surgical side dressing. If you talk about the functioning of the NG tube, so that should be checked before providing any meal, any feed to the patient, the IV fluid access site. So when the patient to come, we have to check the IV fluid access. And if it is not proper, then we have to change it appropriately. The next is uh, child's level of pain. So child's level of pain should be checked at every shift and every fourth or second hourly as per the pain of the patient and do provide some pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatment according to the child's level of pain. So these all can be uh, handled laterally but of the utmost importance is the surgical side dressing here. The next is question number 110 and it says a patient displays initial signs of alcohol withdrawal. Their heart rate is 110 beats per minute and their blood pressure stands 165 by 95 mm of Hg. The nurse's appropriate step would be to. So the patient is here having the signs of alcohol withdrawal. With this, the patient is, you can say, excited. The patient is having the uh, tachycardia that is 100 beats per minute and with this, there is is the elevation in the blood pressure of the patient so moving to the option the option number first is use limb restraints so limb restraints are not here the patient has not gone violent the patient is not violent so therefore we should not use the limb restraints to the patient we cannot use restraint until or unless it is very very important for the patient so uh, using limb restraint will be a incorrect option the next one says inform the healthcare provider so yes this can be informed to the healthcare provider the next one says designate a non-licensed personnel to accompany the patient so here the patient is having increase in the blood pressure as well as in the 
know uh, your uh, heart rate with this there is no any need to accompany the patient this is an incorrect option the next one is provide lorazepam so lorazepam is a benzodiazepine and this benzodiazepine do have some sedative effects when this benzodiazepine is given to the patient it will show the sedative effect to the patient and this sedative effect will decrease the symptoms that has been occurred to the patient that is tachycardia and their high blood pressure so providing lorazepam is the correct option and then after providing the lorazepam we can inform to the healthcare provider if still the patient uh, is unable to manage then we can uh, inform the healthcare provider but until then we can provide lorazepam to the patient so for this reason this option number b is also incorrect one and our option number d is the right one the next question is our question number 111. It says, for a patient with spinal cord injury using a wheelchair, which guidance should a nurse provide to lower the chances of pressure sore development? So the patient is ha having the spinal cord injury and with this spinal cord injury, the patient is using wheelchair because the patient has undergone the spinal cord injury. Now we have to, the patient is having the risk of having this bed sores development and we have to decrease this risk. So what we should do to the patient? So first one is the engage in the daily cleansing so uh, when the patient uh, any patient who is at the risk of pressure sore development so there is very important to maintain the hygiene of the patient with this there is uh, it is of the utmost importance that daily cleansing should be done so that there is decrease in the presence of microorganism at the patient the skin and the patient's body so daily cleansing should be done so this option can be right one the next is prioritize a carbohydrate intensive meal plan so when we are providing these patients with a carbohydrate intensive meal plan the patients who are at the risk of bed sore development we have to provide them the protein rich plan also so that there should not be any bed sore development so for this reason this option will be the incorrect one the next one is a reposition oneself by adjusting weight every 15 minutes so the patient is when in the wheelchair the patient has to readjust himself every 15 minutes so that there is not any bed sore. Or you can say so that the risk for the bed sore can be reduced. So this option can be right one again. The next is transition between wheelchair and bed every couple of hours. So if the patient is moving from the wheelchair to the bed and from the bed to the wheelchair for the time period of two hours, that is a couple of hours. So, uh, you can say so, uh, lying or sitting in the same position for a couple of hours can initiate the bed sore to the patient. So, therefore, this option will be the incorrect one. The option number A and C both seems right. If we compare these both uh, options, so daily cleansing is decreasing the organism and readjusting is decreasing the risk for the bed sore. And we are uh, asked here the, to decrease the risk of the bed sore. So for option number C will go right uh, when we do compare these both options and our option A will go incorrect. Question number 112. A child with moderate diarrhea needs some management advice. Which option should the nurse suggest? So the patient or the child is having moderate diarrhea here. So diarrhea is a condition when there is the removal or you can say excretion of the stool, excretion of the more three or more than uh, three liquid stools in 24 hours is considered as a diarrhea. With this diarrhea, there is increase in the volume of the stool and increase in the, uh, you can say, um, liquidity of the stool. That means the patient is having liquid stools. So when the patient is uh, having this moderate diarrhea, so what should the nurse suggest? So option number first is maintain the child's usual dietary intake. Option number second says give the child foods like bananas, rice, applesauce and toast that is your bread. The next is provide the fluid with clear fluids 
clear liquids for a day and the next is suggest food that have minimal fat content so when we are having this type of children who do have the diarrhea and who do have the moderate diarrhea so the thing that we have to take care there is we have to maintain the nutritional pattern of the patient and we have to provide whole nutritive diet to the patient we have to provide the nutritive diet to the patient and this nutritive diet will include the protein fats and fibers and this well this nutritive diet is usually our balanced diet that means we should provide each and every food to the patient when he is having diarrhea so first one says maintain a child usual dietary intake so usual dietary intake is balanced diet so maintaining usual dietary intake is a correct option the next is give the child foods like bananas rice apple sauce and toast so this food are decreased in the fiber with this this food are decreased in the protein content so because this food do not have much nutritional value the american association uh, sorry american academy of pediatrics has now recommended to use this nutritional daily diet to the patient and should avoid this bread diet to the patient so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next saying provide the child with clear fluids for a day so if the patient is only having the clear fluids it will cause a electrolyte imbalance to the patient as that in the diarrhea there is the excretion of the fluid as well as of the electrolytes and only uh, you can say uh, replenishing only the clear fluids will cause the electrolyte imbalance to the patient so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next is suggest foods that have minimal fat content so we have discussed that there should be balanced diet and the moderate amount of fat with those that is present in the balanced diet can be provided to the patient so therefore providing minimal food content is again an incorrect option so question number 112 goes right with the option number a question number 113 okay it says when administering a nasogastric tube feeding to a client the nurse should so a patient who is having the nasogastric tube so this nasogastric tube is a tube that is inserted from the nasal cavity to the stomach and it is usually inserted to provide feed to the patient sometimes it is also uh, in uh, you can say administer to remove out the it's you can say remove out the content or in the case of ng decompression we do also use this ng feet or you can say ng tube okay so here it has been already given this administered ng tube feeding the nurse is going to administer ng tube feeding that is about this one so what should the nurse do so option number first is confirm the correct placement of tube before initiating the feeding so before providing the feed to the patient we should always and always confirm the correct placement why because in some cases there can be dislodgement of this tube and therefore if we directly provide the meal to the patient it will cause the aspiration to the pneumonia this can further cause the aspiration pneumonia to the patient if the gi content or if the content that should be uh, traveled to the GI uh, goes to the your respiratory tract, so in that condition, this aspiration do occurs. So we have to confirm the placement that the tube uh, you, uh, that has been inserted is present in the uh, stomach only and is not dislodged from there. The next one says ensure the feeding solution is at a warm temperature prior to use. So uh, causing a warm temperature to this feeding solution increases the risk of having microorganism. They do have the increase in the risk of micro organism so for warming temperature or you can say putting the feeding to a warm temperature is not a very good option the next one says draw out any remaining stool content so yes we have to draw out the patient's stomach contents before introducing the feed and dispose them off so before introducing this feeding to the patient we have to remove the content we do remove this content to check the acidity of the content 
and if the acidity with this we do collect is it to check the residual volume so for the two purpose to check the acidity to check the ph that is where the this uh, your tube has been present and with this we have to check what okay content uh, before introducing the feed and dispose them off so we are checking the acidity with this we are checking the residual volume of the stomach that if the food that has been the feed that has been given previously if it has absorbed or not if it has passed from the stomach or not therefore we do check the residual volume so when we do uh, you can say draw the contents so we have to inject them back we have to draw them back we do not have to dispose them disposing the abdominal or stomach content will cause the electrolyte imbalance so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one is position the client on the left side so when we are providing feed to the patient so the patient should be placed in the upright position and he should not be in the left side so for this reason this option is again incorrect one question number next is question number 114 it says which method is appropriate for giving subcutaneous injection so when we talk about the various methods of injection so the four main are intravenous injection that turns into the veins of the body the next one is intradermal root intradermal is directly into the dermis layer of the skin the next one is intra uh, i am that is intramuscular that is into the muscles of the body and next one is the subcutaneous injection so subcutaneous injection is given into the layer uh, of the fats the subcutaneous injection is given in layer of fat and this fat layer is between the skin the outer part is the skin and then there is the after this uh, you can say uh, submucosa there comes the muscularis okay so moving uh, okay so first clearing it so we have to give it at the layers of the fat at the subcutane sub mucose uh, sorry subcutaneous side and uh, between in the layers of fat between the skin and the muscles so if we talk about the angle of insertion so angle of insertion for the subcutaneous uh you can say injection is 70 to 90 degree based on the area where you are giving and where what is the presence of fat tissues there with this the length of this uh, syringe is 3 by 8 units uh, sorry inches to 5 by 8 inches this is the uh, length of the this is 5 by 8 this is the length of the syringe that is used in this uh, you can say subcutaneous injection and when we are injecting this then we have to do what with our non-dominant half we have to pinch the skin or pinch the side and with this we have to lift the fat tissues wherever we are providing this subcutaneous uh, injection to the patient so we have to pinch the skin and with this pinch the skin we have to lift the tissues or you can say we have to uh, pinch and we have to lift these fat tissues and then we have to inject the injection at these fat uh, tissues okay so moving to the option so option number first is inserting a needle at a 45 degree and angle to the surface of the skin so inserting the needle to a angle of 45 degree is a correct one because the placement is 45 to 90 degree so this can be the correct one the option number first the next one says drawing an 0.3 ml of air into the syringe prior to administering so we do not draw up any air before administering the im injection so this option is the incorrect one the next is using 1 inch or 2.5 centimeter needle for aspiration. So we have seen that we have to use the needle of 3 by 8 inches and if we convert into the millimeter centimeter, so it will be 9.5 millimeter that is it is very small and we do not have to use a syringe of 2.5 centimeter. So therefore this option is incorrect one. The next is holding the skin taut at the injection spot. So we have says the said that we have to pinch the skin with this we have to lift the skin we should not hold the skin taut so therefore question number 114 goes right with the option number a next is question number 115 and it says 
a patient undergoing uh, bronchoscopy with biopsy due to a suspected lung cancer okay so the patient is suspected with the lung cancer and is going to the bronchoscopy with biopsy w due to suspected lung cancer requires post procedure care that means the patient has undergone the uh, this procedure and is now in the post procedure care the nurse's responsibilities will be so what will be the nurse's responsibility so option number first is ask the patient to refrain from speaking until the gag reflex is fully restored so the gag reflex helps in the swallowing of the uh, food particles and the contents that we have eaten so if there is not the presence of gag reflex we cannot provide any food or any feed to the patient but the patient can speak if there is uh, absence of the gag reflex so we should not refrain the patient from speaking therefore this option is incorrect one the next one says providing pain relief medication as required to treat discomfort so to uh, when we talk about that we have to provide pain relief medication so this can be done according to the physician's order and it can be a nurse's responsibilities okay it can be the answer we should check the all answers the next one says of suggesting the patient to rinse with oral lidocaine to alleviate th throat discomfort so when the patient will rinse with oral lidocaine so it is a uh, your uh, you, this is a uh, your uh, analgesic uh, sorry not analgesic it is uh, your local anesthetic and this local anesthetic, if the patient is rinsing with this local anesthetic, it will increase the duration of the gag reflex and it will decrease the coming back of the gag reflex. So we do not want this effect. Therefore, we should not uh, prioritize this one. The next is observing the patient for sign of pneumothorax. So when a patient has undergone the bronchoscopy, so uh, as a iatrogenic method, or iatrogenic measure, there can be the insertion of the air. There can be the leakage of the air to the pleural cavity, which is known as the pneumothorax. So this pneumothorax and the hemorrhage are the uh, complications for this bronchoscopy procedure so after the procedure because this can this pneumothorax can occur this him, him uh, this hemorrhage can occur which will lead to hemothorax so the nurse has to observe the patients for this sign rather than providing relief medication as uh, you can say required to treat discomfort this pain medication should be given to decrease the pain of the patient and not the discomfort the discomfort may be the dyspnea after this uh, bronchoscopy or you can say due to the pneumothorax due to this bronchoscopy so we should treat the pain relief medications we should uh, you can say treat the pain with pain relief medication we are not treating the discomfort with this pain treating medication so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one is our question number 116 and it says a child is receiving antibiotic therapy due to urinary tract infection that means the patient is having urinary tract infection which of the following symptoms should prompt the parents to inform the nurse okay so the patient is having the child is having uti and is in the antibiotic therapy so first is appetite decline so due to a side effect of certain antibiotics this is a common side effect of declining the appetite so if this is present there is no any prompt need to inform the parents about this so therefore this option is incorrect one the next one says elevated body temperature so elevated body temperature shows that there is the active infection it shows the presence of the active infection so and if the patient is in the antibiotics and still is showing the presence of the active infection that means there is the they can be the resistant to certain antibiotic so therefore this option is the correct one the next one is yellowing of skin or eyes so this yellowing of the skin or eyes do causes due to increase in the bilirubin level and this bilirubin level can be increased if there is increase in the hemolysis or if there is increase in the bilirubin level secondary to the or you can say due to the liver 
disease may be intrahepatic may be extra hepatic so this bilirubin is uh, you can say directly not considered with this urinary tract infection so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next one is increased urine output so increased urine output with increased urine frequency is a symptom of uti and therefore there is no such important need to inform this sign and symptom because it generally arises with uti so for this reason this option is incorrect one the next is our Question number 117 and it says after getting injured in a car accident, a baby needs to have a splint on the affected leg. The father observes that the baby is still active even with the splint on. What advice should the nurse give to the father? So there is a, there is a you can say, child who has, the, there is a baby who has got the car accident and is having a splint on the affected leg and is active. So, uh, what should be the advice that should be given to the father? So, when there is a baby and is having a splint and is effective and that means key, that means the splint is on and baby is active. So, this is a normal condition and it, they should be present. With the presence of a splint, there is no any decrease as such decrease in the patient's general activities and if they are still active, so this is a good sign. There is no need to concern about this. Okay, with this, because there is no, okay, moving to the option. So, option number first is ensure the surroundings where the baby moves are free from potential hazards. So, because the baby is having a spleen and due to the presence of a spleen, there can be some, um, uh, you can say, abnormal movements or you can say uh, abnormal or you can say unable to hold the body. The baby will be unable to hold the, or you can say change the body posture according to him. So, the Therefore, there can be the risk of, uh, you can say, hitting by the object. There can be the risk of having fall. So, the parents or the father should ensure that the surroundings of the baby are free from the potential hazards of falling, potential hazards of hitting with something. So, this option is the right one. The next is only put the splint on baby during night time. So, splint should be worn all over the day and it should not be only limited to the night time. Therefore, this option is incorrect one. The next is contact the doctor right away to reconsider the treatment approach. So, the treatment approach is uh, quite effective and is uh, good. So, we do not need to contact the doctor. So, therefore, this option is incorrect. The next is restrict the baby to a single room. So, restricting the baby to a single room will hinder with the social development of the baby therefore this option will be the incorrect one so our question number 117 goes right with the option number a the next is a nurse tend to a child with intersusception which of the following indicates child needs an intervention so first is the child is having intersusception so intersusception is the telescoping of the intestine and due to the presence of this telescoping of the intestine, there can be presence of jelly-like stool. With this presence of jelly-like stool, there can be this intersusception can cause obstruction, can cause the intestinal obstruction. And if it is causing intestinal obstruction, then it is of the utmost care to be taken. Okay, so moving to the options, option number first is saying the child has a regular bowel movement. So if the child is having regular and normal bowel movement and no jelly-like stool, it means sometimes what happens, this intersusceptions to heal by its own. So if the patient or client is having regular bowel movement, so that means there is not a, uh, okay, we will compare all the options. The second one says the child suddenly shows no sign of discomfort. So if the patient is having intersusception or intestinal obstruction and suddenly the word suddenly is of the utmost important and suddenly shows no sign of discomfort that may indicate that there is the rupture of that portion that was blockage that was blocked and due to increase in the pressure from the blocked content there is the rupture and this rupture will lead to the peritonitis so these patients will need the intervention 
the next is the child has not vomited in the last four hours so if the child has not been vomited so that means that the obstruction is either partial or it is getting back so therefore this is there is uh, if we compare with option number second so there is not such a immediate need for intervention as per the question number uh, sorry option number second the next is the child remains very calm so if the child is calm that means the child is not having any problem and is calm now so therefore this option is again do not need an immediate intervention this option is incorrect one and our option number first in where there is regular bowel movements so again this option will not con will not uh, you can say need any any immediate intervention so for question number 18 the immediate intervention should be taken in those child who suddenly shows no signs of discomfort so next is our question number 119 and it says when providing post care guidelines for a newborn who underwent correction for tracheoesophageal fistula so the newborn has underwent the correction of tracheoesophageal fistula so what is tracheoesophageal fistula so if there is any abnormal connection So, if there is abnormal connection and abnormal connection, connection is where between the trachea and the esophagus as per the name says tracheoesophageal fistula. So, if there is any normally the trachea is in the respiratory tract and this esophagus is the part of the GI tract and if there is these both you can say these both organ to form a connection and this abnormal connection is known as uh, you can say fistula and if there it is present so there can be the movement of the gi content to the respiratory content and will lead to the certain problems life threatening problems to the patient so the patient has undergone the correction of this tef the next is the nurse educates the parents about the potential long term healthcare concerns so now the parents are educating about this healthcare concerns which of the following is highly probable condition okay so we have to uh, we have to choose that one which is highly probable condition the first one says speech difficulties so with this trans -eso sorry tracheoesophageal fistula surgery there is no such any changes in the speech as this speech or you can say speech is your larynx larynx box where their vocal cords are situated and not in the trachea so there is no such speech difficulties so there will be no any chances of having speech difficulties so the next one says recurring moderate dehydration due to mild diarrhea so if there is any there was any abnormal connection and now it has been cleared so it doesn't mean that patient will have any dehydration or diarrhea that is not related to this condition therefore this option will be incorrect one again the next one says ulcer formation so ulcers are formed when there is regurgitation of the gi content and here is nothing such thing is going on so for this reason this option will be incorrect one the next is esophageal narrowing or strictures so when there is a surgery of the ter so as the complication of this surgery uh, and uh, the complication of the surgery there can be the presence of esophageal narrowing and strictures and these condition might develop in the late stages in the year after so they should be uh, taught to the patient's parents so the last question of this session is about question number 120 and we have reached to the last question of this session and it says after an older adult with a history of hypertension is admitted with the diagnosis of dehydration, the client's condition is complicated by increasing confusion and weakness. The client mentions taking one tablet of hydrochlorothiazide daily, but the prescription now calls for half tablet. To provide appropriate care, the nurse should seek additional information to address the situation effectively. So the patient is having history of hypertension diagnosis of dehydration is now and is uh, complicated by increasing confusion and weakness and patient was taking one tablet of hydrochlorothiazide so hydrochlorothiazide is a thiazide diuretics and diuretics do increase in the you can say um, in the 
urine in the amount and volume of the urine this thiazide diuretics because they causes the diuresis okay with this the prescription was of the half tablet and patient was taking one tablet that means that uh, doses was increased by the patient by himself okay so what will be the additional information with this so option number first says increased gi activity so in the older adults the gi activity is in is decreased and not increased so therefore this option is the incorrect one the next is reduced hepatic blood flow so yes in the older adults the hepatic blood flow is reduced but because this hydrochlorothiazide do not get metabolized in this uh, hepatic area that means if the liver it do excrete out same at it has been taken so there is no any relation of this reduced hepatic blood flow the next one is decreased drug half-life of the hydrochlorothiazide so half-life of the hydrochlorothiazide will remain the same in the adults and in the uh, anyone else who is taking hydrochlorothiazide so for this reason this option is incorrect one and the last one says increased urinary elimination so because there is the patient was taking increased dose with this increased dose because it was a diuresis so the uh, diuresis was that means the urine was increasing the excretion of fluid in the urine was increasing and due to that the patient was having dehydration so increased urinary elimination is the right option here so this is all about this beautiful session thank you so much for watching